This meeting is no longer being recorded. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, this is a sound check for AT&T moderator. Perfect. It's coming across clearly on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also. Thank you.
Oh, Audio test, CEO, and County Council. Good morning, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, this is a sound check for Supervisor Mitchell. Can you hear me? Good morning, this is a sound check for Supervisor Barger. Can you hear me? Good morning, Supervisor Mitchell, sound check. Good morning, I can hear you, thank you. Good morning, this is a sound check for Dr. Ferrer. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Good morning, this is a sound check for Dr. Galley. Can you hear me? Dr. Galling. Good morning. This is a sound check for Michelle Guiman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank this you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good morning. This is a sound check for the Spanish translator. Can you hear me?
Good morning. This is a sound check for the Spanish translator. Can you hear me? Good morning, sound check, Spanish interpreter. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, this is a sound check for Supervisor Barger. I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Well, then I guess we pass the sound check. Yes, you do, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, this is a sound check for Dr. Galley. Can you hear me?
Good morning. This is a sound check for Dr. Gowley. Can you hear me? Good morning, it's Sheila. Good morning, Supervisor Q, we can hear you. The magic hour has arrived, <laughs> 9.30. So good morning, everyone. Want to welcome you to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Today's Tuesday, June the 8th, 2021. Our meeting today is being held remotely due to the current public health crisis to protect the health of all. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Mitchell. Good morning, President. Supervisor Kuehl. Here. Supervisor Hahn. I'm here. Supervisor Barger. Here. Isa Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Present. Rodrigo Castro Silva, County Council. Here. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Here. As indicated on the posted agenda, we will be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 1,000 written public comments for today's meeting. And as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Madam Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matter, 1030 a.m. Item S1 is a discussion of the public health order related to COVID-19. This item will be held for discussion. On page three, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the sanitation district number 27 and the New Hall Ranch Sanitation District. On page four, this is the Los Angeles, this is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On item 3D is a recommendation to authorize the issuance of the tax exempt and taxable multifamily housing revenue notes by the Los Angeles County Development Authority in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed 40 million to finance the construction of the Corazon de Valle project, a 90 unit multifamily housing development to be located in the city of Los Angeles. On page nine, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page 10, consent calendar for the supervisors items one through 25. On item one, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. <clears throat> on item two, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item five, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. On item six, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. On item seven, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 11, Supervisor Barker requests that this item be held. 
On item 12, Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Mitchell request that this item be held. On item 13, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 17, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be continued two weeks to June 22nd, 2021. On item 18, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 21, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 22, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 28, administrative matters, items 26 through 83. Uh, on item 26, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 40, the Director of Mental Health requests that this item be continued two weeks to June 22nd, 2021, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 54, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued two weeks to June 22nd, 2021. On item 67, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued two weeks to June 22nd, 2021. On item 68 and item 69, Supervisor Mitchell requests that these items be held. On page 59, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 81E, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. The request for continuances through 81H are before you. Moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve these items. That will be the order. On page 60, ordinance for introduction. On page 62, notices of closed session. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll now take public comments for all agenda items. Madam Executive Officer, please read the call in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. To repeat, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes. We will allocate up to 60 minutes for public com comments on all of the items. If there are no speakers waiting before 60 minutes have lapsed, we will close public comment. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on an agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? As a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one then zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no la ha he hecho, presione 1 y luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Gary Hardy. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is uh, Gary Hardy. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm a member of the Linwood Unified School District Board of Education and a resident of District 2. 
I join you today to speak in support of item number two, the motion to strengthen oversight of school law enforcement uh, services uh, and general public comment. In Linwood, our guiding question as we examine decisions we make on behalf of our students and their families is, is this right for kids? Both the COVID-19 pandemic and the killing of George Floyd prompted us to re-examine our services, resources, and school climate through that lens and begin to reimagine the way in which we provide an educational experience that meets the needs of our community. Until last year, our district had a contract with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department that assigned two deputies to support our schools. One of the issues we had with this contract was the cost, as the cost for these two deputies was $350,000. Additionally, we had little to no oversight with respect to the level of service provided to our schools and how our students were treated, meaning these practices that the deputies undertook were often not in alignment with practices, our practices as an educational institution. Bearing this in mind and using our guiding question, we made the decision that this partnership was just not right for our students and we decided to not renew our contract. Not renewing this contract meant that we could fund restorative and, anti and trauma-informed practices that we know are best for our students and their families and by our staff uh, by extension. This meant academic counselors for middle school students and new college counselors for high schools. This meant an additional investment in our Ready to Learn initiative, which seeks to remove barriers to student success in Linwood schools maintained by a robust student service department and school health collaborative. This meant 24-7 mental health and tutoring hotlines made available to all students and the entire Linwood community. And this meant additional investment in early education, expanding our services to begin uh, serving students at birth. And this meant that kindergarten students in Linwood had a college savings plan in their name, making them seven times more likely to pursue a college education. In Linwood, we, describe, we strive to achieve educational excellence for all students through equity, access, and justice. And our contract with LASD um, existed in contrast to those goals, which ultimately prompted us to decide against renewing. Police on school campuses are not, are not the alternatives to cost or incarceration that our students need, nor are they a way to close off the school to prison pipeline. A deeper investment in vital services, resources, and educational outcomes are. While Excuse me, your time has expired. Can we have the next speaker, please? Henry Perez. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'm here to speak for item 81E. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Henry Perez. I'm a resident of LA County in District 1, and I am also the Associate Director of Inner City Struggle. I am here speaking in support of item 81E. I'd like to begin by thanking Supervisor Solis for her leadership in bringing forth a solution to the crisis before our county, which is the over 200,000 tenants that are behind on their rent debt due to the impact of COVID-19. Communities like East LA, South LA, and the San Fernando Valley are, are ravaged, were ravaged by COVID-19. Thousands of residents lost jobs or, or substantial income during this pandemic. This has impacted their ability to pay rent and they now bear thousands of dollars of rent debt. Current state and local rent assistance programs are not enough. They are not only not covering everyone with COVID-related rent debt, but for a variety of reasons, they are also inaccessible to too many tenants in Alley County. Hundreds of thousands of residents are on the brink of becoming houseless. The only thing protecting them right now are the current eviction moratoriums. But what will happen when those are lifted? If bold action is not taken, we will see thousands of, and thousands of families evicted from their homes and put out into the streets, exacerbating the houseless crisis that this county already has. Don't wait for the state to take action. We ask you to please pass item 81E now and find a way to eliminate the rent debt burden that, mo that our most vulnerable families are facing at this time. Um, bold action Excuse is me, the time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Adolfo Guzman Lopez, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Adolfo Guzman Lopez. I'm a reporter at Southern California Public Radio based in Pasadena. I work out of the downtown LA Bureau on 2nd and Figueroa, but I'm not representing the station in any capacity today. I'm here to speak on item number 18 and specifically in support of the Society of Professional Journalists opposition to the amendment that places limits on journalists to do our job out in the field. When I learned about those proposed limits, I immediately thought of my reporting on Sunday, May 31st, 2020. 
on that day, I was assigned to cover the George Floyd protests in Long Beach. I arrived at five o'clock at Third and Pine Streets. Crowds were growing. Police had declared an unlawful assembly. The police line pushed protesters to the intersection. I was assigned to inform the public about the local protests and what turned out to be Please continue. Several times describing what the protesters were saying, the general demographics of the crowd. And when looting happened, I described that and the police action against the people breaking into stores. I was moving about with the people and I was uh, keeping an eye on the part of the protest where the protesters were confronting the police. I was taking precautions. My LA County Sheriff's press credential was around my neck. Uh, having to check with a police official to get permission uh, about where to be would have slowed and limited my work and may have kept me from effectively informing the public about a news event that is important, was important for our communities and our nation. Th thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? And as a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. And do not press one then zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Julie Mitchell, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Julie Mitchell and I'm the superintendent of schools for the Roland Unified School District. And I'm speaking on agenda item number two and agenda item number 69. I respectfully request a no vote on agenda item number two. While the basis of concern regarding police or law enforcement is understood, the study quoted and connected with this issue and with this item is incomplete and has flaws as noted by the author. Additionally, if item number two is approved, it removes the delegate authority and requires all Los Angeles County school districts to seek separate individual approval from the Board of Supervisors on having a campus school resource officer to serve students. This decision should be at the sole discretion of the locally elected school board members. Lastly, the motion does not consider the positive relationship and work between schools and law enforcement. It is a collective effort to serve the needs of our students, our schools, and our communities. In the Roland Unified School District, we work collaboratively with the Sheriff's Department in the selection of a school resource officer so that that particular individual is able to complement and meet the needs of our students and serve the overall mission of our school district. The school, in collaboration with law enforcement, is able to support the students socially, emotionally, academically, and safely. School safety is essential for students to thrive. In the presence of a carefully selected school resource support officer can assist in this process. I strongly urge a no vote on item number two and a yes vote on item number 69 and allow local school boards to govern locally for the students that they are directly elected to serve. Thank you very much. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Ruby Rivera, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruby Rivera. I am a tenant of District 2 and the Director of Community Organizing for Inner City Struggle in District 1. I am speaking in support of Item 81E. I want to first appreciate the bold leadership of Board Chair Inda Solis for uplifting the concerns of tenants and taking bold action through introduction of a motion to study county acquisition of low-income residential tenant rental debt, which is aligned with the debt-free recovery platform to keep LA housed. The state rental relief programs have left many tenants behind because applications were complicated and landlords have all the power. Thousands of tenants still have debt, will continue to accrue debt, and will have to live with the long-lasting impacts of this economic crisis. I support item 81E and I urge the board to vote yes on this item and conduct, to conduct a feasibility study to seize the rental debt. In LA County, the rent debt is nearing $1 billion and LA County cannot afford to wait on the state to take action. We need to take action now 
through this motion to address this crisis and to send a message to Sacramento that we need innovative solutions that take tenants into account and that are coming from the tenants. And again, I want to thank um, Supervisor Inda Solis for really pushing forth this bold vision. Thank you. And I urge May we have the next speaker, please? Genevieve Coverall, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. Whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yes, uh, good morning, Board of Supervisor, Dr. Geneviève Cabral. <coughs> I will speak to items 39, 41, 67, and 81A. Um, on item 39, I am very concerned uh, about the complaint of security tests. I hope that when you look at it to see what's really going on and how come it was a mistake done in the calculation and not taking over. Uh, on item 41, uh, I am in favor of that. I am very concerned because the therapeutic uh, transport has been on uh, agenda forever and talked about, but not implemented really the way it should be. Uh, on item 67, the report of enhancement is not as clear as I would like to see it, and also it should not be received and filed. It should really be done by your board. On item 81E, about the renters, uh, I'm totally in favor of it. Uh, the board of supervisors have done the best they, best they could both for the renter and the owner, so I think that they fairly fair executed. Anyway, I hope you reopen soon. I am really missing seeing you in person, and um, see you soon. Have a good week. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? And as a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press 1, then 0 at this time. Do not press 1, then 0 a second time, or you will be removed from the queue. Ralph Peshek? Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Chairman Solis and Honorable Supervisors. My name is Ralph Peshek. I'm a resident of the First District. And today I have general items uh, to address in items 2 and 69. As a resident of the First District, uh, I also speak to you today in my capacity as the Chief Business and Financial Officer of the William S. Hart Union High School District, which resides in the 5th District. Uh, good to hear your voice this morning, Supervisor, Supervisor Barger. Two of the items listed for your consideration on today's agenda, items 2 and 69, have the potential to impact students, staff, and communities, not only in the Santa Clarita Valley, and specifically William S. Hart's Union High School District, but across LA County. As the most popular Please continue. A diverse population with distinct embedded communities. District one, my own home district, is a prime example of wonderfully unique diversity of Los Angeles and company encompassing not only Silver Lake, but downtown Lincoln Heights, Montebello, and Pomona, and many more wonderful communities. But each of those communities has unique strengths and challenges in supporting the needs of its constituents. As an educator, I realize the educational and social emotional support systems are locally elected board of trustees and staff develop need to reflect the needs of our students and community. those diverse and unique needs. Deputies working as school resource officers are a part of our educational community in the Santa Clarita. That is not a figurative statement, but a literal one. Unlike my honored friend in Linwood, our experiences with school resource deputies have demonstrated that they engage with students in a supportive and positive manner, thereby enhancing the student's perception of their school as a safe and supportive environment. In our case, over the last year, we've had major incidences where our school resource officers have been critical in supporting not only our schools, our students, but our community. 
Unfortunately, item two appears to have been drafted without consideration for the role locally elected officials play in determining how to address the needs of their constituents and community. Additionally, timelines, demands for data, and requirements that individual school districts petition the Board of Supervisors on an individual basis annually appear to reflect an implicit bias towards the Sheriff's Department and implementation of onerous and punitive renewal process for districts electing, based on local decisions, to partner with L.A. County Sheriff's Department and the county. Excuse me, your time services. has expired. May we have the next speaker? Carmina Calderon, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, my name is Carmina Calderon and I support item 81E to conduct a feasibility study to seize the rent debt. As organizers, we have seen the duress of our community members uh, while they have faced the pandemic, but most of all in the stress of keeping a roof over their head, while also navigating and accruing insurmountable debts that our communities cannot afford to pay back. Rent relief is good, but the established programs have been severely inaccessible for our communities. In LA County, approximately 218,000 households are behind on rent, with an estimated total rent debt nearing 1 billion. The average estimated rent debt per household is close to 7,000. LA County cannot afford to wait on the state. Our communities can no longer wait. We need to take unprecedented action to address this unprecedented crisis and maximize the federal dollars to support those really in need, tenants and small landlords. This report is the first step to ensure all of us can recover from this crisis. I want to thank Supervisor Feliz for her leadership and urge the board to support this motion and commit to a debt-free recovery to keep LA housed. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Martin, floor. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Martin Plourd, and I'm the superintendent of the Whittier Union High School District, which resides in portions of Supervisorial District 1 and 4. I'm speaking regarding items 2 and 69 on today's agenda. The point I would like to make is that the vast majority of school districts served by SRDs are small to medium-sized districts governed by Board of Trustees who live in those communities and know their community members and students well. It is these Boards of Trustee, like the one in Whittier Union, who regularly review the use of our debt deputies on campus and act in the best interest of our students. We appreciate item 69 today and urge the Board of Supervisors to approve extending the contracts with our districts through June of 2022. However, item two on today's agenda suggests that our local governing boards are not paying attention to the concerns raised, which simply isn't the case. The use of SRDs on school campuses are clearly an issue that local school boards should be allowed to decide for their own districts. Our local governing boards are keeping watch and take action when necessary. We appreciate that Linwood Unified made their own decision based on bad experiences with SRDs, but their experience is not what we experience in Whittier Union. The reality is by having SRDs on our campuses, they know our expectations and cultures with, with how we want them to be involved in the positive ways with our students. They offer our students, families, and community a sense of safety and build strong, positive relationships with our students. They are a valuable resource to school districts, and our schools would be worse off if decisions about SRDs were taken out of the hands of our locally elected governing boards. I would respectfully ask the Board of Supervisors to trust their fellow officially elected boards of trustees to make their own decisions regarding the use of SRDs on our campuses and vote no on item two. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Eric Previn, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. It's Eric Freeman. I'll give a little comment on 2 and 69, as well as 39, uh, 18, uh, 81E, and I'll give a general public comment as well. Is that confirmed? Thank you. Yes, you will have three minutes to speak. Please begin. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, one idea for the school, sheriffs at school, this is a tough issue, and the gentleman who just spoke makes a reasonable point that, you know, the people who are very close to the immediate situation should be making that decision. Um, but I also note on your agenda you have an item uh, about private security, where you're throwing down 
$3 million to extend some private security contracts with uh, Universal Protection Services LP doing business as allied universal security services. You know, this is for DPSS locations, but the county is engaged in this activity all over the place. Uh, it's called outsourcing. And the reason why we do it, even though it's in contravention of one of the board's most principal values that people should have reasonable jobs, I think that by hiring private security guards uh, who work for companies that make a lot of money and the employees make a little money, we create a further wealth poverty division. And I know that you've been fighting to reduce that, so I would ask you to say, I remember when Han and Solis and even Kuehl came in fresh-faced and eager and thought, you know, we could take some of these private contracts and, and put good county employees to work, but uh, that hasn't happened. So that's a, I mean, obviously some of that has happened, but uh, let's get back on point. Um, the supporting existing freedoms. Well, this is a caught. Please continue. Mr. Pepin, are you still there? Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Leslie Montoya, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Leslie Montoya. I am a resident in District 1, and I support the debt-free recovery platform to keep LA housed, and I support item 81E. The state rental relief programs have left many tenants behind because applications are complicated and landlords have all the power. Thousands of tenants still have debt, will continue to accrue debt, and will have to live with the long-lasting impacts of this economic crisis. I support item 81E to conduct a feasibility study to seize the rent debt. In LA County, approximately 218,028 households are behind on rent with an estimated total rent debt nearing a billion dollars. The average estimated rent debt per household is close to $7,000. LA County can't afford to wait on the state. We need to take unprecedented action to address this unprecedented crisis and maximize federal dollars to support those really in need tenants and small landlords. This report is the first step to ensure all of us can recover from this crisis. I urge the board to support this motion and commit to a debt-free recovery to keep LA housed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Previn, it appears you were cut off earlier. If you wish to continue to address the board, please call back. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Gabriela Litov, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, I, want the, uh, I want to address item S1 and also, gen I guess, general public uh, comment. Uh, Thank you, I yes, you to... will have two minutes. Okay, I oppose the mandatory government orders for all persons to take uh, the COVID vaccine. I am not opposed, I want to make it clear that I'm not opposed to vaccines and I myself uh, take any vaccine that I uh, feel is appropriate for me, which covers everything. But uh, I don't feel that the order from the government to ingest any substance, the order by force um, is correct. It violates the um, freedom of individual choice. And this kind of order was not done during other pandemics. Now, for example, there was the polio uh, in, in the pandemic, which I was a child when that happened and uh, everyone wanted the vaccine, but there was no order to, from government to take it. I believe the, this kind of an order exceeds the uh, legitimate use of governmental power. And that's, the, and that's what I wanted to address. 
Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Bobby Crawford, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And whether you address on general public comment, you may begin. Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm going to address uh, item 15. I'm going to look testimonial. Uh, I'm a cook at Alma Valley Rehabilitation Center. And I'm with ABR, ABRC and NCI, NCIU 721. I just want to speak, say out with a brief testimony how valuable Alma Valley Rehabilitation Center is to the community. Uh, as, for, as you know, as I know, for each client that goes through the program, they have a work area program. And part of that program is them working in the kitchen. And just to let you guys know, there's a good secret in that came to the kitchen. As they come through the program, we teach each client uh, a good job skill where they can go out in the community and get a job so they can feed and take care of their family. And as a, as a, I've been there for the past 10 years, and every time I go out in the community and I go to my local store, the best person I get out of that for doing what I did for these clients, training them to become uh, have job skills, is that when they introduce me to their family and thank me personally for showing them a skill where I train them where they can become a better a father, husband to their family, and where they can take care of their kids and feed them. So I faithfully urge that uh, the Board of Supervisors reconsider the non-closure of ABRC because it's a vital, vital, vital landmark for the community. We have so many people. I have, for the past 10 years, I have hundreds and I trained hundreds of clients to, become, to have a job skill so they can feed their family. And that's the best part about me being a county worker, what I've done for these clients that came through the program. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you. Next speaker, please. David Malkin, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm addressing items number two and number 69. Today I'm speaking as both a Rolling Unified School Board member, District 4, and as a licensed clinical social worker in strong opposition of agenda item number two and a yes on agenda item number 69. As written, agenda item number two would require the Sheriff's Department to come to the Board of Supervisors for approval for each individual school extension contract with an SRD as of June 30th, 2022. It would take it out of the hands of local control. It is not just data collection that is being requested. Many people think an item number two is this data collection, but it is not. I can tell you by experience that Rolling Unified has had fewer behavioral problems and citations issued to students since we changed from a school-based police department to contracting for an SRD school resource deputy. The study cited in your resolution specifically stated it did not address the hiring process and the effects it has had on the implementation of an SRD on campus. When selecting an SRD, we in Roland actively partner with our local LASD stations and seek out an individual that would have the same traits as our teachers or counselors, one that's compassionate, a mentor, and supportive. If the rights of the officer, if the right officer is selected, that can build a bridge so badly needed between students and police. The fear of police is common amongst us all. Frequently we receive minorities that are victims of police misconduct when the individual is pulled over or confronted by the police. That positive experience on the school campus setting would transfer and enable students to cope with this fear and avoid getting into a negative situation. The focus of community po uh, policing is to create a positive image of the police. What better way to do this than to start it in the public schools? Please vote no on item number two and yes on item number 69 and keep the control within the local jurisdiction of the school boards. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Susan Anderson, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Thank you. My name is Susan Anderson and good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm a resident of Supervisors Solis' District 1. I will be speaking on two other, six in favor, 18 in favor, 26 opposed and 69 opposed, and also general comment. On number two, law enforcement on campus is the opposite of a Care First County. Schools are where a Care First vision begins, where we can invest in our youth through mental health support, education, dance, 
theater, art, and care. The Board of Supervisors should pursue a care for its vision for our schools. No law enforcement on campus, no matter how much data is collected or how transparent LASD is about their violence. On item number six, why do we choose to criminalize mental health? People with untreated mental health needs are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians. Although people with untreated mental health needs make up one in 50 in U.S. adults, they are involved in 25 to 50% of fatal police shootings. The stark disparity means that expanding PMRT capacity to respond to these situations will translate to significantly less harm caused by police. Number 18. SB 98, as amended, will infringe on the freedom of the press, only allowing press access with authorization from a commanding officer gives power to the officer rather than the press. This amendment gives law enforcement the power to decide where and when the press gets access, in turn limiting what they can report on. This is not free press, it's censoring the media. Item number 26, the Inspector General's report on LASD oversight and reform efforts from January to March 2021 reveals that the LASD received 268 service and personnel complaints. There were five deputy-involved shootings this quarter, with two of them being fatal. And in this quarter, 15 people and LASD custody died. Very little information was released about the circumstances of these individuals' deaths. The Sheriff's Department continues to be the primary driver of liability costs for Los Angeles County. Of the $148.5 million Los Angeles County spent on liability in fiscal year 2018 to 2019, the Sheriff's Department was responsible for 55% of those costs, totaling $81,485,430. Additionally, the county paid $60.4 million for 240 LASD settlements. The county's most expensive settlements all involved Sheriff's Department misconduct. At this board meeting alone, the settlements by LASD total over $2 million. And on item Excuse 69, me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Matt Pierce, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Matt Pierce, and I'm speaking as the president of Media Guild of the West, a news guild CWA local that represents unionized journalists at the Los Angeles Times and several other newsrooms in Southern California, Arizona, and Texas. I'm also a reporter at the LA Times, and I live in Working District 2. I will be speaking in support of item 18 and providing a general comment. Um, as journalists, we don't normally get involved in politics, but over the last two years, my profession has witnessed a disturbing deterioration in law enforcement's treatment of journalists who are on the job covering protests, demonstrations, and civil unrest. In recent months, there have been a series of high-profile local incidents that have alarmed many of us as working journalists. These incidents include the L.A. Sheriff's Department's mistreatment of KPCC reporter Josie Wong and the LAPD's unwarranted detention of several journalists at Echo Park Lake, including my colleague James Queeley at the L.A. Times, who is also a member of my union. After these incidents, an unprecedented coalition of press associations, media unions, and advocacy groups representing thousands of rank-and-file journalists across California have come together to protest the treatment of our colleagues, not just at mainstream news organizations like the L.A. Times, but also independent journalists, freelancers, and student journalists who have the same First Amendment rights we do and the same concerns for their on-the-job safety. I would like to thank Supervisor Solis for introducing a motion to push for a stronger SB 98, which my union and our coalition supports. This bill is introduced with modestly extended basic protections against arrests for journalists covering protests and other civil unrest in California. But a recent amendment by the Senate Appropriations Committee would have required journalists to get a police commander's permission to enter closed areas around a protest in order to do their jobs. This is wrong, and many senators who originally supported this amendment know it's wrong and have since publicly withdrawn their support. 
We encourage the assembly to remove the amendment and pass a clean bill. I would thank the board of supervisors for the support. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? And as a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one then zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a las supervisoras que aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Again, Eric Previn, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin, sir. It's Eric Previn, and I was speaking about um, the private security as a possible solution for safety in schools. That's item 39. And then I was also talking about um, how I thought that the press item support for Senate Bill 98 was ironic. And though it's nice that you called me back today after blocking my comment accidentally or inadvertently or whatever, uh, you never do that unless Matt Pierce and the real journalists in America are listening and they're appreciative for this item. Uh, this is an item that is about making it clear that people who report and inform the public have access and are not blocked by law enforcement. It's critically important. And it was amended to make it less effective last minute. And all of the state assembly members voted for it, or the senators, one or the other. It goes to one first and then the other, including Ben Allen. And then people made a hue and a cry, and it's come out, and they're going to try. And now the great leaders of the county and the state are stepping forward to protect journalists' rights. It's very, very touching. but. What about the public scrutiny that's afforded by general public comment and all the public comment? The only reason why I even know about this is because I heard people talk about it. We hear one another talk about stuff and we become illuminated with information and therefore more powerful and we help dry up the corruption. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work if the board is allowed to take four meetings a week, regular meetings, and turn it into two regular meetings with over 100 items on it so that you can't even comment on the actual meat and potatoes that are also in this agenda. I mean, I'll try, but there's no time left. You know, I talked about the unarmed security guard services. That's an, an armed, you know, that's a very, very important issue about how can we make good jobs for people at the county and not just keep all the good jobs at the county while making a great deal, you know, screwing others uh, by getting people to work for virtually, um, you know, wages that don't cut the deal. Now, I did note the rent at the tenant protection item, and of course, this is appreciated. There will be a hue and a cry, though, from the moms and the pops in Barger's district. And, you know, we have to find a, a way not to penalize the small homeowners. We have an organization that I am spearheading called, um, I always forget what I'm the names of the organizations I'm spearheading because I'm so busy, but it's something like small homeowners in trouble. We can call it shit as a little acronym. And the problem is that um, we do have a tough time. There are a lot of uh, tenants that need and help support, but the perception that all landlords are corrupt and all tenants are innocent. We have a upcoming, I'll be submitting an article about some of the dirty tricks that tenants play, but I support tenants. And I, as you all know, am a liberal. I'm not so sure about it. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Greg Bonnet, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is, is Greg Bonet. I'm a staff attorney at Public Council and I'm speaking in support of item 81E. Uh, we strongly support this motion by Supervisor Solis regarding the county's acquisition of rent debt, potential acquisition of rent debt. Um, you know, we think that exploring new and bold approaches to rental assistance is exactly what this moment calls for. The pandemic highlighted and exacerbated uh, racial and class disparities in our society. 
and a, a better approach, approach to rental assistance could help address these disparities and really make a broad inclusive recovery possible. To do this, they need to address the shortcomings of past rental assistance programs. For example, requiring landlords to relinquish debt in exchange for a fair payment would address the unfair dynamic where a land, right now where a landlord decides whether the tenant's debt is resolved or not. And understanding the fair market value of rent debt would help the county avoid overpaying large corporate landlords that don't really need assistance, letting the county stretch the funds further to resolve all the rent debt and allowing the county to make more generous payments to small landlords and nonprofit affordable housing providers who really do need assistance. Stretching rental assistance um, uh, farther to provide more assistance to more tenants could prevent thousands from falling into homelessness. And Excuse like me, your time has expired. May we food. have the next speaker, please? Mark Anthony, Clayton Johnson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today. And whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, agenda item six, A1B, um, and seven general public comment. Um, just want to start off uh, by saying thank you to Supervisors Han and Barger for this really critical motion that would expand alternative crisis response for 24 seven. Uh, many of us, many of us know um, those moments when we felt like we had no options, when our loved ones were suffering, uh, when they needed help, when they needed support, uh, and there was no other option. And calling 911 certainly was too risky. Um, it always has been. And certainly we know that moment when you call the pet team and they ask you, does your loved one have a record? Uh, that's a question I would always put a pit in my stomach because if you tell them yes, th their response was, then you got to call 911. Uh, and if you tell them no, then they weren't available for hours and hours on end. And so this uh, motion today that we urge the board to pass is an absolutely life-saving motion. It is one that is going to be really critical to this effort that we are in right now to close Men's Central Jail. Um, and we know that part of the priority is to prevent folks with mental health disabilities from ending up in our facilities, but also to ensure that they get the care that they need and that families get the support uh, that they need. So we urge you uh, to push for this motion uh, today. Uh, secondly, with regard to item seven, um, it's really critical that, yes, um, that we increase oversight of law enforcement, uh, particularly around their interactions and their contracts and their presence in our schools, because ultimately uh, law enforcement does not belong in our schools. Uh, I grew up in a generation where it became assumed more and more every year that we had to have police on campus and sheriffs on campus. Uh, it became so bad that by the time I graduated college, we actually went back to my alma mater high school uh, and proposed a different solution, proposed trauma counseling and sobriety support for young people, uh, developed a peer mentorship program that I'm happy to say was extremely successful. Uh, and young people took their own well-being, their own education, their own Many of those young people have become change agents, leaders, and are put, uh, uh, doing incredible work now because we believed in them as the resource. Those are the folks who are closest to the problem, closest to the issue that we need to be innovating around and innovating with, not the sheriff's department, uh, which has made clear uh, their stance and their position uh, on these issues. And so we are calling on you to support this motion to really raise the bar uh, and to set the groundwork for us to reinvest and think about how we invest in young people and the safety of young people. Uh, and lastly, with regard to 81B, again, thank you, Supervisor Solis and Mitchell, for continuing to drive forward this critical motion for restorative care village. It, it really can't be understated that after almost a decade of work, we're in a moment uh, where we are talking about not building jails, but actually building the affirmative building the housing, building the services, building out the alternative crisis response, and really the elegance of all these systems uh, that will play into each other and interact with each other and create a Los Angeles that our loved ones deserved when we were growing up, that we deserved. Uh, and so this is an incredible piece of work. It's an incredible motion. And we're asking you today uh, to really ensure that it drives us closer to the closure of Men's Central Jail, that it is rooted in community engagement. Uh, we know Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Elizabeth Guzman, 
Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Guzman. I'm a tenant in SD2 and a tenant organizer with SAGE. And I'm calling in support of item 81E and for general public comment. As an organizer, I've heard firsthand the difficulties that tenants have had during this time. People who owe between $7,000 and $28,000 in rent debt and haven't received a dime from the rental assistance program. People who've spent eight hours uh, trying to fill out their rental assistance applications or have to make more than four calls to figure out where to apply. So we know firsthand, right, that the state rental relief program has not been enough to address the non-team rent debt and ensure communities remain health. With the protection set to expire at the end of the month, hundreds and thousands of LA County residents are gonna be at risk of eviction. So I wanna thank Eva Solis uh, for introducing this motion, right, to study the feasibility to seize the rent debt. Um, and I urge my supervisor, Holly Mitchell, mm -hmm. and all the rest of the supervisors to take bold leadership and follow, uh, support this motion. LA County cannot afford to wait on the state. We've been a county that's been rent burdened, that's had a housing crisis for, for many years before the pandemic hit. So we need to take action now to ensure that tenants, especially those who've been hit hardest by this pandemic, remain housed and are able to recover from this crisis. So we look forward to continuing to work with you all to make a debt recovery something real in LA County. Um, and then for general public comment, I just want to say, as a former student of uh, LAUSD, I do not support police in schools. Um, so I want to say uh, a no on, um, on item two, uh, I mean 69, and the yes on item two. Um, and with that, I, I close my comment. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Event Ail. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yvette LA with Dignity and Power Now in the Justice LA Coalition in District 5. I will speak on items 2, 6, 18, 19, 22, 26, 69, 81, B, and general public comment. On items 2 and 69, I agree with Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson that those closest to the issue are our young people who have overwhelmingly opposed law enforcement in schools. We know that the school-to-prison pipeline begins with policing of students at their place of learning, a place where young people should be safe from criminalization. While I support the intent of Motion 2 and the aspect of this motion that instructs ODR to report on existing community interventions, and supports that reduce the need for law enforcement, it is unacceptable to waste further time and resources collecting data when the research shows that police on campus do not make schools safer and, in fact, harm black and brown students, particularly black girls. The board should instead pursue a care-first vision for our schools, subjecting children to the violence of law enforcement, even violence with oversight, is reprehensible. I ask your no vote on item 69. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn and Barger, for your motion to expand alternative crisis response. As someone who has supported many loved ones through mental health and substance use crises, I strongly support this motion. We have chosen to criminalize mental health for far too long. People with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians. I urge your yes vote on this motion. On item 19, thank you, Supervisor Solis and Kiel, for standing with immigrant people. With item 19, as a formerly undocumented person, this motion is personal for me. Policies that harm immigrants and immigration are policies that harm Los Angeles. On item 22, I strongly support agenda item 22. I know personally that helplessness among women is often a result of having experienced trauma in the form of intimate partner violence or assault. These issues only get worse when women are unhoused, where they are assaulted at extremely high rates, particularly trans women and black women, which represent a disproportionate portion amount of those experiencing violence and helplessness. It is essential that they are given permanent housing to further prevent further trauma and violence and that trans women are provided housing by organizations led by other trans people like the Trans Latina Coalition. On item number 18, I support item 18, freedom of the press is another fundamental right and SB 98 as amended will infringe on that right on 26. The report on the financial status of the sheriff's budget was requested on June uh, 2017, almost four years ago, but the CEO has yet to make it available to the public. Angelinos demand transparency from the CEO with a line item allocation report on the sheriff's budget. What we have seen is the OIG's multiple reports, which show that the sheriff's department is violent and incapable of reform. We cannot continue to fund their misconduct and murder while shortchanging Measure J and alternatives to incarceration. 
please fully fund Measure J in this budget cycle. The Sheriff's Department continues to be the primary driver of liability, costing Los Angeles County millions of dollars, $2 million in this agenda alone. Our communities demand transparency from the CEO and the political will of this board to hold the Sheriff accountable through the budget process this year. The Sheriff's Department's risk to both safety and the public and the county's budget requires the CEO and the board to take fiscally responsible action. Lastly, on agenda item 81B, I am strong support of this motion. Thank you, Supervisor Solis and Mitchell, for your commitment to a care first vision in this master planning process for alternatives to incarceration in District 1. We want to see this iterated throughout the county. We applaud the development of fiscal of physical infrastructure that addresses mass incarceration and houselessness crises and believe that the county should not stop here. Thank you so much. I yield my time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Doug Forbes. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. There are two of us here registered to speak in support of the same three agenda items, number 13, 20, and 21. We would both like to speak to all three at once to save time for all of you, and we will keep our comment under four minutes instead of six. Thank you, Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Barger, for authoring the motions on two critical issues about which we have engaged you for over the previous 18 months. And thank you, Supervisors Han, Kuehl, and Mitchell for your time and attention today. My name is Elena Mattias. I am co-founder of Meow Meow Foundation. My name is Doug Forbes. I'm also co-founder of Meow Meow Foundation. Our nonprofit is hell-bent on eliminating childhood drowning and improving camp safety for millions of children countywide, statewide, and nationwide. While we dearly appreciate being in your midst at this moment, candidly, it's the last place we want to be. We should be cuddled up with our beloved eight-year-old daughter as we plan a summer getaway to show her the incomparable beauty of the Golden State. But we'll never get to do that because Roxy died almost exactly two years ago from a barbaric and wholly preventable drowning at an unlicensed summer child care facility, also known as a camp. Our lives, as we knew them, ended that day. However, our fight to prevent other children from these inexcusable outcomes began in earnest that very same day. Let me be perfectly clear when I say that preventable drowning in unlicensed California camps equate to nothing less than health and safety crises. Drowning is the leading cause of injury death for kids. Unregulated California camps yield catastrophic consequences, including injuries, deaths, and sexual predation. Nobody in Los Angeles County can properly estimate the toll that preventable drowning takes on our community. Nobody in Los Angeles County can say how many camps there are, how many kids attend them, and how many incidents occur. Yet we do know how many food trucks LA County DPH inspects. And even though the state chooses to not require licenses for day camps, the county is not prevented from doing so or, or from inspecting overnight camps the way they need to be. Shockingly, LA County DPH only learned of our daughter's drowning because an EHS official happened to have watched the nightly news. The pool where Roxy drowned was found to have nine violations when the county finally inspected the pool five days later. Imagine what could have been revealed if first responders immediately connected with DPH and the quote, lifeguards who tended to the pool that were not properly trained or certified. The Red Cross has since revoked their credentials based on our findings. Due to the severity of the circumstances when our daughter drowned, two mandated reporters filed suspected child abuse reports. The camp owner said they wanted to keep the day, quote, as normal as possible, but nothing is normal about the fact that neither the county nor the state could shut the camp down. Nothing is normal about the fact that counselors do not have to be trained, certified, or background checked. Nothing is normal about the fact that daycare facilities with finger painting and sing-alongs are highly regulated by the state when camps with high-risk aquatic recreate zip lines and sheer rock walls operate under the radar. During the pandemic, schools that the county deemed unsafe exploited this loophole and were able to operate as camps. Camps charge families thousands of dollars, while counties charge them nothing to operate. Yet camps rely upon county-supported emergency services to respond to injuries and deaths. And in child, an entire child care industry that serves millions of children operates like the wild, wild west. Counties have also endured the financial burden of costly settlements from preventable drownings at public facilities, including county-operated camps. What we can do and what we will do through the passage and enforcement of these two motions before you today 
is gather long overdue information, properly assess the issues, and effectively mobilize proper resources to eliminate preventable outcomes. Thank you for your support on AB 768, which will afford critical drowning prevention policies and resources to over 6 million California students. And sincere thanks for your time. And we dearly hope that all of you will support these measures. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Josie Wong, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. I'll be providing general comment and also speaking on item 18 about protecting the press from law enforcement interference and harassment during constitutionally protected activities. Uh, I am a public radio reporter in LA and today I'll be speaking independently of my employer. Uh, this past year, I've reported for more than two dozen protests, vigils, and rallies. They've been organized across the ideological spectrum from Black Lives Matter to Make America Great Again. And they've spanned the county from Beverly Hills to Palmdale to the steps of LA City Hall. And I've been so proud to help document our country's reckoning with race, racism, and police violence in what, on top of everything else, was a pivotal election year during a pandemic. But I have to say it has come at a cost. In the last year, journalists covering protests in LA County have experienced injury, detention, arrest, and or attempted prosecution by law enforcement. As I've reported before, I was arrested after a protest in Linwood last September. A group of LA County Sheriff's deputies followed several protesters as they retreated down a public street. Using the Zoom on my phone, I reported an arrest. I was tackled and later taken to jail and unable to continue reporting. Journalists need to do their jobs without threat of arrest or bodily harm. The stakes are even higher for independent and student journalists who don't have reinforcements or, lord, or, lord, excuse me, or large newsrooms to fall back on. Journalists of color also understand they face a greater risk reporting at protests. In LA County, they have disproportionately borne the brunt of injury at the hands of law enforcement. Their equipment, their reporting tools have been damaged or disappeared. We journalists are just trying to be the public's eyes and ears. That's why we got into the business. If we don't ensure a free press, a free media, and protect the First Amendment, this affects everybody. Transparency and accountability suffer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Joseph Maislich. Please, take, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Uh, items 31, 32, 71, 71E, and 81D. Um, you know, we're dealing with uh, in, in trying to uh, support the changes that you and the, some of the mixed uh, community and county official work groups have come up with. We're dealing with trying to reverse 40 years of uh, diminution in public funding and also uh, greater inequality so there are so many more people who need support to get their needs met. Uh, this is what we're dealing with here, housing, health care, uh, so much more. We, uh, for this land use uh, issue, uh, Claremont Homes in 3132, uh, we need social impact reports on which to base all of these lands use and housing resource decisions, social impact reports. That should go along with environmental impact reports. Um, then uh, rather than negotiate with builders over money payments or a small number of questionably affordable units, how about a housing program based on critical need as analyzed in accordance with the greatest needs in mind? We as a community have the right and the obligation to demand enough of society's wealth from wherever it is to create and support such a program, including the uh, analysis, uh, the results of the analysis on 71E. Another point I've been told is some communities forbid even the trade of um, giving building permission for some percent of affordable units. Uh, I think Santa Clarita is one. If that's true, how about the board standing up for your anti-racism initiative and the potential new anti-poverty initiative where they really count? and working to undo the class and, in effect, race exclusion, as I'm told is done in Santa Clarita. And if 
that's correct, then Supervisor Barger, you're in a very good position to tell that community the truth. Otherwise, uh, if we don't deal with those things, the county's housing and equality program will be trying to mitigate with one hand with the results of what land policy is irrigating with the other. On 81D, the county's implementation of its shift of programs and services towards care first means change for its workforce, such as provided for by this motion. Very good. But as with all the board's creative initiatives- Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Lynn Planbeck, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Um, this is Lynn Planbeck, Santa Clarita Organization for Planning and the Environment, and I'm speaking on item 31, 32, 71, and public comment. And uh, I'm opposing, uh, we're opposing this project because of the decimation of 23 mature oaks on the, on the property. And there's got to be a better way than cutting down oak trees. Oak trees, mature oak trees sequester uh, carbon. We need to address um, global warming. And one of the ways to do that is by not cutting down trees. There has got to be a way of designing homes around the trees and including them in the project themselves so that they aren't lost and their, all their resource benefits are not lost. Um, and I, I believe that has to start in the planning department when the project is per, first proposed. And I'm wondering if there isn't some way that the board can suggest to the planners that this change be made, that they look at how many trees can be saved instead of unilaterally and always allow trees to be removed. So um, anyway, I just am speaking up for the trees again and ask that your um, board and the planning department start doing the same because we all need this help to stop global warming. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Roy Humphreys, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, just speaking on the, uh, this is Roy Humphreys on uh, D22 and uh, the big 6 7. And uh, to the uh, comments uh, about uh, uh, the deputy on uh, the uh, uh, campus uh, there and outsourcing, outsourcing is just a fact of life. And nobody or a few people uh, cried out when uh, the uh, president of the UC System California uh, sacked the entire IT department and brought in contractors from India. And uh, also as far as the uh, press situation, it's entirely in keeping with uh, President uh, Biden's uh, uh, border policy as far as the uh, uh, press goes. And uh, on the part of 2D, we have uh, the federal allocation of funds. It should include the critical widening of uh, Fullerton Road, Cal Colima, and the freeway in Roland Heights. On the public comment, the supervisors have legalized marijuana, but are in denial of the four essentials of human condition by flogging the courts and jails with continued enforcement of Victorian criminal sex work laws. Learn something from Philly DA on CBS. Cease and desist this behavior and work with the state elements to get these uh, laws off the books. Money saved in one day would widen Fullerton Road. Learn from Thailand and others that these uh, areas have turkey's baths slash massage parlors for both men and women. Thank you. Thank you. And due to the technical difficulties, the chair will extend public comment until 11 a.m. May we have the next speaker, please? And as a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one then zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Chat Stephen Brantley, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment may begin. My name is Jay Stephen Brantley. I'm a resident of District 5. I'm speaking in favor of item 6 in opposition to item 26 and making general public comment. I want to thank Supervisors Hahn and Barger for bringing item six. And as someone who has suffered mental health crises in the past, I urge the board to vote yes on this motion. 
The expansion of alternative crisis response would save lives on our streets, in our homes, on campuses, and at medical centers where there have been too many wholly avoidable tragedies. We've seen how law enforcement, particularly the Sheriff's Department, responds to mental health crises with fatal consequences. I will echo what you've heard, that despite just one in 50, despite comprising just one in 50 U.S. adults, those with untreated mental health needs are involved in as much as 50 percent of police shootings, making them 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter. This is due in part to the fact that police are not trained to help people in crisis, but to put down disturbances by any means necessary, which too often means deadly force. This is especially true when those in crisis are black or brown and are less likely to have adequate access for psychiatric needs and more likely to have their needs ignored when they are able to seek help. In addition to being criminalized by law enforcement, they face systemic medical racism that, despite good intentions by most health professionals, denies them care and puts them in jeopardy. BIPOC folks get bounced between law enforcement that punishes them for having needs and institutions that fail to provide care. Left with no alternative, it's no wonder that crises arise. Expanding the, spoke of, of the scope of PMR teams would break the cycle by getting people the help they need and reducing the risk of law enforcement hurting them. If given adequate resources to be effective, crisis response professionals might completely eliminate police response to mental health crises, and that would save lives. On item 26, I am disturbed to know that a report on the LASD budget was requested almost four years ago, but the CEO has yet to make it public. I don't need to tell anyone that the LSD continues to be the primary driver of liability costs for our county, and it's no wonder. Just this quarter, there were five deputy involved shootings, uh, two of them fatal, and 15 people died in their custody. The settlement, amount, the, the settlement amounts for misconduct and wrongful death are staggering. 81.5 million, 55% of what the county spends on liability. To refer, to refer back to my supportive agenda item six, I fear that continuing to put these bills may compromise the funding of other departments and programs that might well do more to protect and serve our communities than this corrupt and violent sheriff ever will. We must have full transparency with regard to the LASD budget and in light of the danger that this department continues to pose to our communities, we need to look at drastically reducing their funding in favor of alternatives that don't cost us so much, both in terms of money and with lives. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Mark Gale, you state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, good morning. I would like to uh, speak in support of item six. My name is Mark Gale. I'm criminal justice chair for NAMI, Greater Los Angeles County, and a resident of District 5. I want to thank Supervisors Hahn and Barger for sponsoring this motion. Uh, gaining access to funds through the American Rescue Plan for Crisis Response is a welcome and essential opportunity. I personally take crisis calls from families all the time, and the frequency of these calls for help continue to increase unabated, and so does the level of severity of the episodes. We need more highly trained clinicians through the Department of Mental Health, PMRT, to answer the mental health challenges in our county. NAMI Chilak urges the Board of Supervisors to support item six unanimously. If we truly wish to develop prompt non-law enforcement responses to mental health crises, rather than waiting three to five hours or the next day for qualified clinicians. Accessing this funding, uh, federal funding and expanding our non-law enforcement crisis network is just essential and we need to take advantage of this uh, opportunity immediately. Uh, and we also support the funding flexibility that is being considered. Uh, covering the immense geography of our county will take a wide safety net consisting not only of public county resources, but nonprofit resources. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Brian Feinbeimer, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Brian Feinbeimer. I'm a freelance photojournalist. Um, I've been covering uh, countless protests in the last year and additionally before then as well um, around racial inequality and other related events in the last year. Um, I've had multiple interactions with the Sheriff's Department and LAPD where we have been inhibited, uh, photojournalists and other journalists, from conducting our job of observing 
law enforcement working around citizens. Um, if the if the item uh, in the state senate were to go through with the amendment that limits our ability to freely work without receiving permission from an incident commander, it would severely inhibit our ability to accurately and fairly report on what is happening um, out in the streets. Um, I urge supervisors to approve the item 18 and opposing the additional language in the item. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Andre Zimbeck, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, hi, good morning. This is general public comment and is specifically addressed to Supervisor Barger because my property is located in uh, her district. I, I need her help in contacting the planning department. I've been able to reach them for months concerning my property, which is landlocked and has no legal access for ingress and egress and curious as to why the planning department issued a permit back in 1986 when this building was built for the property if there is no ingress and egress. So I reached out to Emily in her, her uh, field office several times. She can contact Emily for my contact information and the supervisor could help me getting in touch with the planning department. Um, they don't want to seem to help, then that would be great, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Jacqueline Sun, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today. And whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Chair Solis and members of the board. My name is Jacqueline Sun with the Beach Cities Health District, and I'm here to speak in favor of items six and eight. I want to support uh, item six and Supervisor Hahn's proposal for expanding psychiatric mobile response team. Uh, network and we applaud her leadership in being an advocate for the mental health needs of Angelinos. And we believe that this proposal will work to find regional solutions and build partnerships and also secure the resources that are needed uh, to ensure that more people have access to these important services 24-7. Uh, and as a health district, we stand by and ready to collaborate with the county and support this important motion uh, here on the South Bay. And in addition, I also wanted to support item eight and Supervisor Hans work to champion environmental health and justice by addressing the detrimental impacts of hexa hexavalent chromium and the communities that are most impacted by the emissions exposures through these processing facilities. I speak in support of the letter to the California Air Resources Board to adopt regulations that would phase out the use of this metal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Zachary Warma. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. Zachary Warma with the Downtown Women's Center calling today in strong support of item number 22, supporting unhoused women and families in Skid Row. This motion, authored by Board Chair Solis and co-authored by Supervisor Mitchell, is nothing short of a historic first step towards permanently ending homelessness for the 655 unsheltered women and families living in Skid Row. Drawing on our 43 years of history of uplifting women out of homelessness and on a path towards personal stability, DWC has developed the Every Woman Housed Action Plan that with the support of this board can realistically end unsheltered women's homelessness in Skid Row. The action plan is a combination of both short and long-term solutions that deploys mobile-based interventions to quickly get women off the streets while ensuring these exits are permanent via housing and targeted services. Women in Skid Row are disproportionately black and survivors of trauma, so this plan directly combats the gendered and racial inequities that are at the heart of women's homelessness. On behalf of DWC and the 5,500 women we serve each year, we wish to extend our deepest thanks to Supervisors Solis and Mitchell for their extraordinary leadership on this motion, and we ask this board for an aye vote. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Laura Colahan. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. My name is Laura Cahollin and I'm a resident and tenant in District 2 and an organizer with La Defensa, White People for Black Lives and the Justice LA Coalition. I would like to speak on agenda items 2, 6, 18, 19, 22, 26, 69, 81B and general public comment. I support agenda items 6, 18, 19, 22 and 81B and I vehemently oppose agenda items 26 and 69. I'd like to voice my support for agenda item six, the expansion of psychiatric mobile response teams and thank 
Supervisors Hahn and Bar Barger for their motion to expand funding to, the, to these PMRTs. When thinking about why it's a necessity to expand PMRTs, I want to uplift the name of our stolen community member, Bashario Mack, who, while in the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall, was killed while laying face down during a mental health crisis. His family continues to fight with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and other organizations for justice in his name. But were someone other than police or law enforcement to have responded to his mental crisis, mental health crisis, he would still be with us today. I'm also thinking of our stolen community member and loved one, Christopher DeAndre Mitchell, whose life was stolen by police in the shower um, in 24-hour fitness on Sunset Boulevard. And of others, David Orgaz Jr., Lena Lyles, who was killed in 2017 when having a mental health crisis. We need to ensure that public safety mobile response teams are available at all times of day and night to ensure that our loved ones and community members who need specialized mental health support without violence. Um, can get it without violence, depression, and control, and, are, and that community members have a choice about whether to call for support without having to risk criminalizing loved ones or other members of their community. In response to Agenda Items 2 and 69, I want to thank Supervisors Kuehl and Mitchell for putting forward a motion for greater oversight of school police and yet encourage the board to go much farther and completely remove any sort of law enforcement from school campuses. I echo the sentiments of others who have given public comment today, like Susan Anderson, Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson, and Yvette L.A., for outlining the harms of school police. I support agenda items, too, but I do not think that more oversight is the sole answer. As Yvette L.A. said, oversight of violence is unacceptable. We need to completely remove law enforcement from Los Angeles County schools. I oppose agenda item 69, continuing the use of law enforcement in schools. I'm a former middle school teacher in the county of Los Angeles, and I taught in a school in District 2, zip code 90011, where Million Dollar Hoods reported in the Policing Our Students report that this zip code was most heavily criminalized by law enforcement of any school police in any zip code in uh, the year that that report came out. When I was teaching, our babies, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, were criminalized, and many were removed from our school campus in handcuffs after being criminalized for survival acts due to life circumstances that were completely out of their control. What's more, this criminalization would not have happened in a predominantly white school district. However, black, brown, and indigenous youth in South Central are constantly being subjected to traumatization and criminalization. This was absolutely traumatizing, not only for the community members who were criminalized and their loved ones, but also for all of their fellow students who had to witness our students being taken from the community violently and with no explanation. So to this end, I vehemently oppose any- time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Dinsty Nelson, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, Dempsey Nelson, Hermosa Beach. I'm calling in support of item eight, support for California air rule to phase out hexavalent chromium. I urge the Board of Supervisors to send a five-signature letter to the California Air Resources Board in support of phasing out hexavalent chromium operations in existing facilities and prohibiting its use in new facilities. I also want to thank my supervisor, Supervisor Hahn, for her longtime efforts to eliminate the use of this cancer-causing chemical and for always standing up for the planet, for social justice, and especially for our underserved communities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Joseph Hexen, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Please begin. Oh. Hi, my name is Joseph Jackson. Uh, I'm representing um, 15. And that is AVRC, the bill to keep AVRC open. AVRC is the last house in the block. I am a product of my environment. I am also a member of recovery. And the recovery world has not been notified that AVRC is shutting down. AVRC has helped hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people throughout the years. I, as an employee, as a counselor up at AVRC, I have encountered several former clients who are out there dying right now. They're crying because they cannot be accepted into other programs. I have worked at such programs such as PIP, which shut down and left a very large vacuum. I have worked for Tarzana Treatment Center. 
who only has 50 indigent beds. We need AVRC up here in SPA 1 and 2. We cannot survive without AVRC. There are people dying. We're talking about homelessness and the opiate epidemic. Well, we have one of the largest recovery facilities in Southern California being shut down because of a budget. What's more important, the budget or lies? Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Devana Watson, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'll be speaking on item 81E. My name is Devana Watson and I'm from District 2. I support the debt free recovery platform to keep LA housed. And as a recent unhoused youth and community organizer, I want you all to vote today in favor of 81E and also take into account that rent, back rent, and financial hardships are a strong leading cause of homelessness. In the state, rental relief programs have left many tenants behind because applications are complicated and landlords have all the power. Thousands of tenants still have debt, will continue to accrue debt, and will have to live with the long lasting impact of this crisis. There needs to be more on the ground support for tenants if you all truly care about combating homelessness, mental health, and wellness challenges. So many people need support in our communities and the average estimated, estimated rent debt per household is close to $7,000. I support item 81E to conduct a feasibility study to see the rent debt and believe that it is a great action to address this unprecedented crisis and ensure all of us can recover from this economic crisis and global pandemic. I urge the board to support Excuse this Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the recovery. next speaker, please? To keep LA health. Juanette Colors, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'm supporting number two and 69 in general comment. My name is Juanette Colors. I'm from District 5. I am a trustee for the Keppel School Board District in the Antelope Valley and a councilwoman for the Little Rock Town and a long resident, an AP, a WPI alumni. I am, I am today speaking in regards to, oh, I'm sorry. I'm also a co-chair for Cancel the Contract. We are asking that you support motion two by Supervisor Holly Mitchell, um, strengthening oversight and school law enforcement services. While we understand this motion does not achieve our ultimate goal and not renewing the Antelope Valley Union High School District contract with the LA County Sheriff, we believe oversight by the County Inspector General and the 90 day waiting period provides meaningful steps towards more accountability over the Sheriff's role in our schools and communities. The motion also relates to the data con um, collection is also very important so that we can have this time and opportunity to inform about the impacts of armed police embedded in our children's school. There is a need for the voice of the Antelope Valley to be heard and considered when looking at this motion. This is a countywide issue, but it relates to the Antelope Valley. Please note our valley has 29 of these contracts with LA County Sheriff, more than the entire LA County combined. Black students make up 16.7% of the student population for our high school district, yet we receive over half of law enforcement, law enforcement contracts. This data was provided by LA County Sheriff Contractor Reporting System as mandated. It would be, um, ex it would be expected for black students at 16.7 of the Alamo Valley population to receive about 16.7 of suspensions. Instead, they received 43.6% of suspension, over 260% higher than expected share. White students are compared accountable or 12.3 of the population received, only 6% of the suspension. That's 205% lower than expected shares of the California Department of Education. The current design is designed for a pipeline to prison. Our supervisor uh, voted last winter to invest 75 million in youth justice reimagined. We have done the work to build a new future for our youth development and 
school discipline and safety, this county must reinvest the broken system of criminalization of our students. In closing, I ask that you vote in favor of the motion. Support being on the right side of history. Let's imagine our children as a priority with professionals, a therapist, counselors, deans, and nurses, as opposed to continuing to pay the $1.6 million to share. We want them removed from our schools, and we want to be um, investing in our children. Our mental health, our homelessness, our foster children, all of that is at a alarming rate of LA County. So please support this initiative, and thank you for um, the supervisors for putting this on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes the allotted time for public testimony. I want to thank everyone for uh, providing your comments this morning. I realized that we had some technical difficulties and I did extend the time 20 minutes. And I do want to encourage all the uh, individuals that were unable to provide your comments that you can still submit your written comments and please do so. I would encourage you to do that and we'll accept them uh, during the time, uh, the duration of this meeting. And that'll also become part of the, of the public record. So I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Madam Executive Offer, Officer, will you please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting? Thank you, Madam Chair. The following items are before you. SD 1, 1D through 4D, 1P, 1, 3 and 4, 7 through 10, 13 through 16, 19 and 20, 22 through 25, 27 through 39, 41 through 53, 55 through 66, 70 through 80, 81A through 81D, 81F through 81H, 84 through 87 are before you. Moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve these items. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kill, I. Supervisor, Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll now move on to the set item S1, followed by item two and 69, which are together which will be taken up, as you know, together. And then items five and six, followed by items 11 and 12, which will be taken up together. And then items 18, 21, 26, 68, and finishing with item 81E. Uh, members will now turn to item S1. This is a set matter on the public health order. This is the opportunity for the board to discuss the closures and pandemic trends. We'll now hear from Dr. Barbara Ferrer and Dr. Christina Galli, who will be available to provide us with updates. So please proceed, Dr. Ferrer. Uh, good morning, and, and thank you so much, Supervisor Solis, and to the entire Board of Supervisors. As always, I want to start by expressing my sincere gratitude uh, to all for your support and tremendous leadership. Uh, and thanks again for the opportunity uh, today to present you and the public uh, with the latest on our response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our, COVID our COVID metrics uh, continue to decline slightly, and we're hoping that we're able to maintain this progress as we move to full reopening on June 15th. Uh, there are many changes that are expected later this month, and I hope to be able to provide some clarity on what that means for LA County, our businesses, and our residents. Uh, today, I'll provide an update on our current COVID metrics, vaccination coverage, and efforts to close uh, the gaps, anticipated changes uh, to protocols and health officer orders on June 15th, and steps that we can all be taking to prepare for our reopening next week. And I'll start with the first slide. Uh, this graph uh, shows the trend lines in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in our county from March 1st of last year through May 30th of this year. Uh, as I've shared, our case numbers and other metrics continue to remain low and stable. Over the past few weeks, in fact, we've seen small declines in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Uh, and we're hopeful that these metrics uh, will continue as vaccination uptake is maintained. 
Today we'll be reporting 186 new cases, 13 new deaths, uh, 230 people that are hospitalized with COVID-19, and our daily test positivity rate is 0.4%. I'll take the next slide. Uh, with our low metrics, uh, we remain in the yellow tier in the state's blueprint for safer economy framework, uh, and our case rate, uh, as will be posted today, remains at uh, an adjusted case rate of 0.7 new cases per 100,000 residents. Important to note that our unadjusted case rate is 1.3 new cases per 100,000 residents, still one of the lowest uh, case rates in the country. Our seven day average daily test positivity rate is 0.4% across the county and also in our communities in the lowest HPI quartiles. Uh, as I've noted, we are among the counties in the state with the lowest case rates and the lowest seven day average daily test positivity rate. Uh, as the state has previously announced uh, after June 15th, we will move beyond the blueprint framework uh, so I would anticipate that we will no longer be reporting this data out in this form uh, starting next week. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. We do know uh, unequivocally at this point that the most powerful tool we have for keeping cases down and protecting ourselves and others are the COVID-19 vaccines. As of June 4th, we had administered more than 9.6 million doses of vaccine in the county. Of these, 5.5 million were first doses and nearly 4.1 million were second doses. This means that 65% of our residents 16 and over have received a first dose and 54% of our residents 16 and over are fully vaccinated. We'll go on to the next slide. When we look at vaccination rates by age group, we can see that we have a lot of work ahead of us to close gaps among our younger populations who, in fact, have had less time in many cases to get vaccinated. In the 18 to 29 and 30 to 49 uh, year old age groups, we're at 52 and 61 percent vaccinated with one dose. Uh, over the last month, uh, we've seen the highest uptake among our 16 to 17 year olds, where we had a 37 percent increase in vaccination in a short period of time. For our older groups uh, who have been uh, eligible for vaccine for the longest, uh, we, they do continue to get vaccinated at a much lower rate, but they also have uh, the highest vaccination rates. But we'll take the next slide. On this next slide, you can see vaccination rates by race and ethnicity, and we remain troubled with the gap that exists and persists among Black and Latinx residents. 42% of Black residents and 50% 50, 50 of Latinx residents 16 and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's compared to 63% of white residents and nearly 73% of Asian residents. And this remains very concerning. As we have witnessed uh, before, Black and Brown residents as our essential workers bore the brunt of this pandemic, uh, especially during our surge. Uh, if we're not able to afford them more protection by the vaccines, with the lifting of the public health safety measures, they again will have the highest risk of getting infected, being hospitalized, and dying from this virus. We'll take the next slide. Among older adults, as you can see, uh, again, these were one of the earliest groups to be eligible for the vaccine. Uh, while we see a gap, it's much smaller. 65% of Black seniors and 74% of Latinx seniors have received at least one dose of the vaccine compared to 78% of White and Asian seniors. Our next slide. I think a closer examination uh, by age groups, uh, of, of age subgroups by race and ethnicity, as you can see on this slide, shows dramatic differences in vaccination coverage between racial and ethnic groups, particularly for younger, uh, for our younger residents. Um, the differences among teens in both the 12 to 15 year old age group and the 16 to 17 year old age group is stark. Only about half as many black and Latinx teens are getting vaccinated as their American Indian, Alaska Native, white and Asian counterparts. And the data doesn't look very different for young adults 18 to 29. 25% of black adults in this category and 37% of Latinx adults have been vaccinated. This compares with 70% of their Asian and 54% of 
of their white counterparts between one and a half and two thirds fewer vaccinations among blacks and Latinx. This disproportionality continues amongst 30 to 49 year olds, particularly among black residents where about half as many black adults have been vaccinated when compared to Asian and white adults. And while we see disparities continue in older adults, as you can see on this slide, they are much smaller. Next slide. The LA County residents uh, who are getting vaccinated at the lowest rates are unfortunately also the ones now seeing the highest rates of infection, hospitalization and death due to COVID. As you can see on this slide, black residents have the highest two week case incident rate among the county's racial and ethnic groups with 37 out of every 100,000 people infected between May 9th and the 22nd of May. They also had the highest hospitalization rate with eight people per 100,000. And unfortunately, the highest death rate with almost one death per 100,000 people. As I noted earlier, black residents are also vaccinated at lower rates than everyone else. These inequities reflect many complicated issues including the distribution of resources and opportunities that are needed for optimal health. And while we must continue the essential efforts that ensure good access to both vaccines and good information about vaccine safety, we do ask for everyone's help. Each of us who are vaccinated can approach our unvaccinated friends, family, and neighbors with curiosity and humility about their vaccine decision-making process. We can share our own stories, we can share what it was that helped us make our decision. And most importantly, we can keep the conversation going. Uh, when, it's, when it's appropriate, we can offer our company and our encouragement to get those in our community that are yet to be vaccinated to any of the hundreds of vaccination sites across the county once people are ready to get their vaccines. Take the next slide. As I noted earlier, in order to get more people vaccinated, public health is focused on two areas to maintain vaccine uptake, improve access to the vaccine and build confidence in the vaccine. To improve access every single week uh, for the last couple of months, there have been at least 750 vaccination sites in LA County. And for the last few weeks, we've had over 200 additional mobile vaccination teams that are going to where people already are allowing for walk-in appointments and requiring minimal documentation and verification. We're able to do this thanks to the partnerships with trusted providers, including physicians, clinics, our faith-based uh, partners, and uh, our elected officials across the county. It's our priority to remove all potential barriers and make getting the vaccine as easy as possible. We're also determined to increase community members' confidence in the vaccine uh, by providing linguistically and culturally accurate information, supporting our many trusted messengers across the county, and providing the latest data in our commitment to transparency. We'll go to the next slide. And as you can see, to make it as easy as possible, there are COVID-19 vaccinations available all across this county. Uh, this is the map for this week with the 765 sites that offer vaccinations. This includes our pharmacies, clinics, community sites and hospitals. And this is all the way through till June 10th. You can see that many of our vaccination sites are concentrated in areas which have been hard hit by the pandemic. And it is here that we wanna make sure it's as easy as possible to get a vaccine. Currently at all of the eight county run sites, all LA city run sites, almost every mobile site and many of the community sites, you can get vaccinated without any appointment. Many sites are open on weekends and many have evening hours. All of this information is updated regularly on vaccinatelacounty.com. Take the next slide. Uh, we also, as I noted, uh, continue to expand our capacity to do mobile vaccination teams. Uh, these are teams that take vaccines into the neighborhoods to reach people uh, who have limited ability or time to get to one of, uh, one of the established vaccination sites. Uh, this week, we have 237 community supported mobile vaccination sites. This is the highest number of sites that we've had available in a one week period to date. Uh, we're directing, and this is just the county mobile teams. There are also city mobile teams and other provider mobile teams. 
we're directing significant resources towards mobile vaccination sites out of a real sense of urgency to get as many residents vaccinated as we can before June 15. And this is because we recognize that for many people, being able to get your vaccine in a public location like Metro, a retail store, at a park, a community or faith-based organization, an outdoor recreation space, someplace that's close to you in your neighborhood makes it much more convenient. We're also continuing to work with the school districts uh, on uh, making sure that there's uh, vaccination availability at many of these sites. And we now are happy to report we have 120 schools that have approved vaccination sites. This week, 61 of those sites are offering uh, vaccinations to students, to staff and faculty, and to members in the surrounding community. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. I do want to note that um, because there are all these different places where people can go get vaccinated, we've upgraded our website. I think it's a lot easier now to find a place to go. It's in English and Spanish, uh, and it allows you to search for a place to get vaccinated by zip code, by the vaccine type. So you want to get Moderna or you want to get J&J, &J, by hours of operation uh, and by location type. You can also search for locations where an appointment is not needed. Now, all sites in LA County, including the pop up and mobile sites, are going to be listed on the web page. I'll take the next slide. To maintain our vaccine uptake uh, and increase it in hard hit communities, we've implemented a multi pronged approach to build vaccine confidence. Uh, we're convening regular town halls. Uh, often with our partners and they're geared towards specific groups. And here's our opportunity to hear from our, our listeners to answer their questions and bust the myths that we know are circulating and that need to be addressed. We hope that these town halls provide an opportunity for residents to ask their questions and build their trust in vaccine safety and effectiveness. Through our partnership with Houses of Worship, we've conducted hundreds of, of uh, mobile clinic opportunities with uh, almost 300 faith-based organizations. We've also been able to distribute over $67 million to dozens of community and faith-based organizations so that we can support their efforts as trusted uh, providers uh, and trusted leaders uh, to provide accurate information about vaccines. Many of these same organizations have trained promotoras and community health workers that are able to engage with residents, listen to their concerns, and connect them with a whole range of appropriate resources. Through generous donations from philanthropy, businesses, entertainment, and sports teams, we're able to continue providing thank you gift opportunities to many that are coming in to get their first vaccine dose or coming in to get their second vaccine and bringing somebody with them for their first vaccine. These gifts are meant to complement our primary strategies of improving access and building vaccine confidence. And they cannot substitute for the important work of strengthening communications, nurturing relationships, and investing in community organizations. We are extraordinarily grateful for all of the partnerships and the deep commitment on the part of so many in our communities to support vaccination efforts. We'll take the next slide. We're now a week away from the much anticipated June 15th date that the state has set for making changes in many of the public health mandates. We expect to see the elimination of most distancing and capacity limits, as well as relaxed masking requirements, and the county will be aligning with the state. In just a moment, I will review the Cal OSHA modifications to the COVID prevention standards in workplaces. We expect these to be approved before June 15. I also want to note that there are a few sectors where masking and distancing protections will be retained given the high risk of either unknown vaccination status, large numbers of people that are not vaccinated, or the fact that they're by their very nature a high risk settings. These sites include schools, child care facilities, camps, health care facilities, high risk congregate settings, indoor mega events, and public transit. For all other sectors, public health will be retiring our protocols uh, and issuing instead best practice guidance. I do want to note that the state has not yet issued uh, their uh, masking guidance, uh, which we'll all be adhering to 
on June 15th and post June 15th. Uh, but they have indicated to us that they will be following the CDC guidance, which really rests on the basic premise that in many places, those people who are vaccinated will no longer need to wear their face coverings. And those people who are not vaccinated will be required to continue wearing their face coverings. But let me get to some of the exceptions. First, let's start with uh, the next slide and the Cal OSHA workplace standards. Protecting LA County's workforce remains a top priority. And last week, the state's Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board voted to adopt modified Cal OSHA COVID-19 Prevention Emergency Temporary Standards, ETS for short, for workplaces, with a small number of revisions that will be in place to protect workers uh, after June 15th. Although the standard boards, the standards board may further refine these revised workplace requirements that we have already seen, this is what we expect uh, will go into effect, as you can see on this slide. In indoor settings, all workers must be masked regardless of vaccination status. There are exceptions. One exception is that when a worker is alone, Another exception is when all persons in a room are fully vaccinated and asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any of the COVID-19 symptoms, cough, sore throat, fever, chills, fatigue. When working outdoors and six feet or more away from others, all workers without COVID symptoms can work unmasked regardless of their vaccination status except when they're working at what we call the outdoor mega events that have more than 10,000 attendees. At these outdoor mega events, workers will need to wear a face covering regardless of their vaccination status. Physical distancing will no longer be required for workers, either indoors or outdoors, if, res if employers are offering respirators, that's you know what we most of us know as an N95, to all of their unvaccinated employees for voluntary use. There is one exception to this rule, which is when there are outbreaks. If there is an outbreak in a workplace, other infection control requirements, including physical distancing, may be implemented to protect workers. Lastly, with regard to workplace exclusion, namely who needs to stay home from work due to the risk of COVID transmission, Cal OSHA has determined that fully vaccinated workers who are asymptomatic can go to work even after they're identified uh, as being a close contact with a person who has a confirmed case of COVID-19. The underlying logic behind these modifications is to account for changes in our circumstances, especially as it relates to vaccine availability and the effectiveness of these vaccines. And as we've noted earlier today, the low case rates across the county and the state. Next slide. I do want to talk for a minute about what we are learning uh, from other states that already lifted their mask mandates um, weeks ago. And I do want to share what we know about what's been happening in these states. We have data from the past three weeks for um, five states that lifted their mask mandates right after CDC changed the mask guidance. This includes Illinois, Michigan, New Mexico, New York, and Washington State. Uh, we also are showing information on Texas uh, that lifted their mandate back in March. All these states, with the exception of Texas, have coverage rates, vaccination coverage rates above 57%. Texas has a vaccination coverage rate at 45%. In general, as you can see on this slide, the case rates from May 13th to June 3rd, to June to the 3rd of June have continued to decline. Michigan, which is the orange trend line, has had the most dramatic decline, but they also had the highest case rate when they went into mid-May with over 350 cases per 100,000 residents. Texas, it's important to note, which has the lowest vaccination rate, is the only state that has, that has seen an increase uh, in their case rates uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks. This is promising news, and we're hopeful that with our continued efforts to vaccinate 
our LA County residents. We'll also be able to maintain our low case rates once we move into a fuller reopening. And as always, we'll continue to monitor our COVID metrics uh, very closely uh, every day as we do now, but certainly after June 15th, and we'll make that information accessible to everyone. I'll take the next slide. Uh, and I do want to end with some guidance on what each of us can do to prepare for June 15th and beyond. Of course, the most important strategy is for everyone to get vaccinated if they're eligible. This ensures the best protection for yourself, for those around you, and for our community. Once specific protocols for most sectors are retired, which will be on June 15th, we do urge businesses to become familiar with the best practice guidance that we'll be posting uh, for each sector and to adopt these best practices wherever possible to maximize safety for their staff and for residents. And finally, we urge that everyone adhere to the state required safety measures that will remain in place for specific activities and sectors. As I noted earlier, these will include sector specific uh, uh, directives for schools, daycares, uh, camps, healthcare facilities, high-risk congregate living facilities, mega events, and public transit. It is clear that when we all work together uh, across the county, we do protect each other and our efforts are on track for full recovery. I do wanna end my presentation by thanking our many community and county partners for their tireless efforts to increase our vaccination rates across LA County especially in our hearts hit and hard to reach communities. I also want to thank the millions of county residents who are parents, grandparents, teens, and workers who have uh, taken the courageous step and gotten vaccinated. These efforts, as you can see, have had a dramatic impact on our collective well-being, allowing us to feel confident in our reopening and with the continuation of low case death and hospitalization rates. Uh, we do need to do as much as we can to keep up this progress, and I thank everyone for their commitment and ongoing commitment to this work. Thank you again, and I'm happy to answer your questions after, do after Dr. Galley's remarks. Dr. Galley, please proceed. Yeah, good morning, yeah. supervisors. I'll provide a brief update today on vaccinations and also community testing. With respect to the vaccinations, please just turn to the slides for your review and I see them posted. If you go to the second slide, uh, this shows progress on overall vaccination rates within the Department of Health Services. To date, DHS has administered approximately 185,000 vaccines to patients, clients, staff, members of the public. The rate has slowed over the past couple of weeks, as you'll see in the flattening of the line on the chart. And this is similar to the trend that we've seen countywide as a smaller number of patients and members of the public are coming in for vaccination. If you go to the next slide, please, you'll see the breakdown in race and ethnicity, which is relatively consistent versus slides I've showed you in the past. The vaccinations provided by DHS to our patients generally mirrors that of our overall patient populations. Though the rates are slightly lower among both white and black African American residents and slightly higher among Latino patients. On the next slide, slides four and five, slide four demonstrates progress in vaccinating DHS patients who are age 12 plus. And the next slide, which I'll go to in a minute, focuses on individuals who are age 65 plus. Here on slide four, you can see several things. First, Overall, the vaccination rate is highest among our Asian patients and then among our Hispanic and Latino patients. The rates between male and female patients are generally similar, except we see a continued trend, which we've seen in the past, that rates among Latino men and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander men are lower than that among women. In looking at slide five, which focuses on patients who are age 65 plus, and again, this is just for DHS patients, this population has been eligible for several months for the vaccine, and obviously the rates of vaccination are higher as a result. The rates are still highest among Asian and Hispanic Latino patients and among white men, and we see lower rates among our black patients, native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander patients, and among our white female patients. The next slide focuses on progress 
among our Housing for Health team to do outreach and reach vaccinations for persons experiencing homelessness and the homeless services staff that take care of them. Over 13,500 vaccinations have been provided to date with three quarters of those vaccines provided to clients, uh, PEH clients and 25% to staff. Almost 4,800 clients and 1,700 staff have been fully vaccinated to date. And please remember, this does not represent the total numbers of vaccinations among persons experiencing homelessness in the county. This just reflects the DHS Housing for Health workload. There are multiple entities, public and private organizations that are involved in helping to vaccinate individuals who are experiencing homelessness. On the next slide, slide seven, focuses on our efforts within the jail. Over 12,000 vaccinations have been provided to date and over 6,600 individuals who are in jail or were in jail at the time of the vaccination are now fully vaccinated. All individuals in the LA County jail system are offered a vaccine. The cumulative acceptance rate has fallen to 51%. It was slightly higher over the past several months, but it's now down to 51%. I'll shift now to testing on slides eight and nine, and then we'll close. It's, it's obviously a major achievement that we can be at a point in the pandemic where we consider scaling down our testing capacity across the county. Our utilization across the county's testing sites remains stable and low, ranging from use of only 12 to 15% of the available testing capacity for the past several weeks. Past several weeks and the percent positivity rate also remains low at under 1%. This is possible only because of the public's willingness to comply with the public health interventions to date, and also a relatively high acceptance rate of the vaccine within Los Angeles County. As a reminder, individuals who are fully vaccinated have different and less stringent criteria for who should, needs to seek COVID testing. While all individuals who have signs or symptoms of COVID and where there is a suspected infection with COVID should still seek testing. Beyond that, if individuals who are asymptomatic, they generally do not need to receive testing regardless of the circumstance and testing is not generally recommended. So if you've received a vaccine and you have an exposure to someone with COVID or you've been around someone with COVID, uh, testing is still not indicated. You can always speak with your physician if you have any questions about whether your particular circumstance might be an exception. Testing site closure uh, is thus something that we need to consider given this low percent positivity rate and the low utilization rate. And it will be determined on the basis of a number of factors. As I mentioned, continue to focus on the test utilization, test utilization, site utilization rate and test positivity rate. Also case counts and vaccination rates in the local area. And then also just the practicalities of partner requests for closures. We've been very, we're very grateful for the generosity of a number of organizations, public and private, who have been generous in allowing use of their space over the past year. But as we move toward reopening, many organizations are uh, understandably in need of their space back. If you'll turn to the next slide. Out of 21 county operated sites, one at, at Leon H. Washington Park closed at the end of May, and five more are scheduled to close by the end of June. These are the site at the Beach Cities Health District, in the city of Vernon, at the Montebello Civic Center, at the Consulate, Gen Consulate General of Mexico, and at Cal State LA. Some sites, sites will also change from a walk um, from a drive up to a walk up model, which allows for greater use of uh, less use of space and greater use of space by the organization for their original purposes. And this will happen uh, at the LA Forum and Southgate Park during the first week of July. And we'll continue to look at the criteria over the next couple of weeks and months and continue to scale down testing capacity uh, in line with what the operational uh, and disease metrics are showing us. While we are at a good place in the pandemic with respect to the demand for testing and the need for testing, the best way to maintain this momentum for the county and for each individual in the county for you and your family is still to get vaccinated. This remains the most powerful tool that we have in combating the virus, despite really what is a lot of uh, incorrect facts that are out there on the internet. The vaccine is safe, 
and the vaccine is effective. If you do have any questions about the vaccine, I would encourage you to reach out to a trusted source of information to get the truth and the facts. Your decision could save lives and will allow our society to continue on this path to reopening. And I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you uh, both Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley. Um, I wanna start uh, by asking some questions and then I will turn to uh, my colleagues. Um, so Dr. Ferrer, on, on your chart regarding um, the uh, two-week case incidents, death rates per 100,000 people, May 9th through May 22nd, you know, I, I continue to be alarmed regarding the case incidence rate amongst the Black and Latino uh, youth and young people. And I'm just wondering how we are going to continue to message and reach out to, to them and to their parents or to folks that can help influence them to get in uh, the queue for the vaccine. And, and how will you go about tracking that? If you can just briefly tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Solis. And, and it's a, a critically important question. and. One that you know requires, I think, us to work very closely with our community partners um, to make sure that you know we're leaving no stone unturned um, in innovation at this point, creativity about making sure that we're communicating effectively uh, with lots of different people in communities that have already been the hardest hit and can, in fact, again uh, become the hardest hit. As we move through a recovery phase, you know, for everyone, the rates are a lot lower than they've been. And, and when I talk to folks, um, you know, that's giving uh, in some ways a false sense of security. No need to get vaccinated when we don't have a lot of people dying. The problem is that the only people that are dying are people who are unvaccinated. So it's an unnecessary risk at this point um, because, uh, you know, the vast majority of people in the hospital who are infected with COVID who are um, testing positive and who unfortunately die are, are people who have not been fully vaccinated. Um, we are being, um, you know, we are relying, I, I think, a lot on, on the partnerships we've developed and are supporting with resources. Uh, our community health worker network is huge at this point and, and really covers the entire county, uh, as do our promotoras. Um, our, we, you know, we have almost 300 houses of worship that we're working with um, and really, again, encouraging uh, those who are partners to get well informed as well, since the message is always uh, better when it comes from somebody you have confidence in. We're working as rapidly as we can to expand the provider network. Uh, and by that, I mean now enrolling um, in the federal and state vaccination systems uh, you know, uh, those providers uh, that have their own practices, uh, but again, are trusted amongst uh, their patients so that they can go ahead and start providing vaccines. This becomes particularly important uh, as we have younger teens that are able to get vaccinated and many parents and teens would prefer to be able to get vaccinated uh, by their own providers. I would say the, the other really important strategy um, that we're doing is is working to train more and more people um, uh, with the facts. And so we, we've launched our community ambassador program. We have a parent ambassador program at schools and a student ambassador program. Uh, because I think we've all, we all know, like just from our own lived experiences, that oftentimes we like getting information from people in our social circles as well. And we just want that information to be more accurate. Um, so we're expanding the community ambassador program uh, that allows people to come in, get an online training. Uh, they get a, a lot of materials from us and they also have access to, uh, you know, special trainings every month um, so that they can too be people with the latest information uh, that's coming out of the researchers and scientists and also the information about how to really demystify the vaccination process and also debunk uh, the false myths that continue to circulate. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have a lot of materials, but at this point, I think we it's the relationships that are going to make the difference uh, and strengthening those relationships and supporting those organizations that already have good relationships 
uh, with people is, is ab absolutely essential in building confidence. And the other side is just reducing any barriers to accessing uh, the vaccine, you know, which, which includes as well communicating about the fact that the vaccines are free, that they don't affect or uh, your immigration status in any way, that they are for everyone regardless of immigration status, um, and that uh, as much as possible, you can just show up at sites uh, to get vaccinated. And, and I want to say, you know, we have to continue that work. There's still many people uh, for whom uh, their employers aren't releasing them from work to get vaccinated. They're working two jobs. Some people we've talked to are working three jobs, and that's the group of people we just need to continue to, to uh, make access as, as easy as possible. We, at this point, uh, can send mobile teams just about anywhere, and we have easy ways for people re to request from us uh, you know, the, the need that they have to bring a mobile site to a job site, to a community event, uh, to, a, to a house of worship. Um, so, so we will go wherever uh, people are asking us, and we are also do out there uh, letting people know that uh, they can ask us for this service and that we'll be able uh, to meet their needs. Just one more question, one last question uh, for Dr. Ferrer. This has to do with the CDC updated guidance that was issued yesterday with respect to people experiencing homelessness. I know that there was some updates and I wanted to understand what that means in terms of uh, how we deal with encampments and ensuring the safety of those that are still unsheltered and uh, what that means uh, to the surrounding residents as well, if you can. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I you know, I, again, CDC has been uh, really good uh, recently about updating their guidances uh, and uh, recommendations on actions that should be taken at state and county levels uh, as part of long-term infection prevention strategies. So they did, they did note that given that we now have vaccinations available, uh, there may be uh, some of the you know, prevention strategies that we were using before, as we were using in many places that relied heavily on uh, mitigation, uh, distancing, uh, making sure that people uh, were always wearing their face coverings, hand washing. While those remain important, uh, there, there are opportunities now to think about changing some of that guidance as you get more and more people experiencing homelessness vaccinated, for example. Uh, it looks to us like we have over 20,000 people experiencing homelessness who have been vaccinated. Again, we have a ways to go, but as we continue with all of the partners to get more people vaccinated, there's a lot more safety. And, you know, that has uh, direct implications for how interim housing sites get set up um, and the work that uh, we're all doing uh, with the outreach teams, uh, which really at this point is focused more on getting people vaccinated uh, than it is on, you know, trying to make sure that everyone is continuing to keep their distance uh, from each other. Now, obviously, sensible protections like mask wearing, you know, apply for all unvaccinated people. And uh, infection control is is just something as a county we need to continue to to stay committed to for everyone. Um, but it does mean that uh, connecting people experiencing homelessness to permanent housing or stable housing or interim housing remains the prime strategy coupled with uh, extending our efforts to get people vaccinated. So you'll keep so us in mind, doctor. Yes, absolutely. As we move forward, because I know there's so many activities underway with the city of LA in terms of how we, how we handle um, folks that are still uh, unhoused on the streets. And, um, you know, there's a back and forth about uh, trying to get them into shelter and, and doing it in a quick manner that sometimes might mean moving moving things uh, faster because now yeah. the health of yeah. and I think, Yeah, and I, th I think the, you know, the biggest issue has always been about, you know, making sure that places are clean and helping, you know, helping to ensure that that level of, safety exists at the encampments, which sometimes means uh, being able to get in there to clean. Now, the strategy remains the same. Um, you know, people need to be offered uh, interim housing, uh, supportive housing, permanent housing, as we try to close down uh, encampments that are no longer safe. 
Um, and and I think you know that 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 continues. I, I don't think there that that CDC was really asking us to necessarily change this approach, which is why I said I read this as continue to make uh, efforts to house people uh, who are experiencing homelessness and to vaccinate people who are experiencing homelessness. And those need to you know remain at the top of the list in terms of priorities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now uh, recognize Supervisor Hahn and then Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you to uh, Dr. Frere and Dr. Galley. This is, uh, you know, it's a, this has been a long time coming. I'm not sure we ever uh, really felt like we were going to get here uh, to this June 15th day, but um, just wanted to thank both of you for your hard work this last year. And when I think about those those mass vaccination sites, um, again, such a big shout out to certainly all of our public health um, staff who, who were there, uh, to the volunteers that just were, had nothing to do with a, a health-related background, but wanted to show up on those days to help, whether it was directing traffic or signing people in. Um, it's amazing, the logistics of those mass vaccination sites, uh, it really is unparalleled uh, in terms of anything we've ever done. So, um, and I remember even, even when people were complaining a lot about how to get an appointment and when they could get an appointment and the frustrations, you know, we never heard one complaint once people got to those mega sites. Everyone sort of said the same thing. Well run, well organized, really a, a pleasant experience if you're ever going to call getting shot in the arm a pleasant experience. But really kudos to everybody who pulled those off. Dr. Ferrer, I just wanted you to repeat something uh, because I think it was kind of um, so significant. And I, I tried to hear again exactly what you said, but you said something to the effect of on June 15th, we will, uh, you might have to go back to exactly what your, what your notes said, something to the effect of we will be lifting all of our health orders, um, protocols, something like that. You had one incredibly powerful statement that I think um, the public would probably like to hear one more time. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much uh, for, for uh, your kind words and all your support. Um, yes, on, on June 15th, most of what will be lifted are most of those sector-specific protocols. You know, the, the A through ZZ at this point. I mean, we have dozens of them. Uh, with the exceptions that I mentioned, uh, there are a handful right. of sectors that will still have protocols. Right. Those will be lifted. There will still be uh, the need for a health officer order. It will really be, uh, you know, really very general around adhering to Cal OSHA. Uh, about making at all of our businesses and workplaces that are under Cal OSHA. And it will also deal with whatever the state ends up, wherever the state ends up landing around masking. But it will right. not be sector specific. It will really be to make sure that we have um, the same um, uh, the well, same okay. set of uh, the same set of protocols here for the county as there are on the state. Um, so, so you okay. will look for. Uh, it, didn't sound, it didn't sound as good as when you said it the first time. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but it is. I mean, it's huge. Like, I mean, all these businesses know. Like, there's a separate protocol, you know, for for really dozens and dozens of sectors at this point, and, and those go away. Right. So schools, day camps, right. Um, congregate living, those healthcare facilities, those will continue to have sector specific protocols. But for everybody else, restaurants, bars, nightclubs. Um, our um, car right. rooms, enter family entertainment centers. Uh, there will yeah. not be specific protocols. Right. Like, so it won't be. be no so that capacity will not be there. The, There's. You know. There will be no capacity limits and no distancing requirements. The only right. requirements that that will happen will be related to the masking um, recommendations or guidance that the state issues uh, later on this week. Right. So, yeah, so overall, it does feel a little bit like uh, if people are, go are going, we, we really are sort of opening up uh, California or opening up L.A. County um, with still, of course, some some sectors which which will have some protocols remain in place. And those businesses will know, will, they'll know who they are 
and uh, you, you know the, the public that interacts with them will also be clear on what those are. But I do think it's a it's a again I wasn't I, I, when we were in the midst of it I didn't know that this day would ever come to be honest with you and and know it's as a result of all the hard work of. Um, your team, and it's certainly the vaccines, they, they, they were the game changer. Vaccines were the yeah. game changer, and that's why we're here. Plus, a big shout out to all the all the businesses and the people who uh, followed uh, our health orders um, and, and really sacrificed a lot to sort of play by the rules uh, to, to get us to this point. So it does feel good. Let me ask you just a couple things about uh, schools, if you could. Um, sure. Uh, explain or, or elaborate just a bit. You know, I was listening to public health officials in the Bay Area who are calling for a full reopening of schools in the fall. I didn't know if you agreed with that. And is that something you think you could make a similar call for, you know, full in-person reopening of our schools? Yeah, thanks so much for that. And and we've already indicated we're we're a hundred percent in support of full reopening for schools. I think there, there are a couple areas where I think there needs to be uh, a lot more clarity and they're in the details and they'll need to get worked out, uh, my sense is, uh, by school districts. But, you know, one is the provision of being able to still provide online learning opportunities for some students who may not be able to, uh, because right. remember, we have a lot of students who will still not be vaccinated in the younger group or have any, any opportunity to get vaccinated. So there may be, uh, for very good reasons, uh, some hesitancy on the part of parents, particularly if they have children with serious underlying health conditions, to send mm -hmm. them back to school. So I think one detail that needs to get worked out is what will be uh, what will be provided for online learning opportunities, understanding that everybody under the age of 12 is likely not to yet be vaccinated. Um, so I, I think that's one detail. But we've indicated all along that we're in full support of uh, full reopening at the schools. Again, that will need to perhaps uh, take into account uh, a lot of infection control still, because we'll have a lot of people not vaccinated still, and uh, masking requirements still. But that's to be determined because a lot of it depends on what the, uh, how, you know, whether we get to community immunity uh, by the end of the summer, because that just means then, you know, case rates are so low that you've got a lot of protection just because we have so many people vaccinated and that could change the landscape. But yes, we're in full support of, yeah. of, uh, of schools reopening. Sounds like, I, I sounds like a rap song, community immunity. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I do want to note that, you know, the, the, the game changer, I think, for June 15th is by taking away the capacity and the distancing requirements, you really are letting businesses get back to normal. However you want to mm -hmm. look at masking, it does not interfere with a business being able to do what they want, what they needed to do, you know, at mm -hmm. full capacity. You you can have as many people as you had before coming in to watch a movie, to go eat at your restaurant. Um, so yeah, the masking for some people seems, uh, you know, for some people more than others as, as a, an inconvenience and something they'd rather not do. But it doesn't stop a business from mm -hmm. getting back to usual operations. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why right. I could say with, with a very small number of exceptions, like we are really doing uh, this full reopening on June 15th. Right. Um, and so, I mean, it's still along that line. Would, would you, Is it safe to say that you also probably think that our colleges and universities will be able to return to in-person learning uh, in the fall without any masking or social distancing requirements? Yes, and, and we've also indicated that to them. Again, uh, you know, there might be, uh, as there are at some large mega events that are indoors, um, mm -hmm. depending on what they're right. doing, they may have some masking requirements that are there that are issued by the state for some of the events that happen at some of the larger universities. But we've already indicated that, um, you know, if, if things continue to progress and we continue to have these low rates of transmission, uh, they they also will have their full reopening without any capacity uh, or distancing uh -huh. requirements. Right. I, you know, I I was I was watching something on the news where they were interviewing people like, well, what are you going to do with your masks? You know, and there was this whole thing. I mean, I don't picture necessarily like a at a naval academy graduation where they we all throw our masks up in the air because you know what? I do think some people 
um, will will give testimonies. I, I know I'm one of those that I wearing a mask for the last 15 months, right, kept me from, I believe, getting other illnesses, you know, maybe colds or my annual, you know, sort of bronchitis thing. And I, I hope, feels like we've come full circle because I remember 15 months ago, we were talking about how people wearing masks were getting uh, sort of shamed and bullied and given sort of dirty looks on the street. I hope we don't get back to that and that if there are those who want to continue wearing a mask for their own personal safety and health, I hope we have a society now that will um, sort of embrace uh, people's different opinions, even going forward uh, about the, the maybe the general health of being able to wear a mask if they want to in certain situations. So, um, yeah, I think that's really important, Supervisor, because I do want to note that for some people who have a suppressed immune system, even if they're fully vaccinated, their providers may be recommending that they continue to wear a mask when they're outside mm -hmm. around other people or inside around other people. There are also a lot of parents who are going to continue wearing their mm -hmm. masks because they have children under 12 who are not yet mm -hmm. vaccinated, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those children are going to be required to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. So, like, in solidarity and to do good modeling, you're going to also have a significant number of parents that are going to continue wearing their mm -hmm. masks. And then, like you noted, there are people who are just going to say, you know, when I'm out and about in a crowded situation, this mask mm -hmm. protected me from getting sick overall, and I'm going to keep this mask on. Mm -hmm. And that might become... Uh, something that we see more of, like particularly during a flu season, if we have a bad flu season. So, so I think right. you're right. You know, my hope is that, you know, we've understood that this is very nuanced still, mm -hmm. um, and that there are some people for whom mask wearing is is still life saving, um, and particularly for unvaccinated people, we need to make sure that they feel comfortable still wearing that mask. Right. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Farrar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Hahn. Next, we'll hear from Supervisor Kuehl and then Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, to echo the praise to all of uh, our uh, doctor uh, directors, um, I think that the fact that the that LA County is doing as well as it is in terms of bringing down all of the uh, infection rates, number of cases and deaths, etc is due to your diligent work uh, for which, especially you, Dr. Ferrer, took uh, a lot of guff and uh, demonstrations and um, uh, disapprobrium. Um, but I hope that you are all proud of the work that you and your staff have done to get us where we are. I want to continue uh, in the vein that uh, my colleague Janice Hahn was talking about. Uh, maybe from a slightly different perspective, which is several businesses have asked me, especially restaurants, if they can continue to require masks um, after everything is lifted in terms, especially when they're um, expanding capacity, which means shrinking the space between people. Uh, they understand there are different rules for their workers <clears throat> and they're pleased about it, really, because they want their workers to be protected. But um, I'm assuming that it will be up to them, if they want to, to say, uh, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. And I uh, wanted to clarify that first. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And in fact, um, you know, as we're talking with different businesses, we're saying a best practice uh, in a place uh, where you're indoors and you're not going to be able to figure out uh, who is who of your customers is vaccinated or not vaccinated, uh, might be at least until we get to community immunity, which we are definitely not at yet, might be to just say, everyone keep your masks on while you're inside. Um, and that would be perfectly reasonable. And in many places, uh, you'll see from us the recommendation that if you can't make sure that everybody who's not vaccinated is, is wearing a mask because you don't know who they are, then the best bet now while we continue to strive to get to community immunity uh, indoors is going to be to ask everyone uh, to keep their mask on. It, it, there are lots of places where it's pretty easy to determine who's vaccinated and who's not because you're already asking that question. Indoor large mega events, you can pretty much figure out who's vaccinated because you're getting some verification from people about their status.
but lots of other places you're not. And um, again, when we get to community immunity, we have, we're protecting the whole community, including people who aren't vaccinated, um, but we're not there. Well, I think uh, the other question really goes to whether it will matter as much as everyone thinks if we do get to community immunity, because uh, what I would like to do is to continue to alert people to the dangers that they face if they are not vaccinated and sort of realistically indicating that if you're not vaccinated, you are still in danger of uh, contracting this pretty bad, you know, uh, condition. Um, and it is really important to protect yourself and to protect yourself against others because everyone you're coming in contact with in that movie theater, you don't know if they're vaccinated. And if you're not, you're at risk. Uh, is that a message that would be appropriate for us to you know, to get out because it only takes one person to infect you. And you don't know as you pass people, sit next to people, eat next to people, et cetera, you know, who's vaccinated and who isn't. Yeah, I think, I think we really um, need to do two things over the next couple of months uh, in some ways concurrently. We need to make sure that uh, people have good information and that, you know, we're getting more and more people to feel comfortable and to come and get vaccinated with easy access to vaccines. We can't let up there. But I think we also need to do what you're suggesting uh, as well, which is to make sure that people who are not vaccinated understand that they're still at a lot, that they still have a lot of risk. Um, and that, you know, uh, making sure that they're masked is 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 one of the ways, again, as it has been for the last 15 months, is one of the ways of protecting yourself and protecting others. And uh, you're gonna see at workplaces after July 15, after July 31st, I think, uh, everyone, all employers are gonna be required to offer uh, their unvaccinated workers an N95 mask. Because remember, an N95 mask protects you from getting infected, which is what we want to have see happen for people who are unvaccinated. We don't want them to get infected. Um, so that's the other thing is, you know, uh, folks uh, who really are, are feeling like they're going to have a lot of exposures and they're not getting vaccinated, they need to like continue to make use of all of these public health measures uh, that are out there that can uh, provide you with a level of protection. Nothing is as powerful as the vaccines. Vaccines have given us way more protection than any of these other measures, uh, but these other measures are still good and they still work and they work uh, a lot. So uh, in terms of schools and colleges and universities, uh, are they allowed to require vaccination for um, attendance at in-person classes? Yes, I mean, I, well, my understanding is that private schools, private businesses can in fact uh, go ahead and require vaccinations. It looks like there's case law that supports that. Um, there are, you know, many of the schools that are, the colleges and universities that are planning to require vaccinations have said that they will re wait until the vaccine has full FDA approval uh, before doing that. But yes, they can in fact uh, require vaccinations. Now you private, the private businesses. For, yeah, but what about public universities? I mean, okay. I can, UCLA ought to be able to say, you, you know, you can still uh, go to class online because I think they're going right. to do, you know, multiple approach. But if you do in-person classes, you must show proof of vaccination. Can they do that? Uh, we, you know, we, we do not want to be giving counsel. We are not, we are not their lawyers. Uh, so okay. we have told them all to make sure they're talking with their counsel. Uh, our understanding is that they can, but we have suggested that everyone consult with counsel because that's just not our job. We're not we're not their lawyers. Okay, I, I understand that. And is that different in K through twelve? Uh, I think it's the same issue. Uh, private, pri you know, uh, it's the case law is very clear for for businesses, private organizations. Uh, we think it's it's fairly clear for for government as well about this ability to require. As I've noted, many places are going to wait until their full FDA approval uh, of the vaccine uh, before they go the route of requiring vaccines. But 
but yes, I, I think it could happen. But we have told everyone uh, that they need to consult with their counsel. Because I was under the impression that K through 12 did require vaccinations, not for COVID, but you know, the, the kind yeah, of- they do. Yeah, so- they do. I think the issue for K to 12 is gonna be waiting until it's fully licensed. I see. Okay, so, um, but I think uh, to return to the point and, and just as my last point is, uh, I think that it's incumbent on us to be very clear with the unvaccinated population the risk that they still face, because this notion of herd immunity sounds like a magic you know, cloak, but it does not mean there will be zero cases immediately if and when we get to herd immunity, um, uh, because I think people will still be at risk. They'll st simply be at far less risk, but I, uh, at least that's my impression. Is that correct? No, you're absolutely correct. It's like measles. You know, right. we have a lot of people who are vaccinated and that's why, you know, we, we don't walk around with face coverings all year long worrying about measles. Um, but if you haven't been vaccinated and somebody around you is uh, is infected with measles, you have a really high chance of getting measles. Right. And there have been outbreaks. Um, so I think, I think we... We want to continue to emphasize that. Um, again, Absolutely. thank you all for your work and for making us safer and safer each month. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Now we'll uh, hear from Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And again, um, con a deep, deep appreciation on behalf of myself as a county resident and all those I represent, um, to the doctors, Ferrer and Fauci. Want to congratulate Dr. Ferrer on her honorary doctorate in humane letters from Charles R. Drew University of uh, Medicine and Science yesterday, a, a absolute jewel in the, in, in the heart of the second district, so congratulations. Uh, like my colleagues, I'm thrilled that June 15th is here, but I, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm the, I, the older I get, the more like my mother, I feel and sound because I still have just a tinge of caution deep in my gut. Um, and so, Dr. Ferrer, um, you know, you sent us a report several days ago where you adjusted the time frame um, for your expectation around, you know, you know, maximum vaccination um, in L.A. County, I believe, to, to late August. And so I'm curious, I know it will be a while before we get to community immunity, but, but what triggers are you and your team looking for uh, if we need to reverse course at any point? I mean, I don't want that to be front of mind, but, but I do just want to get a sense of, for you, what would be sort of the waving of the red flag, like where our numbers are creeping up? You know, what will you be looking for? just so we can be mindful and aware. Yeah, thanks so much. And again, I, I wanna offer my congratulations uh, to Supervisor Mitchell as well, because she also received an honorary doctorate degree yesterday from the great Charles Drew University. So uh, I, was, I was very honored to be uh, there with you, Supervisor. It was, it was a moment of great inspiration for me. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, it's a great question, and yes, of course, uh, we have some metrics that we're monitoring as well as the state. So one one uh, metric that we're going to pay a lot of attention to is hospitalizations, and in particular, who is hospitalized. Uh, so as I've noted, and and we continue to track on here, we look at at everybody who tests positive, and who ends up in the hospital and who dies, and we. Uh, you know, through a, a laborious process at this point, but hopefully over time it will get easier, we ascertain their vaccination status. And uh, as I reported earlier, uh, and I'll continue to report every month, we have very few people who are fully vaccinated, who have tested positive, ended up hospitalized, uh, and, and passed away. Very, very few. The numbers are extraordinarily low. Uh, if, for example, we started seeing more patients who were hospitalized, who were in fact fully vaccinated, that would raise some alarms uh, for all of us. Uh, so one thing we're gonna continue to track is 
of people who are fully vaccinated, how are we doing, particularly around hospitalizations? They're a precursor to people dying often, uh, and they mean that they're serious illness. And we know these vaccines are supposed to protect really, really well against serious illness. We started seeing more serious illness among fully vaccinated people. Uh, it would raise alarm about the vaccines not working as well any longer, or we have a new variant uh, that they're not working well against. So we're going to track very carefully uh, the population of people who end up being hospitalized. Uh, we're also going to pay attention uh, to making sure that vaccine access to vaccines remains easy and never is an obstacle. Because as you noted, we still got a lot of people that need to get vaccinated. So from my perspective, we have to continue to have how to be very easy uh, for people to get vaccinated. And, and we can't really, you know, fall back on that and have there be additional barriers that are making it hard for those not yet vaccinated to get vaccinated. And that includes being well prepared to vaccinate uh, those children, you know, who are younger than age 12 at the point that there might be approval uh, for them to get vaccinated. So I wanna make sure that our vaccination system is robust, it reduces barriers, it's easy for people to access, uh, and it's countywide, and it's particularly available in communities that have been hardest hit. So I wanna to continue to watch what's going on with access to vaccines and, and that there's vaccine availability. Uh, for us, we're also, going to pay attention, as I noted, to what happens with the case rates, uh, particularly uh, amongst uh, knowing that we have a lot of people still not vaccinated. So, you know, some people say to me, like, you know, that that shouldn't really be a big worry. Um, you know, we got so many people vaccinated, so there's a small number of people at risk. But it is a worry because uh, if you have a lot of transmission amongst unvaccinated people, it means you increase the chances of there being a mutation and uh, or of mutations. There'll be more mutations, and some of those mutations uh, could, in fact, be more dangerous. Uh, so I, I don't want that to happen. I, I care deeply for every single person in this county. I want to protect everyone from having a bad outcome from COVID-19. I, I like Supervisor Kuehl's message that you have to make sure people who are not vaccinated understand that they need to take good care of themselves for both themselves, but also to prevent outbreaks. So I do want to pay a lot of attention, uh, even if our rates are low, to uh, where we're starting to see outbreaks and what do we need to do uh, to make it less likely that those outbreaks happen. Um, and are there particular settings where we're seeing more transmission uh, than is safe for us as a community? In which case, as you noted, we'll go back and take a look at what precautions are in place and what safety measures are in place uh, to reduce uh, those transmissions, that kind of an explosion. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And I'm going to try to not, you know, focus so heavily on those numbers and that data, because I know that you and Dr. <laughs> Galley uh, will be doing that on behalf of all the residents of the county. You know, I, I was and, and thank you both and uh, in, in all of your uh, collective work and, and that of your team for really working hard to expand access, you know, to both testing and vaccinations um, to at the community level and all the work you've done for the pop up sites, the odd hours, all of that. So I appreciate it. You know, just struggling as we're continuing to talk about June 15th to just like literally witness on TV on a, you know, the PGA, a major PGA tournament, the, the top golfer in the world to have to step down um, um, three days into a tournament because he tested positive. And I was struck because I remember tuning in several weeks ago uh, at a tournament and thinking, wow, I don't see any of those people uh, who are observing wearing masks. They're in deep close proximity. They are not social distancing like many of our other spectator sporting events are where it's being controlled by the stadiums. Um, and as we talk about this notion that we can assume based on where people are, that they're vaccinated, I, I think we really can assume if people are vaccinated. And so going back to Supervisor Han's question about, you know, the masks and hoping that we don't you know, revert back to bullying behavior if we see people choosing to continue to wear their masks. 
because, you know, sometimes in public places, you just don't know if people are vaccinated. Um, I, I guess I just want to make sure that as we're reopening um, um, June 15th, that, that people still have the information they need to keep themselves safe, whether it encourages more people to be vaccinated or to wear masks if they, for whatever reason, choose not to. That was stunning to see the top golfer in the world literally collapse to his knees on the green when he was told you've tested positive and you have to leave like now. So I, I hope, you know, people take heed and that we're all mindful that while we're reopening June 15th, we still have to be smart about how we continue to combat this virus because we don't want to return to those horrible, challenging days of the last 14 months. Again, thank you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other members that wish to be recognized? I don't know if uh, Supervisor Barger has a question. Not no, but I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Furrer and Dr. Galley for all the work they're doing, but I think all the questions have been answered, so I'm good. Thank you. Good. I just have one last question, and, and forgive me, but wanted to ask uh, Dr. Galley regarding our youth in our probation uh, detention centers. Have they all received their uh, doses? Vaccination? Yeah. Uh, hi, Supervisor. Thanks for the question. Uh, they are all offered doses to the extent um, which which they which they virtually are age 12 plus, um, mm -hmm. but they have not all uh, agreed to receive the dose. And I can get you the exact breakdown on the acceptance rate in the juvenile halls and camps. Okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. And again, thank you both to Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley and for the questions that my colleagues asked to uh, we look forward to continuing to work to see what happens in the next few days as we get closer to June the 15th. Obviously, there are a lot of questions and I and I know that uh, you both will do uh, your yeoman's work to make sure that we get information out in clear manner so that our employers and our residents and everyone knows exactly what to expect. So thank you so much, both of you, again, for a fine report. Uh, this report, as you know, is a received and filed and hearing no objections. That will be the order. Now we are going to move on to uh, item number two, strengthening oversight of school law enforcement services and item 69. These are both coming together, the school resource deputy program, school law enforcement services agreement amendment, which were held by Supervisor Mitchell. And I understand Supervisor Q will also like to speak on this after which I will speak and then I will I'll go to other members. So with that, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, you're on. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thanks to Supervisor Q for your co-authorship and your leadership in reimagining youth justice. Uh, I'd also like to thank the community members and education leaders and local elected officials who uh, our office has engaged and who engaged with me on this issue. Um, and, and those who called in today. It is important to note that this motion is about the board pulling back its delegated authority to the sheriff. This is language that is consistent with standard county contracting practice. Our vision is that local school boards will continue to make decisions, but will negotiate with the board. And we look forward to offering a broad array of county services, while the sheriff primarily can only offer deputies. Local school boards may determine that deputies and clinical social workers from the Department of Mental Health and other social and emotional support are needed on their individual campuses to meet the unique needs of their students and their community. By negotiating with the board instead of the sheriff, our schools and our students can get access potentially to all county services. So again, the intent of this motion and the language therein is not to limit the power of the local electeds, rather to expand services from which they can choose from to meet the diverse needs of their constituents. The county shift to an evidence-based rehabilitative paradigm of justice has really encouraged us to re-examine and reimagine key elements of our justice system. It's caused us to rethink the services and programs for youth to ensure that they are developmentally appropriate and enhance their well-being. 
going back to my time as executive director of Crystal Stairs, uh, I've been committed and remain committed to providing children and their families the resources they need to thrive. Every child deserves access to high quality and equitable opportunities without fear of discrimination or criminalization. However, research shows that law enforcement presence on school campuses can have a negative impact on students. Documented research finds that schools with high levels of security have more suspensions, including a greater black-white disparity in suspensions. In addition, a review of school policing studies found no evidence of improved school safety, while another survey found that the presence of law enforcement makes students feel less safe. Reports of higher than usual incidents of trauma and anxiety remind us that students and school staff now face an unusual set of challenges as schools reopen. School mental health services and restorative justice programs can, as found by researchers, improve behavior and school climate and reduce disciplinary referrals. Today's LA Times front page of the California section references um, a report that was just released by Black Kids Can't Wait. And the title of the article says that some Black parents see less bullying racism with online learning and are keeping kids at home. So we have to make sure that we are providing an array of support services for school personnel, school district um, um, board members to choose from to meet the needs of their student population. With the support of my colleagues, this motion will convene discussions with education and community stakeholders that will help county partners determine how best to support schools in their efforts to enhance student well-being and promote educational achievement. While each student may have differing experiences and relationships with law enforcement, as well as student uh, staff and teachers, the research finds that potential vulnerabilities that we must guard against. The county, I believe, really must closely monitor the impact of school law enforcement services. Again, taking back our delegated authority to approve those contracts, but not have direct control over what local school board members want or request for their schools. This is oversight, and I believe oversight is necessary to promote transparency and ensure accountability And again, more importantly, local districts must be aware of all assets that are available to best meet the needs of their students, teachers, and administration. Ensuring that information is timely vetted and analyzed by the Office of Inspector General, the independent monitor for the Sheriff's Department, is also crucial to building and maintaining the public's confidence. I look forward to engaging in this dialogue as we continue to reimagine our approach to school health and safety. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we'll recognize Supervisor Sheila Field. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for leading on this issue and for inviting me to co-author. Um, let me repeat, we recognize and acknowledge that local school districts are the decision makers when it comes to the presence of law enforcement on their campuses. So let's be clear on one point. This motion does not seek to second guess or disrupt the role of local school districts. What this motion does recognize is the central role that this board has in safeguarding the health and well being of all county residents. This is perhaps our most essential function as a county board of supervisors, and it's a responsibility that we take very seriously. We establish an office of diversion and reentry to protect those with serious mental illness by seeing to it that they don't get stuck in jail cells where we know they can't get well. We established the Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative charged with building out the community-based system of care so the county can make good on its care first, jail last mission. And we called for the safe release of individuals from custody as part of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we did that because we recognized that leaving people in crowded jails place them at a really high risk of contracting the virus. All of these and lots of other actions taken by this board reflect our responsibility to provide for the health and well being of our residents. And that duty extends to our young people 
and children in school as well. As I noted at the outset, local school districts are the decision makers when it comes to the presence of law enforcement on their campuses, but law enforcement is really just that, enforcement. Enforcement does not promote health. Enforcement does not prioritize the well-being of students. The needs of our young people and children in school go well beyond that which can be accomplished through enforcement. And that is why this board must take the steps outlined in today's motions. Because our young people need consistent and easy access to trusted peers and adults who believe in prevention and positive interventions that promote youth development. They need access to support systems that will not criminalize behavior that's a part of, well, growing up. Simply stated, our kids need people who will ask, how are you doing? And how can I help you resolve this? And not people who only engage to accuse them of wrongdoing. I understand that many of our law enforcement officers do their very best, but really think about their training and their mission. I also want to say as to the populations in schools, I was struck by the story uh, on the front page of the California section as well about um, families who don't want their uh, black children to go back to school and face harassment, intimidation, and in some ways discrimination. Um, and it took me back to the fight to establish the law against discrimination and harassment against LGBTQ students in schools back in the 90s. Uh, it took five years to get it through, but we finally did. And I have heard anecdotal evidence of people who are um, finding that their uh, gay and lesbian kids, their questioning kids, uh, kids who are in transition, um, are feeling more safe and comfortable in remote learning as well. So we need to be sure that the school itself is a welcoming place and one that really prioritizes the health and welfare of the students. And I know the school districts want that too. So I, um, I hope that you will uh, support this motion, my colleagues. And I also wanna take a moment to highlight the data collection that's called for in the motion. Um, I authored a couple motions last year calling for data collection as part of a criminal and youth justice data sharing initiative. And I trust um, and expect that the data collection called for in this motion will work with the county justice data sharing initiatives already underway so that we can continue to build a centralized data portal in the county to inform future decisions and spending plans. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Supervisor Mitchell for leading on this issue, for allowing me to co-author, and I ask my colleagues for an aye vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. To speak before um, I recognize other members, um, and I wanna thank Supervisor Mitchell and Kuehl for you both bringing the motion forward to address the on-point issue of law enforcement presence in our schools. And yes, we heard from a number of uh, representatives from various school districts, some of which I represent. And I, um, I've always thought that there were other alternatives rather than just law enforcement to be placed on our campuses. So I think this uh, motion helps us to provide that information uh, more uh, focused to our school district so that they know that they may have an opportunity to have a mental health individual on their campus, a nurse, possibly someone else that could provide other assistance, including CBOs, which I'm a big uh, proponent of, would like to see more of that happen. And I know that in the past, there's been questions regarding the LA Sheriff's Department authority uh, to enter into these contracts with our school districts. And I know that there's been very little oversight and that's why I support the motions directive also to include the Office of the Inspector General to provide additional eyes to review and approve. I know that out of my own funding, we provide uh, additional resources through this at some of the schools that had called in. But I often asked myself, is this really the only alternative that we have? So I'm glad that this motion is before us. I know that there are many questions out there in the community that go well beyond even our school districts, because I know in fact that some of our cities like Compton and West Hollywood who contract with the Sheriff's Department also 
uh, have inquiries regarding the fact that they're not receiving their full so services that they paid for. So I too am curious to see uh, where we are on that. And as you know, I think we all have been uh, very much focused on pursuing the goal of care first in the county. So that means that we also have to take a look at what services we're providing in conjunction uh, at our local school districts with the authority of the school boards, because obviously we want to, to hear them and our community and to have some positive uh, results. So uh, I support the motion moving forward. So thank you both for introducing it. I know there's been a lot of work by many advocates over the years. I know California Endowment did various studies on this. And I, I think it's it's time. I know LA Unified School District also took it upon themselves to do a lot more in this area. So I think it's time for us to move on as well. So with that, I will now recognize Supervisor Hahn, who has uh, wanted to make a comment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I mean, I can't say I disagree with uh, anything that Supervisor Mitchell or Supervisor Kuehl has said or their um, thinking uh, behind uh, what we're doing here. Um, and clearly we know um, over the last year, many people have called for the removal of law enforcement from school campuses. We know that was particularly loud in the city of LA. Um, and there's been a general push to reexamine the impact that the presence of, of law enforcement um, has on school campuses and on and our young people, which is why I support the idea as part of what we're doing today to collect more data and on the impact of the share of school resource officers and exploring alternative ways uh, to keep our school uh, community safe. And I certainly believe that our school districts understand um, the resources that are available to them. And I, I don't see why uh, many of them can't or shouldn't already be um, getting mental health services or health public health uh, nurses on their campuses. And I don't see what we're doing today is in, in impacting that in any way. But I think my issue, colleagues, is whether that is our role as the Board of Supervisors to, um, you know, kind of prohibit uh, school districts from making their own decisions about how they see uh, making their campuses safe, feel safe um, in their particular school district. I mean, we know LA County is enormous, enormous, and it's full of so many different communities that each have different needs. And I think that's the reason why the county doesn't run a uniform school system for all of its residents. And we recognize the importance of local community-based education. And each of these school districts elects its own school boards to look out for the needs of their own students. And I think the decision to continue or discontinue the use of school resource officers should remain in the hands of our local school districts, not the County Board of Supervisors. And I've heard from many in my uh, district, the fourth district, uh, I've heard from many of the school districts um, today, many of them called in, and I've also heard from many of them in my office. Um, and while we all do represent the county, we certainly represent our districts first and foremost, and I'm listening to them. I mean, just like us, uh, their school boards are elected officials who are, you know, tasked with representing the will of their voters. And if their communities um, don't want school resource officers on their campuses, they can certainly advocate for that at a local level. We saw that. Uh, with LAUSD, the community overwhelmingly rallied the school board to cut the school police department, and the school board ultimately voted to do that. But there may be many communities that want to continue using school resource offices, and that should be their local choice. Um, of the 40 total school resource officers that we have here in LA County, Supervisor Barger has the most uh, with 27, and my district has the second most officers with seven. Um, and again, we've heard from them that they like making that decision uh, doesn't uh, preclude them from also 
contracting with us for other resources. I, I don't think having a school resource officer means that, that they also don't see the need for more school counselors, more mental health professionals. I mean, I like the idea of having a mental health professional on every single school campus. I know Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, that has been her uh, initiative for as long as I've known her. Um, you know, just for, you know, not all school resource officers maybe uh, are the right thing, and maybe they don't uh, have the right impact or the right influence. But there is another side to this story, and many school resource officers have good relations with these kids and really um, provide kind of a mentoring situation for them, as well as preventing, uh, you know, so the, preventing violence from happening on the campuses. I know one of my school districts, Norwalk La Mirada Unified, um, two days after the Parkland school shooting, one of their school resource officers at El Camino High in Whittier thwarted a potential school shooting because he overheard a student threatening to open fire on the school. Um, and when police finally searched his home, they found semi-automatic rifle, rifles, high-capacity magazines. So it was certainly, it was a prevention uh, tool as, as well. And I mean, I'll end by saying I know that school safety on our campuses is complex. It's ever evolving. And I fully support collecting more data on uh, the impact, um, which is our uh, initiative three through nine on, on item two. Uh, but I really feel strongly that I need to, to respect my um, district and the local autonomy of the school boards and superintendents to make these decisions uh, for their own schools. So. What I'd like to see happen today is if we can separate um, directives one and two, which take away the power of self-determination uh, and choice from our locally elected school districts, and separate that from directives three to nine, which I do support, because I think that's important that we collect this data. So I would respectfully ask that we bif bif bifurcate that so I can show my support today of collecting data but also show my support of my school districts by voting no on, on items one and two, on directives one and two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did, did you understand that? <laughs> yes, I do. And I understand that Catherine Barger wanted to speak on this as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second that, um, Supervisor Hahn, that, that request. And, and I just want to echo it. I mean, to your point, and I agree with everything that Supervisor Hahn has said, um, in the fifth district, we have 27 resource officers located at seven school districts. Not every school district chooses to contract with a sheriff. There are cities that actually contract with their local law enforcement um, in that community. Um, and, and I support the fact that these school districts are governed by elected officials just like us who have choices to make and who make those decisions based on um, what they feel is in the best, best interest of their school districts. And I just feel that by undermining the ability of these school districts to uh, create their own um, uh, safety net for their school, and and you're absolutely right, Spider Hahn. You know, Grace Napolitano has been pushing long and hard for mental health um, at located on school district grounds, and it shouldn't be an either or; it should be an and. And I might add that many of these resource officers become. Um, friends to those students. Um, I know one instance where a school resource officer was able to help a child that was committed, that was contemplating suicide. Um, so these resource officers really are vital, um, not only for the safety of the, the, the campus, but also um, in terms of supporting the student body. And so, you know, I, I would ask that we bifurcate one and two, and so I would second that as well. Uh, we have a a motion on the floor, but before we go there, before we take a vote on that, I'd like to uh, recognize the author uh, of the motion originally, and that's Supervisor uh, Mitchell, if you wanted to make any statement, uh, what, your, what your sense is. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, I, I must say that I will not be supporting the motion to bifurcate. Um, I think I, I've heard my two colleagues loud and clear and would suggest that, um, again, I'll restate that there is no language in the motion that limits the power or the ability of a local elected school board member to make the 
decision that's in their best interest for their school. What this motion does is pulls back this board's delegated authority to the sheriff to negotiate contracts directly on his own. Um, I, although I am the new the newest member of this board, um, I, based on my review of the work of the board and our power to review contracts entered into by many other departments, I don't think this is an overreach. I think the multiple elements of this motion work concurrently for it to be relevant to meet all the other uh, expressed interests and desires of the board members in terms of um, A, hearing and acknowledging um, those districts who would prefer to negotiate more broadly. I think the contracts offered by the sheriff are, you know, narrowly focused because they are law enforcement bodies. And so, um, as my colleague used the term self-determination, I think the notion of self-determination is multifaceted. And so we are not impinging on the self-determination of locally elected bodies. And we are also hearing and acknowledging the desire for self-determination of many of the families and, and some local school board members and students uh, on schools across this county. And so um, again, if the motion is to uh, bifurcate the motion, I will not be supporting that. Um, I think it's uh, reasonable to just expect a vote up or down um, on the motion as presented. Thank you. Um, I am gonna recognize Supervisor Sheila Kuehl as a co-author. She uh, asked to be recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's a bit of a conundrum, I think, um, and I, I agree with uh, Supervisor Mitchell that generally we we want to have a an up or down vote on something. But um, this board has often, I don't know, out of comedy, I guess, C O M I T Y, um, allowed members to request. A bifurcation. I'm not saying it's a tradition or a rule or anything like that, uh, so that they can, uh, I guess, you know, vote their conscience. I, I heard um, Supervisor Han indicate that she had heard, you know, from many people in her district. So perhaps, you know, voting her district, whatever it it seems like to her. I don't see that um, asking the uh, Inspector General to report to us about the effect of any uh, extensions or amendments to the sheriff's contract uh, essentially interferes with the ability of school districts to say yes or no. Uh, so I don't see that the first two directives are any danger to the independence of the school district, but it does recognize the role of our board to protect the overall health and safety in the same way as the sheriff tells us we, you know, we're not the boss of him. And yet in many ways we are because we have the larger responsibility to watch out for our constituents. So I guess I might ask, uh, uh, and again, it's a little messy, but the temperature of the board about whether we are really opposed to bifurcating because it's more of a general courtesy um, or if we uh, you know Supervisor Mitchell I know that you have said you don't want it bifurcated I intend to even if it is bifurcated vote in favor of the first two directives obviously and um, I would hope that there would be sufficient votes uh, to carry them through um, but I don't, I'm a little stuck about the bifurcation piece because we generally have just said, sure, if you're not comfortable, we'll let you do it. And I think some of us have asked in the past for the same kind of thing where one directive really gave us heartburn, but we wanted to support the rest. So I'm not really sure kind of how to resolve this. Uh, well, I go, you know, I want to so, go with my so, author, obviously. 
So, Supervisor Q, let me just clarify. I, I'm not objecting to the two members putting forward the motion. My point was that I would not be voting in support of that motion. That's just my individual vote. I'm clear about the culture of this body and working uh, collaboratively. Um, my point was that um, I believe, you know, the rationale for the bifurcation is not justified based on the actual language of the motion. That was my point. And my only point is that I would not cast my individual vote in support of a motion that bifurcates. That's all. Um, at no point yeah, was yeah. I suggesting that, you know, a, a uh, supervisor should then have the right to make the request. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, vote. can I just, can, this Supervisor Hahn, yeah, I, I, I hear you, and I, uh, Sheila, I appreciate what you're saying, because as you said, sometimes one directive uh, gives someone heartburn, and we just want to make that clear that we don't support it. And I'm basing this, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm basing this on Directive 2, which basically says um, all contracts with the Sheriff's Department for resource officers must uh, come back to this body for approval. So to me, uh, it does give us the up or down uh, approval authority over a school district, which does, in my opinion, uh, limit uh, their ability to do what they want. So that's what I'm basing this on. Um, well, it's a good, but it's a good question, Janice, about who's contracting with the school district. Um, you know, whether the sheriff has an independent authority outside this board to really contract with the district, we delegate the authority, but a delegated authority means that it's really our authority that we're allowing the sheriff to exercise. And I think in this case, we're saying we want to um, retain our authority. It's not changing or taking away from the district. The district is still speaking for itself and it's still contracting with the county. But so are you saying, saying, but are you saying, um, Supervisor Kuehl, that it, so you're, you're, so you're basically saying that it, their, their contract would not come before us for an up or down vote, but we would be the actual person. So we would be negotiating for law enforcement officers on campuses in LA County. I don't think so. I think that the uh, request is for the sheriff to, you know, enter into uh, a, a proposed contract and to have it reviewed, as I understand it, um, uh, under that. So by a number of uh, people looking to reporting back to the board about whether the amendments are uh, having a detrimental effect. And but the board has the ultimate authority, as I understand it anyway, because when it, we've delegated it to the sheriff, that means it's our authority. We're taking right. it back is what you're saying, Sheila. I hear you, and, and it's still, that still gives me angst because when I think about contract cities, uh, being able to negotiate with the sheriff for, for law enforcement off, I just feel, again, it's an overreach for us, but I, I totally get where you're going. I would like the ability to, to vote no on that, so. Okay, let me, uh, let me chime in. I, I um, have been around the board as long as Sheila has, and we do extend courtesies when members do feel that they can't vote for say certain sections of bill, we've done it many, many times out of, out of courtesy. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're, that we're not in support of the overall motion, which I am supportive of. So th let, that, let that be clear. So can we proceed? You're the chair. Okay. <laughs> so, we're, so let's, take, let's take the vote. It has been... Uh, Requested by Supervisor Hodge, she moved to bifurcate directives one and two, and it was seconded by uh, Supervisor Barger. So let's take a vote on, on the bifurcation. So Executive Officer, please call the roll. The motion to bifurcate is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. No. Supervisor Mitchell, no. Supervisor Kiel. Aye. Supervisor Kiel, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Yes. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Yes. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Yes. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries four to one. Okay, so uh, now uh, what we'll do is directives one and two of item two are before us. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Directives one and two, uh, item two is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. 
Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? No. Supervisor Hahn, no. Supervisor Barger? No. Supervisor Barger, no. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries three to two. Okay, now we will uh, vote on the remaining directives of item two, which is directives three through nine, which are before us, and that's moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve those directives. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Directives three through nine uh, are before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Happy to vote, vote to vote aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Unanimously, I might say. Okay, now members, we will go on to vote on item 69, which is also a part of this and is, a, is amended by item two. This is moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Kuehl. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 69, as amended, is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. I'm going to have to vote no, unfortunately. Supervisor Hahn, no. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries four to one. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, now, members, we're going to turn to item number five, which is enhancing countywide solid, solid waste management through expanded program and infrastructure. I just wanted to give it to you while we were doing that item. That's the thing. Thank you. This was, this was uh, held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl, please unmute your mic. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm glad that we have something a little bit easier, perhaps, to look at. And I wanted to hold this because uh, the county does a lot of extraordinarily good work on environmental issues, um, and often uh, they're not highlighted. So I simply wanted to um, explain this one motion and ask for your I vote. Uh, as we know, California is already experiencing some pretty significant effects of the climate crisis, and it requires really bold action to prevent further devastating impacts to our county and to our whole region. Um, among the various ways that we can deal with this, diverting waste, believe it or not, can be a major climate solution because it prevents methane emissions at the local landfills. And methane is a very powerful, though short-lived climate pollutant, but it is 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of its effect on um, uh, global warming. Uh, now, a lot of progress has been made in the solid waste sector. This is, you know, the trash that you put out and gets collected. And often these are not the recyclables, but the stuff that ends up in landfills. But there are new challenges affecting our ability to achieve our sustainability goals. Um, international laws and treaties, for instance, are now severely restricting the export of recyclables and kind of upending uh, recycling markets. So a lot more is going into, uh, not in the recycling bin, but uh, into our landfills. Uh, the most recent countywide organic waste management plan annual report estimates that about five and a half million tons of organic waste is disposed of countywide every year. While there's less than half a million per year of available organic waste processing capacity. What is organic waste? It's, um, I guess, in the old days, what we used to call garbage. It is, you know, the uh, leftover from cooking and green waste and a lot of different kinds of things that used to be alive. Think of it that way, vegetables and fruits and that kind of waste. Um, and California law SB 1383 also requires 75% of our, our, our uh, organic waste to be diverted away from landfills. And that requires 10 times the diversion capacity that we currently have in the county for organic waste. Uh, Cal Recycles analysis of our progress toward SB 1383 organic waste reduction goals showed that the 2020 goals were not met. And this is not a surprise 
considering we don't have the infrastructure and we don't have the resources. So as a regional leader, the county has a responsibility to help reduce the generation of waste, um, kind of source control. Um, and um, we can support economic recovery and local job creation at the same time through the development of new infrastructure. Uh, initial estimates show that LA County, including all of our cities, would need about a billion dollars of capital investment to bridge our infrastructure gap. So given the level of investment needed, it's really important that the county leverage all available funding, including state grants and federal infrastructure programs to achieve our ambitious waste reduction and climate goals. So the county needs to support investment in a portfolio of source reduction strategies, infrastructure, and programs uh, to build resiliency to climate change and advance solid waste management in the county. There are a lot of really nifty new ideas about how to do that, and uh, some of which we're starting to do pilot projects in some of our landfills. So I hope that you will be um, supportive of this uh, motion, and I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. I just wanted to commend you for introducing this motion. It is an important motion to help us reduce our waste generation and increase landfill diversion and encourage our investments in local recycling infrastructure so that our county residents and our local businesses can have expanded options to dispose their waste outside of landfills in a sustainable and responsible manner. And as you know, uh, because of COVID, the COVID pandemic, it has significantly impacted our people's food purchasing and consumption habits and raised uh, altogether the public awareness and concern over how much waste is disposed in our county landfills. And as you know, landfill sites and disposal facilities are where the majority of these leftover plastic materials, green waste, and recycle recyclables are sent. So in order to meet our diversion goals, as you mentioned in Senate Bill, uh, 1383, we have to look at the ways the county can increase organic waste diversion from our landfills and take advantage of the state and federal funding investments that are coming our way. So I do also believe it's a win-win for the county of Los Angeles, Los Angeles and would urge our colleagues to vote, uh, vote aye on this uh, as well. So are there any uh, questions from other board members on this item? Okay, seeing none. Uh, then we will now move on, uh, and I would, I would. Uh, this has been moved by Supervisor Q, and I will <laughs> second it. I will second it. Uh, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item five is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Q. Aye. Supervisor Q, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barker, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, great. Uh, now we're moving on to item number six, expanding alternative crisis response in Los Angeles County, which was held by Supervisor Hahn and also uh, Supervisor Barger is the co-author. So in that order, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, Supervisor Barger for co-authoring this with me. Um, and uh, this board has had so many conversations about the importance of building up our alternative crisis response system so that when someone has a mental health crisis, they get the help they need. And right now, the system is simply inadequate. Uh, over a month ago, one of our Measure J committee appointees, Eunices Hernandez, saw a woman outside her home early in the morning who was having a mental health crisis. It was clear that the woman was not in danger to herself or others, but that she needed some mental health support. So Eunice has called the Department of Mental Health Helpline uh, to request a psychiatric mobile response team, but it was 7.15 a.m. And our psychiatric mobile response teams don't run 24 seven. So the dispatcher told her to call back after eight. Eunice has brought the woman food, tried to keep her calm and convinced her to stay there until the mobile response team arrived, which didn't happen for nearly two hours. This story clearly illustrates the shortcomings of what we have currently. Um, I am so admire Eunice's dedication. No one should have to wait two hours for a mental health crisis response, 
And of course, mental health crises don't just happen during business hours. And most people, and we have seen this, uh, would simply have given up and called 911, which is why it's so important that we build up our alternative crisis response system before our 988 number is implemented as the official number for all mental health crisis and suicide prevention hotlines. 988 is just a number, but it's up to us to provide the services. And I'm worried that if we don't have these services in place, by the time 988 goes live next summer, then people will continue to rely on 911. So this motion today aims to build up our alternative crisis response network by taking advantage of a new federal funding opportunity. The American Rescue Plan Act increases the federal Medicaid match rate for mental health mobile crisis services from 50% to 85%. And that is a significant increase in funding, and that could give us the opportunity to finally expand our psychiatric mobile response teams. This increased match will begin sometime in early 2022, and it requires that our services run 24-7 in order to access those funds. So this motion is twofold. First, it asks for a plan to ramp up our psychiatric mobile response teams to 24-7 before the new federal funds become available so that we can actually qualify to access them. And second, it asks for a plan to use the new federal funds beginning in 2022 to build an expanded and improved psychiatric mobile response team network that can be accessed, accessed through our 988 number. Bottom line is this, our psychiatric mobile response teams will not be a viable alternative to law enforcement and ambulances unless they can run at comparable levels. And 988 won't be viable alternative 911 unless it provides timely crisis response. Our residents in crisis deserve to receive a fast, unarmed mobile crisis response at any time of the day or night. And it's time to treat mental health emergencies with the same attention and resources that we treat physical health emergencies. And expanding our psychiatric mobile response teams is one of the first steps that we can begin planning for now. And I know uh, Dr. John Sharon, this has been his vision uh, for a long time, and we appreciate his willingness and enthusiasm to help us get where we need to be. Thank you again, Supervisor Barger, uh, for co-authoring this motion. Uh, I hope I can have the support of all of our supervisors in what we're doing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Barger, you're recognized. Thank you. And I also want to thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for allowing me to co-author this motion. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart, and it's a priority. And I think that even with 24-7, um, we're going to find that the need is going to grow. Um, you know, I look at the PMRTs as a key tool in our toolbox to ensuring that our residents receive the most effective and humane response when suffering from an acute mental health emergency. Um, there are instances where law enforcement shouldn't be the primary response team. It should be a PMRT. Um, and when you look what the federal government is doing in prioritizing expanding mental health services in their most recent stimulus package, I truly am grateful um, that we can look at using um, this to support increasing our services. So I want to thank, you know, the Department of Mental Health, Dr. Sharon. This is a vision that you've had, and I know the expansion is something that has been at the top of your list. So I appreciate your leadership in developing these programs, and I'm, I'm excited for um, the opportunity to really roll this out, and it will change lives, change lives for the better. Um, by allowing trained individuals um, to intervene uh, before law enforcement. So again, thank you, Supervisor Hahn, uh, for allowing me to co-author this. Myself, before I go to Supervisor Kuhl and then Supervisor Holly Mitchell, I want to thank you also, Supervisor Hahn and Barger, for bringing this motion forward. Uh, we know time and time again that Sometimes it doesn't make sense for us to send out law enforcement to respond to uh, a mental health crisis. And I raise that also because in my district recently, a 25 year old Isaiah Cervantes from the city of Cudahy, um was uh, 
having an episode and when his parents called for help, uh, they did not send a team out. Uh, and unfortunately, he was um, he was shot and uh, is now, I believe, recovering, hospitalized and is permanently, I think, uh, has a spinal injury that, that is just not going to not going to be helpful for him. But I do think that we have to look at other uh, ways that we can provide trained clinical professionals to help us uh, pursue nonviolent and non coercive responses. So I, too, uh, am very supportive of the Department of Mental Health in having these psychiatric mobile response teams fully uh, available because I understand the need is 24 hours. So I do believe this is one of the one of the methods that we need to take. So I commend uh, both of you. Uh, for bringing this item forward. So with that, uh, I will recognize Supervisor Sheila Q. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and kudos to uh, Supervisors Hahn and Barger for this motion, which I'm not even going to ask to bifurcate. Ha -ha. Um, so as the authors- I was, waiting for, I was waiting for one of you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just okay. A little, you you know, if we were sitting looking at each other, you would see that I would have a smile on my face. Yes. Uh, this thing. <laughs> but you know, as both the authors have noted and our uh, board chair, um, this county and this board have repeatedly supported efforts to uh, introduce, to pilot, and to expand programs that offer methods of responding to crises in our communities that are alternatives to standard law enforcement response. Um, that we have when somebody calls a 911 number during uh, an emergency. Uh, DMH, the new ATI office, are doing great work to build out alternative crises response systems. And I'm really excited to see the new 988 system rolling out next summer. But programs like the uh, PMR teams fill an enormous unmet need in the community to help those in the midst of a mental health crisis who need the appropriate care and support. We have um, item, I think maybe even two items later where we have uh, settlements that um, stemmed from law enforcement response where there was a mental health crisis. Um, and the reality is we just don't have enough resources in the communities to do this, though we've established and expanded MET and LET teams uh, that partner law enforcement agency with DMH personnel but these programs still can't scale up to the proper level. And we've heard from the community, uh, especially during the year long process of drafting uh, the alternatives to incarceration, that work group's final report really emphasized building out a system of resources to respond to friends and family and neighbors when they have mental health emergencies. So I strongly support this effort to expand the PMRT services take advantage of some additional federal funding to support it. And again, thank the authors for introducing the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I too wanna thank the uh, Supervisors Hahn and Barger for the motion. Uh, I am all for increased Medicaid matches um, to the fullest extent possible. Uh, and I'm um, happy to support the motion but just wanted to raise an additional point for us all to be mindful. You know, when residents call 911 or 988, you know, they won't always know the reason a person is in crisis or, or be able to define the crisis specifically. We can only report kind of what we see in terms of behavior. And there may be underlying, you know, co-occurring health problems that, that they may be suffering. Um, you know, for example, if the medical component isn't also addressed, the patient may end up going to the ER for formal medical clearance. And that could mean a long, uncomfortable, and expensive delay to them receiving the mental health services and, and perhaps a mental health bed that they really should be in. So uh, I look forward to continuing to have conversations about a motion to expand approaches that provide a true integrated, multidisciplinary team to compassionately respond to these crises and reduce emergency room overcrowding as well. I appreciate Department of Mental Health uh, bringing it forward. I get it. I think that there is a health component that cannot be ignored. And I hope in a future motion, we'll be able to again, take advantage of these wonderfully enhanced Medicaid dollars to make sure that that element is also included for this very vulnerable 
uh, deserve it population. I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, hearing no other comments, item six is before us. Moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item six is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barker, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Next, uh, now members will move on to item number 11, and that is support for Senate Bill 314 and Assembly Bill 61, which was held by Supervisor Barger, and item 12, establishing a permanent options for outdoor dining, which was held by Supervisor Barger and Mitchell. Supervisor Barger, please unmute your mic uh, for your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank Supervisor Hahn for co-authoring um, the motion with me. Uh, as the country, the state, and the county continue to push through the COVID emergency, there is hope that normalcy will return very soon. With that return, there will be a renewed effort to help all of our small businesses that make up the backbone of the county's economy. The restaurant and service industry in particular was hard hit and bore the brunt of the economic devastation. LAEDC documented that and, and provided um, the statistics to back that up. In response to the public health orders that limited and then eliminated indoor dining altogether, Supervisor Hahn and I asked the county to create a temporary outdoor dining program to allow expanded dining options in June of 2020. This program has been successful and utilized throughout the county. And we wanna make sure this program becomes permanent. This motion directs county departments to quickly create guidelines to allow for the permanent use of outdoor dining for restaurants operating under the temporary program. It also asks the county to assist restaurant owners in identifying new outdoor dining spaces that can be used. In addition, we are asking our legislative advocates in Sacramento to support Senate Bill 314 and Assembly Bill 61 bills that support expanding outdoor dining options. These bills will allow for temporary alcohol licenses and satellite food service permits to continue for one year after the emergency orders are lifted. They also make the application process of a parking zone variance or a conditional use permit a ministerial process until January of 2024. While I support both bills, I would like to see legislation that makes permanent many of the temporary outdoor dining policies currently in place. The restaurant and hospitality sector face a long road to recovery, and I believe we should support this industry in any way possible. This summer, I encourage all of my fellow Angelinos to have a dinner out safely while enjoying the beautiful Southern California weather and supporting our local restaurants. So with that, I would ask for an I vote on these. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now recognize Supervisor Hahn and then Supervisor Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Catherine, for allowing me to uh, join you on this motion. You know, what a, um, on one hand, such a devastating year and a few months that we have enduring um, this worldwide pandemic. Uh, there were a few uh, silver linings uh, with uh, what happened last year. Uh, certainly, I think one of them was was people realizing that they they can work from home in a way that's both productive and meaningful. And one of the other things was uh, outdoor dining. And when we realized that uh, it was safer to be outdoors and that um, our health uh, orders still limited the indoor dining uh, possibilities, we were embracing the outside uh, dining possibilities and. What these uh, items 11 and 12 do is sort of just support that notion that we should continue some of the good things that we found out about this pandemic. And one of those is certainly outdoor dining. And we here in Southern California have the perfect um, weather and environment to continue to enjoy outdoor dining. And this will, uh, our CEO will work with our Department of Public Works, our planning, 
uh, with uh, DPH, our, our fire department, to make sure that we can continue um, to uh, allow this uh, outdoor dining in the safest way possible for the restaurants that are currently uh, participating in this. But I think it's also my goal to uh, figure out how do we get other restaurants as well uh, to find the joys in outdoor dining. Um, you know, a lot of restaurants, I know where I live in San Pedro, a lot of them for years have tried to push uh, the, the city of Los Angeles to allow for more tables on the sidewalk, more European type outdoor dinings, and we're consistently uh, rebuffed in their effort. This pandemic has uh, shown the necessity for um, not only allowing these restaurants to creep out onto the sidewalks and some in the street, but really embracing it. So thank you for this. Um, I think this is this is a good thing to to keep from uh, the pandemic year. Thank you. Thank you. Let's recognize now Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I'd like to thank Supervisors um, Barger and Hahn for your uh, staunch advocacy on behalf of the restaurants uh, uh, all over the county for this entire pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen many restaurants close permanently, and those that managed to stay open were able to do so because they got creative. Uh, I agree. One of the really bright spots of of what we've experienced is really to watch the explosion of outdoor dining, albeit out of necessity, but I believe it's a good thing. But unfortunately, not every neighborhood um, has been able to take advantage of outdoor dining. And in fact, it is a absolute shock to me when I consider Culver City has basically shut down, you know, Washington Boulevard heading west to allow so many restaurants to continue outside dining. But even given that, given all of the various neighborhoods that are eligible for an outdoor dining permit, there's only one establishment with a permit in the second district. And so given that, uh, I'm hoping that a friendly amendment will be expected in an effort to make greater use of the program. And so with the author's permission, I'd like to propose the following. On directive two, I'd like to ensure that we're doing more to help businesses operate within the public right of way and would like to ask our departments to identify solutions to help businesses operate permanently, including on the identification of required traffic safety and accessibility equipment. There are plenty of regional examples of this, and I ask that we follow the lead of other jurisdictions or other areas in the county outside of the second district. I'd like our departments to develop a plan to increase awareness and participation of restaurants, especially in neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by this dual health and economic pandemic. This plan should include a strategy to engage stakeholders to shape proposed guidelines and marketing resources to communicate directly with businesses on guidelines in an approach that is linguistically and culturally appropriate. So I'd like to ask a report back in writing within 30 days. Thank you uh, very much. I also um, support the motion and the amendment that is being put forward. I, I want to say that it's great that this uh, program worked across across the county, and I know uh, the city of Los Angeles is already moving in this direction. But I'll tell you, in low-income impacted communities like East Los Angeles, many of our small restaurant mom and pop uh, stores did not participate, partly because they lacked information about how to get involved in the program, and they, they required technical assistance. So I hope in the next you know, iteration in the next 30 days that we get back the report that we actually make it a point to do good outreach and make sure that we can provide the necessary assistance that was outlined as Supervisor uh, Mitchell brought forward to, to help places like East Los Angeles help provide uh, that assistance that's so sorely needed to most impactful uh, communities that really shut down and probably could have had other alternatives had they better uh, been resourced with information. So I support uh, the motion and and the, the friendly amendment. I hope it's friendly. <laughs> Thank you. I accept it as a friendly amendment, and I'm happy to accept that um, amendment, Supervisor Mitchell. I want to bifurcate it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. If, if there's no other members that uh, want to be recognized, uh, then I would then I would ask that this item 11 is before us. It was. It is moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. 
Item 11 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Uh, item 12, as amended, is before us. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 12, as amended, is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries by the zero. Great. Uh, members, now we're going to move on to item number 18. This is uh, with respect to Senate Bill 98, protecting the press from law enforcement interference and harassment during constitutionally protected activities, which I held, and uh, after which I will recognize my co-author, Supervisor Kuehl. Um, first, I want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for joining me uh, in discussing this very important issue, and it basically deals with the First Amendment right, and we heard many callers today call in about this, so I also want to express my gratitude to those who shared in their public comments, their personal testimony, and their traumatic experiences with law enforcement while reporting on the many protests that we have had. Uh, the rights established in the First Amendment of our Constitution should always be upheld and protected to the highest degree, and that includes the right to protest and protecting the bridge between the freedom of press and the public's right to know. I believe that Senate Bill 98's original intent was to do just that, to address the many examples we've seen of members of the media and press being harassed and assaulted in the course of their duty by law enforcement officers. And one of the more high profile examples that comes to mind is what happened to Ms. Josie Huang from KPCC in September of 2020. Despite wearing a press uh, lanyard around her neck and repeatedly identifying herself as a member of the media while covering a protest, LA Sheriff deputies assaulted her and lied about the incident. LASD spokesperson said that Ms. Huang didn't have any identification, even claimed that Ms. Huang had said that she did not have proper press credentials on her. Fortunately, there was a video from her own phone and others to support that Ms. Huang's account was accurate and LASD's was misleading and false. Unfortunately, this motion, as the directive makes clear, is not, not one that supports this bill as it is currently written. Senate bill in its current form includes an amendment for press to enter into a closed area with authorization from a commanding officer on the scene, which creates an additional barrier uh, for the press. And I believe it provides a basis in which law enforcement can still engage in act actions that overstep or deny members of the press the ability to access information for the public's knowledge. A press release and a letter signed by 15 different media organizations, coalitions, unions, and associations have shared that their press members have witnessed many of their colleagues being assaulted, arrested, or detained by law enforcement. And these are tactics that can and have been used to silence the media, impeding their ability to report on what actually is happening on the ground and information that the public has the right to know. Fortunately, after sustained support from the press stakeholders and my filing of the motion to oppose the bill, the authors of the bill, Senators McGuire and Fortentino, issued a press release last Friday. That said, they heard the voices opposing the amendment to their bill and would therefore take action to remove that amendment so that it now reflects the original bill's intent. And as a result, I'll read in the following revisions to the preamble and directive of my motion to reflect last week's event. The preamble includes two new paragraphs at the end, which reads, with the outcry of media advocacy groups, coalitions, and unions, Senator McGuire and Portantino announced in a press release on Friday, June 4th, that they will fix the problem and amend the bill back to its original form. This welcome change shows their commitment to making the bill a strong measure that protects press freedom. This paragraph will include a footnote to Senator McGuire's press release that was posted on his website. We must continue to remain vigilant of attempts to minimize or or threaten our freedoms like those guaranteed in the First Amendment. The directive will now read, and I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Los Angeles County Sacramento advocates 
to support Senate Bill 98 only if amended to remove reference to with authorization from a commanding officer on scene from Section 1 of the California Penal Code 409.7, subsection A, sub, subsection 1. We must protect the very principle that members of the press and media should be protected from law enforcement misconduct when engaging in constitutionally protected activities, just like those who participate in protests and rallies. So I urge my colleagues to vote in support of the motion and direct our county Sacramento advocates to support the bill only if amended back to its original form. Thank you. And I'll now recognize my co-author, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much for bringing this motion and allowing me to co-author. Uh, as we all know, we live in a restive moment when many Americans who are concerned about longstanding injustices are taking their concerns to the streets to um, every place that they can to try to get justice. Information has been called the currency of democracy. And at historic moments like this, it's especially important that the press can gather information and provide the public with full and fair reports. Over the last year, there have been a number of disturbing instances, as we heard during public comment and as you spoke about, Madam Chair, in which law enforcement officers have prevented reporters from entering what they called closed areas during protests and demonstrations and severely limited their ability to do their job, in some cases assaulting them, arresting them, harassing them, um, and in every way keeping them from reporting uh, to us. Reporters have been uh, had their equipment confiscated as well. So Senate Bill uh, 98, which this motion supports if it's amended back to its original form, is important and timely legislation to ensure safe access for journalists. Uh, just to be clear, the amendment that was put in and that we're saying being told now is taken back out would have allowed a supervising commander on the site to say whether or not reporters would be allowed to have access, but also, I think, to supervise whether their equipment could be taken, et cetera. So um, I think it's important for us to support this in its original form. And um, I will be voting, of course, in favor and hope everyone will. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other members that wish to be recognized on this item? Okay, seeing none. Uh... Hearing no other comments, item 18, as amended, is before us. All moved, seconded by Supervisor Q to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 18, as amended, is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Q. Aye. Supervisor Q, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Salim, aye. Motion carries by to zero. Thank you, members. And now we'll move on to item number 21, countywide efforts to prevent drownings at public and private swimming pools, which I held and Supervisor Barger is serving as my co-author. So with that, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Barger for co-authoring the motion with me. And although swimming, as you know, is a really healthy and enjoyable activity, uh, one I know that many have missed participating in during the pandemic, tragedy can strike quickly and quietly if safeguards are not put in place. And according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, drowning is the leading cause of injury-related death for children age 1 through 4, and the second leading cause of those under the age of 14. In fact, California ranks third in the nation for the most drownings. And I believe that to avoid these tragedies, especially for children, preventing drowning is a very critical priority for LA County. Hundreds of children die from drowning annually, and for every child who drowns, another five receive emergency department care for non-fatal drowning injuries. These non-fatal drownings can result in severe, irreversible brain damage and long-term disabilities. And according to the California Department of Developmental Services, Treatment for these disabilities can cost roughly $30,000 per month and forever alters the course of a child's life. 
Fortunately, many steps can be taken to help prevent or reduce the number of drownings and near drownings events at public and private swimming pools, such as having an active supervision of pool users and teaching children how to swim at a very early age. Where present, lifeguards help reduce the risk of drownings and injuries at pools by supervising the activity of pool users and responding to swimmers in distress and administering first aid or CPR when necessary. Under state law, lifeguard services required at public pools where a direct fee is charged to use the pool. However, the county code does not require lifeguards at public pools utilized by children and non-swimmers, nor does it specify the number of lifeguards required at public pools. And at pools that do not provide lifeguard services, we can do more to keep our children safe. Each pool should also create and implement an aquatic safety plan that includes procedures for lifeguard staffing, training, and training in CPR and first aid. Unfortunately, while many drownings are preventable, some are not. When drownings or near drownings occur at public pools or swimming pools, swimming areas, the Department of Public Health should have the ability to promptly investigate to determine if any changes can be made to prevent future tragedy. While they are innocently participating in one of the summer's greatest pastimes, they must know that they are doing so safely. This motion helps ensure just that. And in closing, I want to thank the Meow Meow Foundation for their unwavering efforts to prevent drownings of children. They formed this organization after their daughter, Roxy, drowned while at camp, and you heard from them earlier. I know they will not stop until there are more protections in place for other children. Their efforts have inspired me, and I know they inspire so many others across the county of Los Angeles. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues for their support. So with that, um, I'd like to recognize Supervisor Barker. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to co-author this motion, and I want to thank you for co-authoring uh, number 13 uh, to pursue legislative action on these issues. I also want to thank the Meow Meow Foundation and Doug and Elena for uh, their tireless efforts um, to really make a difference in honor of Roxy, who tragically did drown um, while at day camp. Uh, their input and, and their passion has uh, allowed us to really focus on where we need to do a better job of ensuring that when parents send their children to camps, um, that they don't um, get that call that their child uh, drowned. Um, this could have been prevented. And I think that with the moves that we're making uh, on both legislatively as well as within the county, um, we will prevent another child, I hope, from having to go or a parent having to go through this and a child um, dying. So I again thank you, Supervisor Solis. Um, I think this is an important uh, action for this board to take and something that is going to truly make a difference. So thank you, Madam Chair. Great, um, thank you. Uh, I will now recognize Supervisor Hahn who wants to speak on the item. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to to you and Supervisor Barger for this motion. I really wanted to speak up on this. It's such um, it's such an important issue uh, to try and prevent these drownings, uh, both at our public schools and and people's private swimming pools. There is probably no tragedy greater than knowing um, that you could have prevented. Uh, your child from drowning, but didn't. Um, and we have that responsibility for all of our kids in uh, LA County. I know uh, it was one of my dad's big issues when he was county supervisor to build uh, more swimming pools in the second district. Uh, and it was also his initiative that he wanted to, to um, teach kids how to swim for free. It was very important to him that we taught kids how to swim for free because um, we do know that the uh, best antidote to drowning is learning how to swim. And uh, it was one of my early summer jobs uh, right out of um, uh, high school that I was employed as teaching swimming to kids who, uh, who were as young as six months old. Uh, and we do know uh, that, again, if we can teach kids how to swim, they're more likely uh, not to have a, a drowning accident. Um, he, again, wanted swimming to be free for all kids in L.A. County, uh, and then Supervisor Burke was instrumental 
in carrying that idea. Uh, the county was having a hard time paying for it, so uh, the Aquatic Foundation of Metropolitan Los Angeles uh, what had taken up that mantle to uh, help provide free swim lessons, particularly in, in uh, many of our underserved communities. And I'm really surprised. I was surprised when you when you said it, um, Supervisor Solis, that our county code does not require lifeguards, nor does it specify how many lifeguards we need at public pools. And I think it's the right time to develop a comprehensive countywide effort. Um, to prevent drowning and and create safe swimming opportunities. One of the things I wanted to bring up today, and I, I want to work with uh, the author and, and co-author on this, is to also include our our uh, families who have children with autism. Uh, in our LA Found effort in LA County, we've worked so closely with with parents um, uh, of children at any age who are on the autism spectrum. And we found that um, drowning is among the leading causes of death with individuals with autism who uh, elope or wander. So really wanna see if we can um, work together with some of these organizations and the autism community to get their input on how we, de we develop this anti-drowning um, initiative in LA County. And I want to make sure that we include one of the things I didn't see was our county parks and rec department. Let's make sure that they're also a part of this and our local cities who also, uh, you know, we're we're partnering with on the building of pools in, in some of our cities um, and, and the ongoing um, partnership with, with pools. And I want to make sure I know we're building a big aquatics uh, pool in Whittier and it was very exciting to hear. Uh, to, to hear Norma and Mark Pastrella talk about this new technology uh, that we have that will sound an alarm uh, if a, a child falls into the pool uh, for any reason. So hopefully that's part of now our uh, MO when we build pools that we, we all, always have this cutting edge technology associated with county uh, pools. So I, I'm hoping that uh, part of this report back, we can, again, we can see how we can work with the autism community. Um, also would love to hear a report back on our swimming uh, lessons in LA County at our, our, our county pools, how that's going. Um, do we need to ramp up the uh, funding piece of that? And uh, also report back on, uh, you know, making sure that any pools that the county builds uh, includes this new alarm anti-drowning technology. So just love to have that included in this report back. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Well, I'm sure we can uh, include some of those. And if not, I think we can work on another motion because this is really, I mean, I don't think it's going in the wrong direction. I think there are a lot of good points. And in fact, I know that in my district, uh, we uh, contract with one of our school districts to utilize the workmen a high school pool, and we actually use a uh, third party. We use the the Y uh, to provide training because we don't have sufficient support from our parks and rec to do that. So there's a, that's an ongoing discussion, but that's also a budget item. So I don't want to, you know, I, I do agree that we need to look at more, but I don't want to, you know, stop this from moving either. Um, so let's let's have our staff work on that, you know, with with the appropriate uh, departments. So. With that, I'd like to recognize Supervisor Holly Mitchell, who wants to be recognized. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. And I just want to say um, how I, I appreciate this uh, motion being brought forward. Glad to support it. And just as we talk about, you know, public public pools, um, and recognize that for some communities, you know, uh, for far too many years. Um, we weren't welcomed in public swimming spaces. We've had the conversations about Bruce Beach. And while the expansion of swimming pools, public schools in the second district was so important, I think the missing element was acknowledging that um, for too many and for too many years, black people weren't accepted, welcomed into public swimming spaces. You know, as a third generation Angelino, you know, I, my family tells stories 
of not feeling welcome in the Expo Park pool that was built for the 32 Olympics. And so as a result, we've got, you know, generations of people who were never learned to never learn to swim and didn't feel welcome in those public swimming spaces. So as we work collectively really hard to reduce childhood drownings, which are tragic, I think it's important that we acknowledge that cultural history and perhaps, you know, work even harder to make sure that everyone is welcome uh, in public swimming spaces and break that cycle um, of um, discrimination that has led to far too many deaths in drownings. Proud to support today's motion. Supervisor uh, Mitchell, you know, it, your story that you're telling is very much like what the Latino or Latinx community has experienced as well for decades. Um, and in fact, I think uh, a few years ago, I saw a report where uh, African American and Latino children were the ones that did not have appropriate uh, swimming uh, skills and training because of the lack of access to swimming pools overall and just the training factor. So hopefully we're going in that direction now with the with some of us helping to build out aquatic centers. I know Supervisor Han just mentioned hers and Whittier. I'm also exploring the possibility of having a, another pool site that's going to be run by, uh, by our school district as well as with the county. And that's an aquatic center uh, in uh, the Hacienda La Puente School District in the West Puente Valley area at Temple Elementary School. So I'm, I'm excited about all of this. So um, are there any other members that want to speak on this item. Okay. Having seen no other uh, comments than this item 21 is before us. I will move and it will be seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 21 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, now we'll move on to item number 26. This is a report on the financial status of the Sheriff's Department budget, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity um, to have a conversation about uh, this agenda item. I'd like to thank the CEO and the auditor controller for putting together these um, biannual budget status reviews and for working with the department to address its structural deficit. While the CEO and the department have made significant progress towards reducing the department's deficit, major challenges clearly remain. Getting a department to work within its budget is a very important element of the work we do as a board and of ensuring accountability and good governance. Budgeting, especially in a large and complex department, it clearly is not easy, I'm, I know that. And flexibility is sometimes necessary, especially when unexpected circumstances like COVID-19 arise. However, I think it makes it more imperative, not less, that departments work within the budgets they are given and manage their spending judiciously so that resources are available when they're needed the most. The CEO has the difficult task of ensuring the county fulfills its obligation of submitting a balanced budget to the state every year. As a result, it becomes problematic when a department consistently runs a deficit year after year due to overspending in many areas of their budget. So with that, I'd like to ask a few questions of the CEO in hopes of getting um, some clarity on my end, if that's possible. Uh, do we have uh, Nizia Davenport on? Yes, Supervisor, I'm here, Madam okay. Chair. Go right ahead. Then. Thank you very much. The department, thank you, Madam CEO. The department has about 46.1 million in what the report refers to as, quote, adjustable expenses for fiscal year 2021. So when county departments encounter unanticipated expenses during the year, what's the typical budget practice for authorizing spending for these kinds of unplanned expenses? 
Thank you, Supervisor, for asking that question. And before I start my answer, I'd like to echo something you said earlier. Uh, my office does work with the Auditor Controller and the Sheriff's Department to produce this biannual report. This is actually our, si our sixth report. Our fifth report was issued in December of 2020, and our seventh report will be uh, is scheduled to be issued in October of 2021. But on your specific question regarding to the, uh, the typical process, um, it's an ongoing process and it's often dynamic and it starts with notice to my office. So once the department is looking at their budgetary expenditures, uh, they are also required to do a, a, what we call a budget status report. Um, and once they are become aware that they will have uh, a departure from their approved budget in terms of increased or unplanned expenditures, they provide notice to my office specifically to the budget analyst that's assigned to work with that department. Once we receive the notice, uh, we will work with the department to get a better understanding of what the cause of those unplanned expenditures are, the purpose of the expenditures. And then we also like to do a little vetting uh, so that when they come in and tell us what the number, we like to um, just vet the number to see if it is as accurate as possible. After that, we will review with the department their budget, and essentially what we're looking for is to see if the expenditure can be absorbed in other area, by other areas of the budget. And we try to do that as quickly as possible. If we're not able to do that, or even if we are, and those efforts are not sufficient to cover the full amount of the budget over expenditure, then what we request is a detailed mitigation plan um, that requires the department to further mitigate as much as possible. So that is, that's the typical process that we would follow uh, once a department becomes aware that they are gonna have an over expenditure. And what are the consequences if a department overspends their budget that's already been approved by the board, whether it was due to unplanned circumstances like COVID-19, or, or otherwise, you know, are, are there consequences? What happens? Yeah, um, let me first start off by saying COVID-19, I think, presented some unique uh, circumstances. Yes. Um, your board recently approved uh, reimbursement for our departments that had uh, costs for disaster service workers. Setting aside uh, unique circumstances like a pandemic, uh, the consequences are a number of things. They fall into two general categories. Uh, the first category is budgetary, and then the second category are potential legal remedies that I'm going to ask uh, Rod Castro, our county counsel, to speak about. But on the issue of the budgetary remedies, uh, there are several. Uh, one is we can look at the hiring, and we could move to control the hiring. And so we can place a department uh, with you know, through the direction of the board on a hiring freeze. The other things that we can do is we can take a portion of their budget and put it in what we call a provisional financing uses account. Basically, that's basically a holding account. And what we would do is we would only return that money to the department's operational budget uh, upon a certain condition. So either we get a mitigation plan or they provide for us um, a detailed uh, um, a list detailing expenses showing that they are in fact in need of the return of that money at that point in the budget year. Some of the other things that we can do and we have done is we can uh, control, limit, or eliminate access to the county's uh, electronic personnel system because that allows you to move staff around in the department. It allows you to input uh, increases to salaries and things of that nature. And finally, one of the other things we can do is we can conduct a more detailed monitoring um, of, of a department's operations and or their expenditures. So those are some of the uh, budgetary and operational uh, consequences. And I'm gonna ask uh, Rod Castro to talk about some of the legal consequences, potential consequences. Thanks, Fizia. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, so there are the other potential consequences of both civil and criminal in nature. Generally, under the government code, a uh, department head, including the sheriff, can be held personally liable for any obligations incurred in excess of the amounts authorized uh, in the budget. 
Additionally, um, every willful omission to perform a duty enjoined by law on a, upon a, a public officer such as the sheriff uh, is punishable as a misdemeanor. So th those are the two uh, other potential consequences. That's very helpful. Um, thank you for that clarification. In, in, this, in this report, this most recent report, uh, I read that the sheriff's department is expected to exceed its $129 million budgeted overtime light item by an additional $54.7 million. That's you know almost half of their budgeted amount, a little under. I'm curious um, what happens when other county departments exceed their overtime budgets. Um, do, do they get to cover the difference with other with funds from other parts of their budget or, or how is that handled for other departments? Yes, thank you, Supervisor. So um, the answer to that question is, is generally yes. What we will try to do is work with that department uh, to cover the deficit and look in other areas of their budget. So we always want to start by looking within first before going to the county general fund. And so some of the areas that you could look at are, for example, salary savings. You know, a department might have X number of uh, funded positions on the books, but they're not filled. And so they are vacant and they uh, develop um, result in savings in that budget unit for the department. So one area that we could look at are salary savings. Uh, we could look at revenue uh, from other sources. Um, we can also look at their services and supplies budget. So each department has what we call a SNS budget, SNS standing for services and supplies. Oftentimes uh, they do not fully expend the budgeted amount. So there are other areas that we look to and we do uh, expect that a department in that situation would look within first to try to cover the deficit amount. And so given, I'm sorry, given just given the, the nature of the sheriff's department budget, do they have enough unfilled FTEs? Do they have resources within their own budget to cover? Uh, this this uh, overtime. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, in this particular year, supervisor, they they would not. Um, you might recall that I have spoken in in uh, other presentations. I've talked about this leaner baseline uh, that we have here in fiscal year 2021, and what I mean by that is when we took the curtailments in the current uh, fiscal year. Departments took roughly an 8% across the board cut. For the Sheriff's Department, that resulted in uh, about a $145 million cut in net county costs and about 1,392 uh, vacant positions. And so in a prior year, they may, there may have been vacant positions uh, that created salary savings, which we could use some of that um, to help offset uh, the deficit, but this year, not this year, uh, and a lot of that is due to the fact that we've reduced the budget already. And uh, last uh, question, Madam Chair, thank you so much for your indulgence. The department was given a loan um, to cover its fiscal year deficit in 1819 uh, with the agreement back then that it would be paid back over a four-year term. Um, the overall loan was over $63 million with an expectation that just under 16 million would be paid back per year. Um, when that um, deal was agreed to, was there a particular source of revenue identified to ensure that the loan could be paid back? Because I'm just curious, given the, the annual challenges with this department to come within budget, um, if, if it's um, realistic, if it's reasonable to assume that they'll be in a position to pay back um, uh, tens of millions of dollars over four years, given their ongoing overtime needs uh, and, and other over budgeting practices. 
Yeah, uh, so as you correctly pointed out, Supervisor, uh, the, the loan was $63.4 million, and the expectation was that it would be paid back at $15.9 million uh, over a four-year period. I think at the time, the thinking was that the deficit situation uh, would be um, not an ongoing issue uh, for the county and for the department, but would be something that could be right-sized and addressed in uh, probably a, a shorter amount of time. And so I think the thinking was at that time was at some point in the near future uh, that there would that the department would not be within a budget deficit situation and that um, repayment of the loan could be taken uh, from any savings that the department uh, might accrue in ongoing years. To the extent that that has not happened, uh, the loan has not been repaid, and essentially we would basically have to shift the four-year repayment period, essentially keep pushing it forward until such time as the department is not in a deficit situation and is able to repay those, to uh, re make those payments. Uh, Madam CEO, Madam Chair, thank you very much for the clarification. That was very helpful. Uh, now I'll recognize Supervisor Sheila Kuehl on this item. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, for uh, asking a number of questions, and thanks to our CEO for her clarity. I wanted to uh, say a few things as I understand them. Um, since the sheriff has refused to sign the report and outlined a number of uh, grievances to the board, uh, not uh, official grievances, but uh, differences that he has <clears throat> with the report. Uh, but I, as I understand it, uh, because of the severe economic impact of COVID in fiscal year 2021, all county departments experienced the curtailments, as we call them, because we don't want to cut them, call them cuts, um, of about 8% in NCC funding, which is our local county funding. Uh, the sheriff's department did reduce its budget, and um, about almost 1,400 unfilled vacant positions were eliminated, including some in custody, but no one was laid off and no one lost their job. Uh, the sheriff has been successful in decreasing his overtime expenses by 41% compared to the previous year. And um, that is a savings of, uh, of over $94 million. And this is good. It's uh, resulted in a smaller projected deficit. But nonetheless, there is still a deficit. Um, the sheriff says that he partially attributes his deficit to settlement agreement costs that continue to remain high as though they're not connected in any way to his department. But this should be addressed not by increasing funding. I mean, we pour out millions and millions every year in settlements because of the actions of the department. But it should be addressed by preventing situations that lead to those settlements in the fir first place, better training. Uh, changes needed to be made to reduce the settlement agreement costs and uh, prevent future deficits. Um, it is correct, as the sheriff indicates, that since October 1st of 2019, the board set aside $143.7 million annually into the APFU account. But this was done to ensure that the sheriff had sufficient funding to balance the budget because it was getting wildly out of control. And to be sure, the board has returned every single dollar back to the sheriff through each fiscal year. So I'm hopeful that the sheriff will continue to work with the CEO on fiscal challenges. Um, Supervisor Mitchell asked about the loan and the sheriff has indicated he doesn't think that he's supposed to pay it back uh, because again, he attributes the deficit to settlement agreements, uh, as, well, as well as COLAs for overtime and workers' comp. But that is, uh, doesn't need his agreement to pay because we're keeping it in the report and trying to keep it at the front of his mind. Um, he claims that he's losing, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? 
I, I just heard. Okay. Uh, just as a last ad, uh, piece that the sheriff claims he's losing uh, 143, over 143 million in new NCC revenue in the 21-22 budget because he's not getting Prop 172 money, trial court security money, um, money that was transferred to the Department of Health Service um, and to fire. And um, there, I think, will be answers from the CEO about that. But um, I think that it's not correct about the 172 money and the state trial court security funding money. So I will look forward to the answer on that because it looks like um, the uh, CEO and the board gave the sheriff um, 114 million and another 15 of NCC because the revenue would be short in 172 and trial court security. And then in recommended budget, we took it back because the revenue had been restored with Prop 172 and trial court security money. So it sounds like the sheriff wants to double dip and keep both the revenue that actually came in and the NCC that we gave them because there was an expectation that the revenue wouldn't come in. So it's not really a loss. It's actually been met by the appropriate revenue. Uh, there was also some complaint about sending NCC funding to uh, health services for JHIS because uh, when the integration of JHIS into the ORCID system was approved, it was pretty clear the cost would be billed to the sheriff and any savings would be returned to the sheriff. Uh, but uh, uh, he, he believes that the ongoing reduction counters the agreement. So um, that's a little tortured, I think, in its thinking. So there are a number of places, I think, about uh, Measure J impacting his budget, which is not supportable at the moment. And besides, the voters said they wanted Measure J not all law enforcement, but other ways to approach things. And um, the bottom line is that his spending authority has not changed. All the county departments had curtailments. Few curtailments have been restored. And so I think that when we see the bigger picture, uh, it refutes quite a few claims made uh, in the sheriff's letter. And I uh, assume the CEO is going to um, respond, and um, this will be an ongoing discussion. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator, uh, <laughs> Supervisor Mitchell, for holding the item so we could have a bit of a discussion about it. And thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Kuehl, I believe you. Supervisor Barger wants to be recognized on this matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and actually, Supervisor Kuehl touched on a little enthusiasm. I just want to understand are there areas in the sheriff's budget where the state is not contributing enough and is creating a deficit? Um, Supervisor Kuehl mentioned the trial court funding. Um, I know that that's been an issue where the sheriff has brought up the fact that he cannot cut back on the uh, sheriffs in the courts, but yet um, is not getting reimbursed. Can you touch on that, please? Yes, thank you, Supervisor uh, Barger. <clears throat> so I think that there are two areas involving the state uh, where the sheriff's department is not being fully funded. One is trial court security operations, which I'll expand on in a minute. And then the other is uh, something we talk about in this report, uh, which is the cost of housing justice involved individuals who are awaiting transfer to the State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. So on the issue of the funding for uh, security operations, um, this is funding that's provided by the state uh, for trial court security, and we know that for a number of years it has not been sufficient to fully cover the sheriff's direct costs. Um, and this is not something specific to LA County. This is a, this is an issue that's faced by many other counties as well. Our previous analysis uh, in the county indicates that the state funding gap for uh, direct services costs is approximately $16 million. And then if you include what we call the indirect cost supervision and overhead, things like that, uh, that amount, and those are considered unallowable, unallowable indirect cost expenses under the MOU with the court, that $16 million can uh, range uh, from 37 million all the way up to 70 million 
just depending on which categories you include and exclude from the definition of administrative costs and overhead. Um, so we know that it's an ongoing uh, issue. We have uh, attempted to, uh, on several occasions, to address that issue at the state level uh, to try to right size uh, that funding um, level, but to no avail, we have been unsuccessful up to this point. The second issue that I raised uh, was the transfer of justice involved individuals that are housed in our county jails that are awaiting transfer to the state. Um, we know that as a result of the pandemic, uh, the state um, uh, temporarily stopped accepting transfers of individuals. And what that meant was that those individuals are sitting in our county jails. We estimate that for fiscal year 2021, that there is a funding gap from the state of about $33.5 million. And that funding gap is based on the amount of funding that we receive from the state based in, in uh, the difference between that amount and the amount that the auditor controller has determined that we should be receiving from the state. So at the end of the day, the state reimbursement rate, it doesn't fully cover uh, the actual costs. So those are two areas, Supervisor, um, as you mentioned, where there is state involvement in terms of funding, where we, are, we do not believe that the department has been fully funded for its costs. Thank you. Thank you, PZ. You know, I, I just have to, to weigh in a little bit on um, uh, the whole issue of the sheriff's budget. The issue as it relates to deficit it extends long before Sheriff Villanueva came into office. This is something that under Sherm Block, under Lee Baca, um, the, you know, this has been a continuing issue in terms of a structural deficit. And, and I want to acknowledge the fact that on the overtime, um, the sheriff has brought down the cost of overtime and and setting aside the, the loan, um, I believe with the additional revenues, we should be able to ad uh, address the, the deficit of 5.4 and he will come in um, at budget. And so, I, you know, I have to acknowledge that component, especially given the fact that um, up in my district, we've got the Ill illegal cannabis grows um, growing at a rate that far exceeds what quite frankly, the sheriff is able to do, I mean, each day he could go out and, and probably uh, close down 40 and there'd be 20 more that would open the next day. So this has been a, a real effort on his part to bring in additional resources to combat this. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that because that's something that's not budgeted, but yet he is making, making every effort to bring together all agencies to combat this up in the Antelope Valley, um, and it's impacting um, water. Um, it's impacting, you know, uh, uh, people coming uh, up there that are that are literally being used um, to 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 work at these places that are, that are not able to leave. So we've got we've got some criminal element up there. So I just want to acknowledge that in the sheriff's um, uh, as it relates to the sheriff's budget in terms of the things he's doing above and beyond what we see on line items, things that take place each and every day. And I know um, that. I support um, providing funding to ensure that we provide public safety at a level that, at least in the fifth district, my constituents expect and deserve. Um, so I appreciate your report, Pizia. Um, I think we have work to do um, to collaborate. There's no question that transparency has got to go both ways. And I hope the sheriff will continue to work with us um, because, uh, you know, it, it's a lot easier to work with us because by, by, not providing us with all the facts, um, he's not going to be able to hire uh, additional sheriff's deputies with his academy, which I know is a priority for him, um, and to, to backfill on those that are retiring out. So I hope that we can work together, and I do appreciate the work that you've done on this, Fizia, and your staff as well, and as well as our auditor controller. Thank you. Great. Um, next, I'll recognize Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you for this report, uh, Fesia. Uh, and and you're right, um, Supervisor Barger. Yeah, this has been an ongoing problem. Uh, I remember there was even an attempt um, a couple of years ago to talk about the true cost of uh, operating the sheriff's department and whether or not 
even our budget was started off being um, a little um, out of whack for, for lack of a better word. And maybe we should work more to look at the true cost of running that department. But um, I will say, I feel like uh, we are making progress, TCL, with the Sheriff's Department. Um, you know, last year, the uh, deficit was 30, almost 35 million. The year before, it was almost 64 million. And so the adjusted net is just 5 uh, million this year. I know it's higher than that, uh, but with the adjusted net deficit, meaning um, it is higher, but we've adjusted it to reflect the um, unavoidable extra cost. Uh, that uh, the CEO basically forgives uh, the department. Um, I will say that um, it looks like a lot of the cost uh, savings have been in the reduction of overtime, which I think we've all been pushing for. And I was going to ask you, Fizia, do you feel like uh, the department can maintain this progress with, with bringing overtime down, or were they only able to accomplish that in the year of the pandemic? Uh, Supervisor, that's a great question. Um, and I am, I'm not unmindful of the comments about work, continuing to work with the department. Um, we have not had a clear understanding or a clear uh, communication from the department as to exactly um, how they were able to bring down the overtime. Um, we know that they, uh, as mentioned in my report, um, that they have shifted staff around to work uh, different shifts that did not require overtime. But in terms of the specifics that would allow us to do an analysis to identify whether something is an anomaly or a trend and whether we would be able to expect this to continue in the future, we just don't have that uh, that insight um, into the department. Um, and, and so, and I uh, just like to add, Supervisor, on the idea of um, kind of knowing, you know, what the appropriate budgeted amount is, coming out of a conversation with the board from a couple of years ago, the auditor controller is uh, does have a consultant on board uh, who is tasked with, among other things, um, looking at the staffing models uh, and the the appropriate staffing amount for the sheriff, as well as uh, revenue and losses and other budgetary details. Okay, thanks. And I also, uh, one of my uh, questions, which you've already touched on, has, has been uh, what role uh, the state's decision to stop transferring uh, to state prisons has had on the financial strain on, on the sheriff's budget. And, and yeah, when you look at that, that new um, population dashboard uh, for, for our jails that was just published last month, uh, we'll see. You can see that more than 3,500 people are awaiting transfer out of our jails. And, um, you know, that significantly impedes the progress that we were making to try to reduce our jail population. Uh, so you've already talked about that, about the status of these transfers and that budget gap. Um, do you feel like there's a, a good pathway to, to advocating for an increased reimbursement? Uh, for the state to actually cover the cost? Uh, so, Supervisor, we already did. Uh, so, our calculation, I believe that the state uh, is paying at the rate of about $163 per month. Uh, I'm sorry, paying at the rate of about $94 per month. Um, our auditor controller has uh, assessed that the amount is probably closer to $163. Uh, I'm sorry, $163 per day and $94 per day. And we raised that issue in February during our uh, sacramental trip um, just to make sure that it was on the state's uh, radar screen and that they understood that it was a priority for us. But we haven't seen any movement uh, coming out of that uh, uh, since that time. We did also provide them with the backup data in the detail as well. Right. Well, I, I, I mean, I suggest we just we, we keep we keep that pressure on a little bit there. Um, and the last thing I was going to say, I know that the sheriff has. Um, wanted the $143 million back uh, into his budget from uh, the PFU and just wanted to restate for for us uh, the history behind this money being placed in a PFU, maybe for the listeners at home who 
um, you know, kind of sometimes hear one side and they hear the sheriff saying that money ought to go back into his budget. Um, can you explain a little bit how we got there and and w at what point uh, do you think we should stop putting that 143 million in a PFU? Yes, absolutely. The 143.7 million, I think, was uh, from the motion in 2019. Uh, and I think the idea behind that was twofold. One was to uh, help control expenses, and two was to secure from the department a detailed budget mitigation plan. The reason why I say detailed budget mitigation plan is that the CEO's office had been and continues to be in communication uh, with the department on a, on a fairly regular and consistent basis regarding the budget. And we know that the department uh, has previously identified uh, uh, focus areas that they will focus on in terms of trying to reduce the budget. The, in 2019, I think that the thought was, including the thought of the CEO's plans office, was that we wanted a holistic and a comprehensive plan that did more than identify focus areas, but that also identified uh, target dates and you know the potential reduction amounts. So the idea was to take some of that money, set it aside in a uh, holding pot until uh, we received the detailed budget plan, but also to be able to transfer money back to the department as expenses occurred. And so, um, and maybe I should explain that the 140, uh, $143.7 million, when it is taken out of the sheriff's budget at the beginning of the budget year, it does not remain in that holding pot uh, for the entire year. What happens is the department will periodically provide to us documentation of expenditures, and we will transfer funds back to the department slowly over time throughout the year. And then to answer the last part of your question, uh, you know, when will it be appropriate um, to stop uh, taking that money and putting it in a holding a pot? I would suggest uh, when the initial goals are met, uh, when we um, get either to a, a, a right size budget and or a detailed mitigation plan, which was the, you know, one of the driving forces, I think, behind uh, moving in that in that direction in the first place. Okay, thank you for for that clarification. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question to uh, to our CEO. That you kind of went over how we got here in terms of setting up the PFU, and that was under uh, Sachi Hamai, and we we tried to get information back and and a good payment plan. And since uh, that time, I think it's it, it hasn't been the best of of uh, situation for us and i and i do agree with you that we probably should continue to monitor and keep the re, keep the remaining amount in that pfu and make sure that there is enforcement around a repayment plan and to keep firm on that um, because we do that with all the other departments this this shouldn't be any different um, and i wanted to ask you has the sheriff's department made any payments on that 60 60 million easier Yes, thank you for that, Madam Chair. So we have not received uh, payments uh, on that amount, on the 63.4 million. I think the idea at the time was that once the budget was under control and right size, that there would be a certain amount of savings from or underspend from which the department would be able to take, you know, 15.9 million a year to be transferred back to the county general fund. To the extent that that has not happened, there has not been a repayment um, of any of the, that amount. Right. And then just lastly, are you aware of any sheriff contracts that might not be renewed in this next fiscal year? Supervisor, uh, over and above, um, and I'm not sure if we have resolved the contract with the uh, community college district. Um, I know that there were uh, some report backs uh, from uh, to the board uh, where DHS was looking at uh, the security in their uh, hospitals. I'm not sure if that report has been submitted. Uh, but besides those two areas, um, I know that there are also um, uh, certain concerns that have been raised by uh, some of the contract cities. 
Right. Over and above that, I'm not aware of any other uh, potential uh, cancellations for contracted services. And those are definitely things I know that many of us have been reading in the press and have been made aware of by the different uh, agencies that have also notified us. So I think it is somewhat troubling and we really have to keep our eye on this because um, we, we can try to control those expenses the best we can, uh, even if the department doesn't want to move in that direction. So I, I thank you. I know uh, Supervisor Mitchell has one last question, I believe, or a comment. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And just as, as I listen to the CEO uh, talk about and really address a, a very fair question, a fair issue around, um, you know, are we getting our fair share from the state? And to hear the discrepancy in the agreed upon amount, the 90 some dollars per day versus what we now know our actual costs. Uh, I was in the state chair of the Senate Budget Committee um, when we made that decision. And, and frankly, just, just to put it in context, we were, you know, the CDCR, several CDCR facilities had overwhelming positive COVID cases. So it was not in the best interest of public health or the best interest of LA County jail inmates to transfer them into those facilities that at that time until COVID um, spread could really be checked and people could be safely transferred in. So that, that was the rationale for the halt. But help me understand how we got such a huge discrepancy. As I recall, I thought CSAC was involved in identifying the amount that the uh, state would pay to counties um, is it that every county has kind of a different cost per inmate? How did we get so far apart from our actual cost from what the, the agreed upon rate was, you know, a full budget year ago? Thank you, Supervisor. Um, so I'm, I'll start off by saying I will have to get back to the board on specifics because I wasn't part of that um, part of that negotiation. Yes. I do suspect, however, that one main driver is the cost of our salary and employee benefits, um, and because that drives a lot of the cost, not only in the sheriff's department but in any department. I will circle back with uh, my team, my budget folks, and our folks in legislative affairs. Uh, to see what input uh, the county had in terms of setting uh, an acceptable rate and mm -hmm. uh, for the county of Los Angeles, aside from uh, whatever was proposed and agreed upon by CSAC. I, I just think that's important for us to have. So when we go back and ask to be made whole, you know, just so we can really make that ask, you know, in context, because, you know, I agree, we really should do all that we can to get um, our actual costs met. And just lastly, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for allowing me to hold this item. It was very helpful for me to get the questions answered. And, and ironically, just since we began this discussion, my office has received several calls, um, as people apparently are listening and understanding the budgeted process as well, um, asking questions. Some of my constituents who live in communities where the sheriff had proposed to close substations because you know, of his claims that it was out of his control, it was just the budget. But then they watch in the news last night and see that he's proposing to expand sheriff patrols into um, LAPD jurisdiction. So, you know, folks are calling to say, well, why would you close a substation that's your responsibility because of the budget, yet you have resources to expand uh, sheriff patrol into areas that are covered by another municip a municipality and another law enforcement entity. So I think this conversation was not only helpful to me, but to allow the general public to you know, begin to understand this process um, um, uh, accurately and correctly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, this is the CEO. If I could just uh, add one final comment, and I just wanted to um, clarify uh, something that was uh, stated e earlier. And this question has come to the CEO's office in other contexts, and it's, it's you know, what does the CEO's office do when a department runs a deficit? Um, I think it is uh, probably more accurate to say uh, we, we know that no county department can exist separate and apart from the county as a larger entity. And so if a county department is sued, if they have over expenditures, you know, first and foremost, we're going to work with that department to to look within to try to reduce uh, and mitigate that over expenditure. 
But at the end of the day, it ultimately becomes a county responsibility. It all comes back to the general fund. And so I would not say that the CEO's office forgives a debt um, of a department. What I would say is that we have to um, basically to uphold our fiscal responsibility to make sure that the county overall comes in with a balanced budget. And that includes sometimes uh, accounting for and adjusting for uh, deficits that may be run by a department. Uh, but it's probably not uh, most accurate to say that there is a, a forgiveness of it. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Seeing no further uh, questions, uh, thank you for the report uh, to our CEO and to all the questions that were raised. And uh, I think this is an ongoing discussion that we're gonna continue to have throughout the remainder of the year. So this report is a received and filed and hearing no objections, that will be the order. We will now move on to item number 68. This is a report on the expansion of the first responder protocol and advocacy services for commercially sexually exploited children, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity again to um, be able to uh, uh, ask a couple of questions. I'm hoping that representatives from um, DCFS um, and the ILT are, are on with us, the integrated leadership team. Um, uh, I wanna thank them for the report, um, as well as all the staff and advocates who've devoted their time to combating sexual exploitation of children in LA County. I asked to hold today's report back because I think it's important that we continue to bring awareness to this topic and acknowledge the progress and more importantly, highlight areas for continued progress for this population. I was proud to work with uh, the county in carrying a rather controversial bill when I was in the state leg legislature, SB 1322, which helped to really eliminate the criminalization of youth um, who were exploited, who were victims of child exploitation, you know, acknowledging that a no such thing as a child prostitute. And, and so we had to treat them as the victims that they are. So I was pleased to learn about the victim witness testimony protocol and it's important to note that testifying against an exploiter can be one of the most dangerous things these young victims are asked to do. So I have a quick question of the um, ILT, if possible. Yes, right. this is Michelle Guyman with Los Angeles County Probation Department. Um, I'll take that question. Thank you. You bet. And 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 I, I I may have gotten ahead of myself. I thought a report was going to be given by the ILT initially. So if that's what you were going to planning to do, why don't you give the report and then I can ask you the question? Should we do it that okay. way? Is that helpful? Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Great. Okay. So um, thank you and good afternoon um, to the members of the board. Again, I'm Michelle Diamond with Los Angeles County Probation Department. And I'm joined this afternoon with members of the county's CSEC integrated leadership team, Ever Reyna with the Department of Children and Family Services and Lieutenant Dan Stanley with the Sheriff's Department. Um, and again, I, I too wanna, uh, before we start the presentation, um, acknowledge the board for your ongoing leadership and support of our efforts um, to ensure that the county provides the needed services and support to our youth who have been impacted by commercial sexual exploitation. We've been at this for over 10 years now, and I really appreciate your unwavering support. I'd also like to um, thank and welcome uh, Supervisor Mitchell to the board, and thank you again for all your advocacy work at the state level around the issue of human trafficking. Um, in the report, we'll provide some brief remarks on advocacy services, the Safe Youth Zone Initiative, Victim Witness Testimony Protocol and our Law Enforcement First Responder Protocol to include expansion efforts. So quickly regarding the advocacy services, um, as you know, the county began providing advocacy services for our commercially sexually exploited youth back in 2012 through a probation contract with Saving Innocence. And over the past seven years under that contract, Saving Innocence provided services and support 
for approximately 950 probation and DCFS youth um, identified as victims of trafficking. In September of 2019, the Department of Children and Family Services, through a request for proposal, awarded advocacy contracts to Saving Innocence and Zoe International to increase capacity and expand services to those who are not only victims of commercial sexual exploitation, but also to those who are at risk of CSEC. In addition to this contract, it also expanded services to non-minor dependents, so youth between the ages of 18 and 21, and parents through a parent advocate employed by the advocacy agencies. Since the start of those new contracts uh, through May of this year, there have been approximately, approximately 385 advocacy referrals made, and the youth feedback on advocacy services continue to be very positive regarding those services and the support they're receiving. Regarding the safe youth zone, back on November or back on June 9th of 2020, the Board of Supervisors passed a motion authored by Supervisor Hahn and then former Supervisor Ridley Thomas directing the County of Los Angeles ILT to engage with various county and community partners to uh, develop a plan to expand the safe youth zone and also develop a training strategy for implementation. Since the board motion, the safe youth zone work group has been meeting month meeting on a monthly basis and has focused uh, those meetings to meet those deliverables. Phase one rollout of the safe youth zone is expected for September of this year with the Department of Health Services, Public Health, the Department of Mental Health, and the first responder protocols to partners to include law enforcement, DCFS, and probation. Then we, we will begin our second phase of outreach to include fire departments, schools, and other county and community partner agencies. And then <clears throat> regarding the victim witness testimony, we know that children and youth who have been commercially sexually exploited are often called upon to testify in court to aid in the criminal prosecution of their exploiters. Generally, the experience of appearing and testifying in court can be stressful and traumatic and even a dangerous time for them. Victims are highly likely to be fearful of violent retribution against themselves or their families and friends for testifying. Additionally, victims must publicly recount difficult and painful events face-to-face -face with their exploiters and a room full of other adults and strangers. Victim witness testimony can also be difficult for caregivers and family members of the victim. The court testimony may also be the first time that families, caregivers, and caregivers hear the often graphic and disturbing details of the physical, psychological, and sexual abuse the youth has experienced during their exploitation. To decrease the risk of re-traumatization and harm to youth who have, asked to, who have been asked to testify in criminal proceedings, the Los Angeles, Los Angeles County convened a multi-agency work group in early 2015 to develop the witness victim witness testimony protocol and work group. This multi-agency work group includes probation, DCFS, Department of Mental Health, the District Attorney's Office, Youth's Attorneys, both Delinquency and Dependency, the Star Court, Law Enforcement Specialized Advocacy Agencies, and the National Center for Youth Law, who has authored the protocol and continues to provide technical assistance and support. This protocol has been a long time coming and I'm excited to announce that we finally launched the pilot phase of the protocol this, this past May, so just a month ago, which will ensure that our youth get the services and support they need pre-testimony, day of testimony, and post-testimony. Having this protocol in place will be such a benefit to the youth and I'm thankful to all the agencies and our community advocacy partners who have stayed committed throughout the process to get us here today. Over the next nine, six to nine months, we will closely monitor the protocol elements as youth are subpoenaed to testify. Continue to meet regularly as a team to identify any gaps, challenges, successes, and lessons learned from implementing the pilot and then brainstorm solutions. Once the pilot is completed, National Center for Youth Law will make any necessary updates with the county and finalize the protocol that will assist in preparing an operational agreement for all parties involved. And lastly, just a few remarks, and I'll turn it over to Everina for some final remarks on the report, and then we'll take questions, is the law enforcement first responder protocol. You'll see in the report that as of May 5th, 2021, 
we have had a total of 1013 recoveries within the first responder protocol partner agencies, which include the sheriff's department, LAPD, Long Beach PD and Pomona PD. Since May 5th, uh, the time of that report, we have had an additional 13 youth recovered. So, unfortunately, we are still seeing a steady number of our youth being exploited on the streets through internet ads out of motels and hotels, etc. However, on a positive note, our multi agency response remains strong and the youth who are being recovered are being provided with immediate support and services through the system or advocacy agencies, as well as the Department of Health Services. And as you know, we've been working diligently on expanding the first responder protocol to the over 40 independent police departments throughout the county. So I'll now turn it over to Everena from the Department of Children and Family Services to, to discuss our expansion efforts. Um, Eva. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, DCFS was thanking the board and specifically uh, Supervisor Mitchell for holding this item as it gives us an opportunity to continue to highlight the tremendous work that the Probation Department, ALSB, and DCFS are doing to continue to expand these efforts. Um, we are very happy to report that um, effective, uh, last night we activated the implementation of Hathorne and P, um, PD, as well as Inglewood PD. We were, um, to be honest with you, we've been working on this for a while, and it kind of happened kind of quick, so we had to get our ducks in a row to um, make it a go, and it is um, now in full force and effect. We are very excited about that. The reason why Inglewood and Catherine were selected is because uh, Michelle does a great job of keeping track of all the calls that are made, whether they come to um, through the FRP uh, process or not, and we knew that Inglewood was a hot bed for this um, particular yeah. action, and we yeah. are um, we were going to be ready for um, full implementation, and the relationships will be stronger by the time the Super Bowl comes. So um, she informed me, Michelle informed me that in 2020, we had 22 calls and we had eight from Hathorne PD. So we are ready to go. And we thank you. Um, it, the entire board has been uh, demonstrating extremely um, uh, necessary commitment that we need to keep going. And as she said, we have 38 other independent stations to go, but little by little, we will uh, continue to make progress in this very important cause. I will take any questions that you may have for DCFS at this point. Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate Madam Chair, you allowing um, me to hold this item. Um, and I was going to ask DCFS about the expansion into Hawthorne and Inglewood. So thank you very much. That report uh, answered my questions and you're right, getting Inglewood up and operational before the Super Bowl, um, given what we've seen nationally with those national sporting events due to communities with regard to sexually exploited um, minors is, is really important. I appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if um, Michelle, if, if you think it um, would be appropriate or even necessary that for the next time um, the ILT update is available, that the district attorney's office would weigh in because I'm really wanting to make sure that we are we have all the resources necessary and that they're being used to make CSEG victims' testimony and their experience as safe as we possibly can, knowing that that is a large hill to climb. Uh, and just want to make sure that we've allocated the resources to the right departments at the right level. And so does that make sense for you to include the DA? for the next report? Yes, exactly. And, and that was one of the things that I wanted to offer is that we do a little bit of a deeper dive into what resources and supports um, that we can work with through the DA's office. I know that in speaking with our representative this morning um, and also with some of our representative from the public defender's office, you know, the, uh, it's closed circuit testimony, as you probably remember at the state mm -hmm. level, there was law mm -hmm. that was passed but it only allowed for uh, victims under the age of 15. Right. And we found over the past couple of years is our average age of youth who testifies is 16 and 17. And so even though we have those sprinklings of kids that are 13, 14, and 15, 
um, which we you know need to kind of look at that. And from what I understand, that there's a case that we're we're going to be using that actually on a on a person under the age under the age of 15 that that we may need to try to figure out some legislation that really supports all youth who are victims of trafficking, no matter what their age is, because it's still a really tough and scary time for our kids and sometimes can be very unstabilizing for them when they've been stable prior to that subpoena. I completely agree. And when that bill came through, I recall getting pushback. I think the original vision was a, a higher age and we got serious pushback. So perhaps with um, uh, our new DA here in LA County, it's something that we can perhaps look for an author and attempt to um, amend uh, that current statute. I would be happy to you know, work uh, collaboratively with your office to see if we can make that happen. With that, I don't have any more questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, that's all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have one uh, comment. I'm glad you raised this issue today uh, for us, um, Supervisor Mitchell, and that we had the departments weigh in. Um, I, I just have a concern regarding places in my district like Pomona, which we know continue to experience high rates of child children uh, being trafficked and just wanting to make sure that we continue to to not lose sight of that as well. And, and I was glad that we're that we are partnering with agencies like Saving Innocence, which uh, truly understand how to meet the needs of, of these young people. But I am concerned, however, that 200,000 in funding was taken from the housing allocation and allocated to advocacy services. And I understand that this was a stopgap measure, but I hope to see that the housing allocation is fully replenished so that we can address the housing needs of these young people in this situation as well. So I did want to I did want to state that for the record. Um, and with that, uh, if there are no other questions from members, this is a uh, received and filed uh, and hearing no objections uh, that will be the order. Thank you very much. And now moving on um, to item number 81E, the County Acquisition of Low-Income Residential Tenant Rental Debt. Uh, I held that I item, so uh, I would like to begin. And uh, this is um, this is one of the one of the I think issues uh, for us of the day that the county residents, many of them, especially low-income and vulnerable county residents, have been struggling with to pay their rent. As you know, for the for the past year and a half. We heard from many uh, witnesses today that called in to talk about some of the hardships that they've been facing, uh, particularly uh, families and individuals who uh, are trying to stay housed uh, during this uh, pandemic. So for some time, you know, the board has contended with the impacts of the current housing crisis that has been made much worse by the economic fallout and the fact that so many people lost their jobs or they were unemployed or underemployed. And uh, through the county and through ELECTA, and in partnership with the city of Los Angeles, um, I know many are aware that we've administered roughly a quarter of a billion dollars in rental relief funds throughout the region to target and help the most vulnerable families stay housed. Uh, additionally, I know that the state has launched and continues to deploy rental assistance through the California COVID-19 Rental Relief Program. Uh, and there's hopefully future changes to come. It is my hope that the reach of the program is enhanced so that it can really serve our highest need rental households who are facing economic hardship and housing instability due to the pandemic. Although there's been significant progress made, uh, it has been slow uh, during the pandemic. And there are many households that have been left in financial despair with high levels of rental debt. And according to some estimates, Tenants in LA County owe nearly a billion dollars in rent debt. And rent debt is only half the story. Many tenants have been paying their rent, and I've heard stories time and time again from our own staff, of racking up debt with payday lenders and using their credit cards or their savings or their retirement funds. And unless we resolve the debt and help tenants get back on their feet, the same communities that, are, that have been the hardest hit by the pandemic will be held back by debt for years to come and we will see more families spiraling into homelessness. And that's why I brought this motion forward, because we urgently need to come up 
with an out of the box, in my opinion, a strategy with it comes up with solutions to stretch the federal rental assistant funding as far as possible and help us resolve the rent debt and provide a forward looking assistance to advance racial injustice and equity while helping those who need it the most. I've advocated at the state level and met with state leadership to share my concerns and with the rollout of the state's current rent relief programs that are leaving so many tenants behind by making the programs too narrow in scope and difficult to access. That's what I heard repeatedly from many of my community residents, and I'm sure some of you have been called by those same advocates. This entire year, tenants have urged us to use our governmental powers to find solutions to resolve COVID-19 rent debt and to strengthen tenant protections to prevent low-income working families from being evicted from their homes. We are less than 30 days away from the current eviction moratorium expiring, and these cries for help will no longer go unheard. Los Angeles County, I, I believe, can lead the way and set a precedent for the rest of the state on how to fare for its residents and prevent further displacement, homelessness, and onerous long-term debt. So the motion I'm introducing today is our first step in that direction as we explore the feasibility of the county acquiring low-income residential rent debt. And with this motion, I'm committed to working alongside with our tenants, our advocates, and small landlords especially to find solutions to address the rent debt caused by COVID-19. So I urge my colleagues to please join me in supporting our tenants and enacting collaborative solutions to ensure all options are on the table to help our vulnerable communities fully recover. So you all know we're in these unprecedented times, so we do need to be innovative and come out with, I hope, bold solutions that are needed now more than ever. So I thank you and I ask for your I vote. Um, with that, I'll recognize Supervisor Mitchell. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much for this important and timely motion and really conversation. Uh, I appreciate you emphasizing bold, out-of-the-box thinking, because I think we have not only a responsibility, but an opportunity, given the resources uh, coming from the federal government, the level of reserve at the state government, for us really to um, think deeply about how we can roll out poverty, disruptive policies um, here at the county level, recognizing that so many communities that were disproportionately impacted by COVID are communities that have struggled um, far, far, you know, years before this current public health economic pandemic. And we know um, the, the fragility of housing in far too many of our communities. A couple of weeks ago, um, I hosted a virtual community budget town hall, was really pleasantly surprised and thrilled at the number of people who participated. Um, and the one item that the participants prioritized, of course, was um, how we deal at the county level with our unhoused family, friends, and neighbors, um, as well as the issue of housing, you know, recognizing the impact the last housing crisis had on the residents of the second district. Many homeowners who lost their property, who many mom and pop homeowners who lost their property, recognizing that those are the properties that offer still the most affordable rent. And so I'm clear that my constituents are looking for help, a resolution to really help both populations. I think uh, those who participated in the budget town hall, as well as others I connect with on a regular basis, share my fear of what will happen once all of the eviction moratoriums are lifted uh, at every level of government. Um, you know, once the governor lifts the executive order and the clock starts ticking on the repayment, People are afraid. We know here in LA County, we've not re, we have not regained half of the jobs that were lost, many of which were permanent job losses as a result of the economic pandemic we've experienced. Um, we know that in LA, you need to earn almost $40 an hour, two and a half times our minimum wage to afford the average monthly asking rent. That's to afford the average monthly asking rent. So, you know, I think our county departments, DCBA and, and LACDA did a great job at administering and man managing the first round of CARES Act rent relief dollars. Um, again, agree with you, Madam Chair, that the state's program was perceived as, you know, awfully bureaucratic and paperwork laden. 
And so whatever we can do, I look forward to this report back to really think outside of the box, you know, much like our innovative thinking around a, another poverty disruptive policy, um, the guaranteed basic income. This is our time and our opportunity to push the envelope, um, to use these public resources for true public good. And so I thank you for bringing forward this uh, motion and I will be proud to support it today. Very much, Supervisor Mitchell. Now I'll recognize Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I support this uh, motion, uh, though I'm not clear yet whether I would be fully supportive of debt acquisition. You'll want to be clear just for me. Uh, but I really welcome getting the information uh, across the board that you've laid out in the motion. Uh, you, as you know, because you've co-authored or authored much of it, the board has taken pretty significant steps over the last 13, 14 months through our eviction moratorium and stay housed LA to try to make sure that our tenants who are impacted by COVID, and that's everybody, don't fall into homelessness. But it's uh, been the rents even before the pandemic that have been the driver for much of our homeless population. Um, and interestingly enough, despite the hardships of COVID, most renters have continued to pay some or all of their rent during this difficult time. Uh, the rental assistance programs have helped a little bit to address the rental debt, but we know that everybody who owes this back rent is going to have a really hard time catching up. So uh, this motion directs the departments to get truly essential information about the amount of debt and prospective rent still owed, which uh, in addition to looking at whether or not public funds should be utilized to pay off that debt, also will give us a lot of good information to guide our future tenant protection policies and programs, which I hope we will continue to do uh, even as everything opens up again. Uh, because we need, as you both said, to explore all solutions to supporting both tenants and property owners who are behind on rent and revenue. Um, I would like to know, and I don't know whether it's clear in the request from the uh, about the motion, whether we can use um, ARP emergency rental assistance funds for back rent. Um, I, I just personally don't know that and hope that we will uh, get that as a part of uh, the analysis by county council along with everything else. So um, thank you very much for this. I support the motion. Thank you. I think that's reasonable. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no other members that uh, have any questions on this item, uh, this item 81E is before us. I'll move, uh, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell, to approve the item, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 81E is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Thank you so much, members. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate for us to hear from supervisors on items not posted on the agenda to be presented or referred to staff or placed on a future agenda. Supervisor Hahn, uh, I believe you had a, a read in motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I do this with uh, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. And uh, next Saturday, June 19th, marks an important day in American history. Uh, and it's it's celebrated uh, a lot, but sometimes it's overlooked. So this motion will pave the way for us in LA County to recognize Juneteenth as an official county holiday in the future, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to read this in. Juneteenth, Juneteenth, a combination of the words June and 19th, commemorates the end of slavery in the United States and is a holiday observed by millions of Americans around Los Angeles County. There are many events planned to honor this historic day, um, including two large ones in my district, a picnic at Bruce's Beach and a music festival in downtown Long Beach. And I know there's also a celebration at Magic Johnson Park. 
There is a growing movement among government and private companies to observe Juneteenth. Juneteenth commemorates the events of June 19, 1865, when Major General Garden Granger led Union soldiers into Galveston, Texas, bringing news that the Civil War had ended and that the Emancipation Proclamation had declared all enslaved people free more than two years earlier. The Emancipation Proclamation changed the legal status under federal law of approximately 3.5 million enslaved Black and African Americans. Juneteenth acknowledges the significance lapse of over two years from 1863 to 1865, when enslaved Blacks and African Americans were unaware of the Emancipation Proclamation. The 13th Amendment, which added the abolishment of slavery to the Constitution, passed Congress in January 1865 and was ratified and adopted in December of 1865. Since June 19, 1865, Americans have celebrated Juneteenth and is now recognized by 47 states. In 2003, California's legislature passed a resolution recognizing Juneteenth. For nearly two decades, the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation has been advocating for the date, June 19th, to be recognized as an annual national observance. The residents of LA County are encouraged to honor and celebrate Juneteenth by attending an in-person or virtual event. Every year, Juneteenth is an opportunity to gather with family and friends to celebrate freedom and to recognize our country's continued commitment to ending racial injustices. We therefore move that the Board of Supervisors proclaim June 19th every year as Juneteenth in Los Angeles County. Thank you. Very good. I know Supervisor uh, Mitchell wants to be recognized on this as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Hahn for uh, insisting that I join her on this motion. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to do so. I think it's important um, as we talk about at some point, perhaps getting to a point where it's a, a holiday nationally, you know, before, even before we get to the point, that point, that we not only focus on the historic relevance of a, a two-year delay of being informed that enslavement had ended, but that we think about and act upon policies and practices that enhance self-determination for formerly enslaved people each and every day today. There are far too many examples that surround us every day. Uh, examples of racist micro and macro aggressions, implicit and explicit bias, all residual effects of a country that found it appropriate to enslave a group of people. So while it's important that we celebrate Juneteenth for its historic relevance, I'm asking that every county resident check yourself and check those around you and making sure that we truly are a land for the people, for all the people, that we live up to the ideals of our foremothers and forefathers who did have it within them to amend the constitution, to acknowledge that black people shouldn't be considered as three-fifths human and that we practice it in every action we take when we talk about issues of disproportionate rates of poverty, Black children being bullied in public education, disproportionate rates of Black people being unhoused, and disproportionate rates of Black people uh, falling victim to police brutality. Those are ways, in my humble opinion, as a Black woman in this country, that I think that we truly honor the intent of Juneteenth was to acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation. And so thank you so much for today's resolution. And I challenge us all to think deeply about ways in which we individually can live up to that ideal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. I would just uh, inform the, uh, the audience that this item will be brought to us at our next June 15th meeting, which is identified as closed session so that we can recognize the holiday uh, in a closer, pro closer proximity. So thank you. Uh, next, uh, Supervisor Barger also has a read in motion. Thank you. And this is for the June 22nd board meeting. Uh, when the Superior Court sets a hearing to make a determination concerning the conditional release of a sexually violent predator into the community and or to consider a suitable residence for the uh, sexually violent predator, it generates a great deal of community concern and requires proactive community engagement. While such matters are rare, 
Welfare and Institution Code Section 6609.1, parentheses A, parentheses 1, and 6609.2, provide notice to the district attorney and to the sheriff. Specifically, Welfare and Institution Code 6609.1, parentheses A, parentheses 1, states that when the State Department of State Hospitals makes a recommendation to the court for community outpatient treatment for any person committed as a SVP, or when a person who is committed as a sexually violent predator pursuant to this article has petitioned to court pursuant to section 6608 for conditional release, release under the supervision and treatment in the community pursuant to a conditional release program, or as petitioned to court pursuant to section 6608 for subsequent unconditional discharge, and the department is notified or is aware of the filing of the petition and when a community placement location is recommended or proposed, the department shall notify the sheriff or police, chief of police, or both the district attorney or the county's designated council that have jurisdiction over the following locations. A, the community in which the person may be released for community outpatient treatment. B, the community in which the person maintained his or her last legal residence as defined by section 3003 of the penal code. C, the county has filed for the person's civil commitment pursuant to this article, Welfare and Institutions Code 6609.2 states that when any sheriff or chief of police is notified by the State Department of State Hospitals, it is of its recommendation to the court concerning the disposition of a sexually violent predator pursuant to subdivision A or B, that the sheriff or chief of police may notify any person designated by the sheriff or chief of police as an appropriate recipient of the notice. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors request the district attorney and the sheriff to one, notify the Board of Supervisors when the State Department of State Hospitals makes a recommendation to the court for community outpatient treatment for any person committed as a sexually violent predator and the subsequent ruling by the court and two, notify the supervisor representing the district where a suitable placement is going to be considered by the court. Madam Chair, that is going to be for the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to it. Uh, at this time, members, we're going to move to adjournments and uh, we'll begin with Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I am deeply saddened um, this week to ask that you all join me in adjourning our meeting in the memory of three county residents, uh, names familiar to all. And I know that many of you would like to join on, and I absolutely welcome that. I'm asking that we adjourn in memory of Aurelia Brooks, Linda Dent, and Sonny Walker. Aurelia Brooks, the co-founder of the California African American Museum, also known as CAM, passed away on May 11th of this year. Uh, I believe Ms. Brooks would be okay with me acknowledging that she had reached the wonderful age of 90. She grew up in Washington, D.C. and moved to L.A. with her husband, Dr. Warren Brooks, in the 50s. After relocating to L.A., she hit the ground running within the local political and social sphere. She worked on a number of political campaigns and performed national and local work on behalf of the Urban League. Mrs. Brooks will be remembered for her immeasurable contributions to preserving, chronicling, and documenting African-American history in our, through art in Los Angeles County. She lobbied for years to bring the first African-American Museum of Art, History, and Culture fully supported by the state of California to the city of Angels. And in 1977, she proudly co-founded CAM alongside former supervisor Yvonne Brathwaite Burke, serving as the museum's first director. This museum, still located in Exposition Park in the second district, remains open to this day. It has in recent years become an official member of the Smithsonian family of museums and the admission continues to be free to the public, which is very important to Mrs. Brooks, to make sure that every Angelino had the opportunity to be exposed to and steeped in African-American culture and art. 
Mrs. Brooks is survived by her husband of 69 years, Dr. Warren Brooks, their children and spouses, Randy, Giovanna, Lisa, Anthony, and their seven grandchildren, Brandon, Cameron, Lara, Hunter, Ava, Scotty, and Lena, as well as, as, well as extended family, friends, and of course, her Cam family. She will be deeply missed and her legacy will live for years to come. Linda Dent became the first woman and first African-American president of our very own Service Employees International Union 721. Ms. Dent unfortunately passed away just May 31st at the age of 68 after battling pancreatic cancer. Ms. Dent was born in Louisiana and raised in Compton, California, where she witnessed both economic and racial discrimination and the ways in which they were interconnected. She began her career as a clerk in the LA County Tax Collector's Office. Ms. Dent will be remembered for her dedication to socioeconomic justice for all. She was described often as the lioness of labor and believed that organized labor was the only force in American society that works every day to close the ever widening wealth gap. She saw organized labor as the last line of defense between ordinary workers and the ultra rich who exploit their labor. As president of SEIU 721, she joined with community stakeholders and allies to push the county to implement programs to uplift working class and low wage earning Angelinos. She is credited with igniting the Fight for 15 campaign, which pushed LA County and city to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, effectively raising wages for over 6.5 million people. She also created the Compton Jobs Fair, which serves the formerly incarcerated and pushed the city of Los Angeles to create the targeted local hire program. Ms. Dent is survived by her husband, Lee Dent, three children and seven grandchildren, as well as her extended SEIU 721 family, friends, stakeholders, and beneficiaries of her advocacy throughout the county who all will cherish her memory as the fight for socioeconomic justice continues. And lastly, for the second district this week. Uh, Holly, could we, I'd like to join you on Linda Dents. Absolutely. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, in fact, I'd like to say something. I know Supervisor Barger also would like to say something, but if I might, um, sure. Supervisor uh, Mitchell, just want to say thank you for for bringing this forward to us, and and uh, it's with my sincere condolences to the to her family and the entire SEIU family and the community at large who will miss her dearly. She was such a fierce coalition builder and a fighter for all of her members and for all the workers in LA County. And she understood quite frankly what it meant to be a part of something bigger than herself. As you stated, she was a voice for working people and she was the fight for 15 campaign to the and also instrumental in the local hire programs. She always centered our most marginalized community. She put them first. This county, as we know, is better off by having her advocacy and leadership uh, thrived and her legacy will be with us. May she rest in peace. With that, I'll recognize Supervisor Mitchell and then uh, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, uh, Supervisor Hahn, you want to go ahead and speak well, on behalf actually, of the Dent? Actually, I think you meant Supervisor Barger, right? Supervisor Lee? Yes, yes oh. I'm sorry, Barger. Yeah. So, um, Supervisor Mitchell, I'd love to join. I, I have to say, um, in my career, um, I, I can honestly say I love Linda Dent. Um, this woman um, was truly a warrior. And when there were uh, rallies outside our boardroom, she was out there with or without a bullhorn, handing out T-shirts, um, getting people any information they needed um, to come into the boardroom to educate the board about really what was going on um, in the front line. She never forgot where she came from and um, made me a better staff and also a better supervisor um, because she really spoke from the heart and really represented um, the people that actually each and every day help us do our job as supervisors, and she will be missed. Um, it was heartbreaking when I learned of her passing, but I know she's now at peace and out of pain, 
And um, I promise um, to her that I will um, continue to um, carry her flame as it relates to really representing um, the hardworking men and women, not only of SEIU, but of the entire LA County family. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thanks. And I just wanted to add mine. Holly, thank you for letting us all say something about Linda. Um, she certainly was, as you described her, the, the, the lioness of, uh, of labor and heading up uh, SEIU 7221. She was just like you described her, Catherine, just such a, she was an organizer and she, uh, they give her credit for pioneering the strategy of getting community allies to push uh, the county uh, to adopt programs that helped uh, her members to help the working class poor. I, I read where uh, Linda believed that organized labor was the only force in American society working every day to close the widening gap between the rich and the poor and the strongest voice for racial and economic justice. She was taken from us way too young uh, it also makes me renew um, our effort, which I it started when I was in Congress about um, upping federal um, dollars and resources to really find a cure for pancreatic cancer. It is such a terrible disease and it takes people swiftly and too young in their life. So we will miss you, Linda. Um, please rest in peace. Uh, Madam Chair, may I also add in as the fifth uh, sure. wheel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you know, the, the other thing about Linda that I found really remarkable was uh, she thought outside the box of her own local and her own, even the uh, whole union, the SEIU. Uh, she was devoted to helping um, set aside jobs for ex offenders. Uh, she, you know, helped create the targeted local hire program. Um, looking at her ways to employ homeless people. I mean, she was thinking about the dignity of work and really made it a reality. Uh, and I think that's an, an extraordinary lesson for us as we continue to look to ways to uh, help people um, get the kind of help and training they need and the hand up to have the dignity of work. Uh, she will really be missed. She made an enormous enormous difference. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you all for sharing in that adjourning memory. Very, very much given her uh, relevance to all of us in the entire LA County uh, family. I'm, I'm glad that all five of us were able to adjourn in her memory. And my last uh, adjournment request is for Buford Sonny Walker. Mr. Walker was the proud husband of our fellow Metro um, director, Jacqueline DuPont Walker, and the retired administrator of grounds and services for Expo Park. Sonny, as he was affectionately, affectionately known, uh, passed away, unfortunately, just this past weekend, June 5th, at the age of 82. Sonny was born on the south side of Chicago and raised in Kansas City, but spent the last 60 years of his life calling Los Angeles home. Sonny will be remembered for his dedicated service to his communities. He earned countless awards and proclamations from the city of LA and Santa Monica for his generosity and unselfish endeavors, including helping foster care youth, locate homes and supporting them, and advocating for those who struggled with alcoholism. As a motivational speaker, he sought to motivate others to get involved in a meaningful way in their own communities. His hobbies included playing and coaching basketball. He played for the Kansas City Bulls and my favorite, the Harlem Globetrotters, in addition to coaching boys and girls youth teams. Mr. Walker's vocation was truly serving as an inspiration to others and leaving his community a better place than he found it. Sonny Walker is survived by his devoted wife of many years, Jackie DuPont Walker, siblings Grover Pulliam Walker and Daniel Arthur Walker, seven children, 24 grandchildren, 12 great grandchildren, and last but not least his adopted family, Bob, Robin, and Richard, 
as well as his extended family, friends, and LA city and county residents and community members. All of us will miss him dearly. I understand um, Supervisor Kuehl would like to add on. Uh, Madam uh, Supervisor Molly Mitchell, I also want to. Also, I think uh, probably all board members. I think all of us, I think all of us. Of course, I think of so course. Too. I just wanted to say um, uh, two more things. One is uh, Sonny's work at AME Church was um, mm -hmm. remarkable in terms of uh, his work related to social justice and especially with the young people. And the other thing I remember um, is probably 30 years ago, Jackie had um, was diagnosed with a cancer and told that she only had six months to live. And as we know, it turned out a lot longer than that. And she credits it really a lot to Sonny, his support and his love and just... <laughs> Uh, making it through it and making life worthwhile. Mm. And um, I think their blended family feels the same as uh, anybody who came in his ambit. So obviously our sympathies to Jackie, deepest, deepest sympathies. Um, Sonny was lived a good life and will definitely be missed. Thank you, yes. Madam Chair. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. That concludes your... Um... You, I, I think you had others who wanted to add on on behalf of Sonny. I don't know if they want to speak. I I met him uh, recently uh, through a Jacqueline Dupont walk, Walker at a at a dinner, uh, and I was getting an award, and she was introducing me, and I met I met her husband there. But I know uh, of his work with the AME Church, and uh, just really want to send my sincere prayers and condolences to. To the entire family, and of course, uh, to be, to his beloved wife Jackie, who we all love. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. And I think this will be another one where all five members will add on, and I'm sure that the uh, Walker family will deeply appreciate um, your kind words and the fact that everyone signed on to his adjourned memory. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll recognize Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Craig Dixon, Olympic medalist, one of the greatest hurdlers ever produced by UCLA. Uh, he was a bronze medalist in a photo finish in the 110 meter high hurdles at the 1948 Olympic games. He won the Los Angeles Times Award for National Track Athlete of the Year in 1949, as well as the UCLA Gimbel Award for the graduating senior with outstanding achievement and attitude in athletics. All, toward, all told, Craig had an incredible 59 consecutive hurdle victories in 1949. He was inducted into the UCLA Athletic Hall of Fame in 1985 and remained an active and ardent UCLA supporter throughout his life. After retiring from competition, Craig coached under UCLA's legendary Ducky Drake, where he mentored former world record holding decathlete Rafer Johnson and 1960 decathlon silver medalist C.K. Yang. He's survived by his daughters Drew, Darian, and Cragen. And I ask that we adjourn in the memory today of Colonel Dick Littlestone. Colonel Richard Allen Littlestone, the first ever recipient of the County Board of Supervisors Veterans Lifetime Achievement Award died on May 15th, most appropriately, Armed Forces Day. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1947, served in the Army for 33 years. He earned a number of decorations, including the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, and more than a dozen other medals. After his service, he became a persistent and tireless advocate for veterans in L.A. County, served as chair and professor of the UCLA Department of Military Science and Associate Director of the UCLA Computers and Information Systems Research Program in the Graduate School of Management. In addition to his professional work, he volunteered, notably on the 1984 Olympics Youth Activities Subcommission, whose report led to the creation of the LA 84 Foundation. He also embarked on a campaign long and hard fought 
focused on expanding the capacity at the LA National Cemetery, which is a veteran cemetery in West Los Angeles. Since the closure of that cemetery to all new interments in 1997, he continuously and strenuously prodded a succession of VA secretaries to construct a columbarium annex for LA veterans that would allow more veterans to be cremated and buried in our local VA cemetery. He often said he didn't want Doris, his wife of 67 years, to have to travel to Riverside to visit his burial place. After 10 years of perseverance, the project was approved, funded, and planned. And that's where he will be interred, at the LA National Cemetery Columbarium that he helped establish. He's survived by Doris, his sons, Mark and Richard, and his daughter, Nanette, was an extraordinary, wonderful, happy, laughing, generous man. It'd be really, really missed. Um, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Robert McGuire, who changed the LA skyline as the developer of prominent high rises, including the downtown icon US Bank Tower. As a dominating figure in Southern California real estate, during the commercial building boom of the 80s and 90s, McGuire used his clout to help save LA's historic central library from demolition and was a civic leader who helped expand the LA County Museum of Art and uh, campus and stabilize its finances. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Lewis Robin, who with his college friend, Alan Tinkley, founded Concerts Incorporated, which later became Artist Consultant Productions under Lou's direction. The company produced and promoted over 4,000 concerts worldwide during a 52-year period. They also produced feature films, Theater in the Round, an off-Broadway show in New York with Monty Python, and promoted more than two dozen summer series concerts at the Hollywood Bowl, featuring stars like Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, Tony Bennett, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter, Paul, and Mary, Janis Joplin, and Jimi Hendrix. In 1973, Lou began a 30-year run personally managing Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash until their passing in 2003. He's been a member of the International Entertainment Buyers Association since its inception and was inducted into its Hall of Fame in 2011. He's survived by his sons, Michael and Steve. And finally, I ask when we uh, adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Bill Scanlon. During his successful 13-year professional tennis career, he won seven singles titles and two doubles titles and achieved a career-high world singles ranking of number nine. He's known for having recorded the only golden set in the history of men's professional tennis, a feat still recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records. He was inducted to the Intercollegiate Tennis Hall of Fame and the Texas Tennis Hall of Fame, served on the ATP Board of Directors, the Board of the Southern California Tennis Association, and the USTA Davis Cup Committee. He was chairman of the Carl Reiner Celebrity Pro-Am Tournament and co-founder of the Beverly Hills Invitational. He survived by his wife, Stephanie, his brother, John, and his sister, Jean. Those are my adjournments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Willie Suzuki. He was a Torrance resident, and he was 87 when he passed. He was the youngest of nine children and attended Dorsey High School, El Camino Community College, and earned his master's degree from California State University, Long Beach. He was class president at both El Camino and CSULV. Willie and part of his family were sent to he Hila he he River Internment Camp, uh, Arizona, during World War II. He later served in the U.S. Army from 1957 to 1959. Willie was also an outstanding painter, a lithographer, and printmaker who taught at El Camino College for 40 years. His art was featured in numerous highly awarded exhibitions throughout L.A. County. Willie was a fisherman, a sports fan, and especially when it came to UCLA basketball and Angels baseball. Willie was a man who loved life, had a smile and a compliment for everyone. 
He was survived by his wife of 23 years, Jerry Suzuki, his daughter, Leslie, his grandson, Calvin, and many others in his extended family. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of His Excellency Tan Hoke, who was 77 when he passed away. He was born in Cambodia and his three brothers were orphaned as young boys when their parents died from illnesses. He was raised by his father's brother who later was executed by the Khmer Rouge. Um, and in 1971, Polk began working as chief of cabinet for the Cambodian Ministry of Education and Culture. The government sent Polk to Southern California in 1973 to support the development of Cambodia's education system. This move saved Polk's life as he was studying at USC when the Pol Pot regime took over the country and the genocide began. Through it all, Polk was able to earn a master's degree of science in education from USC and a master's degree in social welfare from UCLA. He served as LA County's Director of Refugee Resettlement and Employment, and in 1977, he founded a nonprofit called the United Cambodian Community in Long Beach. He was the executive director until 1993 and helped to integrate Cambodian immigrants into Los Angeles County by providing housing, economic, and benefit enrollment support. Polk died of complications from COVID-19, but his vision and legacy continue. The United Cambodian Community has grown into, into a multi-service agency providing youth development, workforce development, gang prevention, and mental health services to address the changing needs of the growing Southeast Asian population. He is survived by his wife, Nanda, four sons, Ravuth, Ravath, Ravith, and Anand, one daughter, Rami Polk, stepchildren, Nancy and Jason, nephews, Bryant, Ben, Sokum, Ben, 11 grandchildren and a grateful community. I also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn today in the memory of Jay McCafferty, who was a San Pedro resident and he was 73 when he passed. Jay was one of Los Angeles' most important and convention defying artists. As a young artist, Jay won the LA County Museum of Arts New Talent Award and received a national endowment for the Arts Fellowship Grant. His art has been exhibited locally, nationally, and internationally, and his work is held in numerous public collections, including the Getty Museum, LACMA, and the Museum of Modern Art. In addition to, art, to his art, Jay served for 40 years as an associate professor of art and head of the art department at LA Harbor College. And for 30 years, he worked as a lifeguard on beaches from San Pedro to Ventura County. Jay is survived by his wife, Ellen. And I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Paul Gaines, who was the son of my friend and LA County Commissioner Jerry Gaines. He passed away way too soon at the age of 55. Paul worked as a social worker for the County of Riverside's Department of Child Protective Services. He dedicated 27 years to protecting children from abuse and worked tirelessly to reunify families. He was also a committed mentor to many other county employees. Paul is survived by his wife, Kimberly, his three children, Chad, Gabriel, and Ashlyn, and his parents, Jerry and Lorraine Gaines. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move that today we adjourn in memory of firefighter engineer Tori Carlin, who proudly served as a member of the Los Angeles County Fire Department for over 20 years, who passed away on June 1st at the age of 44 following a tragic workplace shooting. Tori grew up in the Leona Valley as the youngest of five. He attended Highland High School where he played baseball. After graduating in 1994, he attended Antelope Valley College. Rather than join the family auto sales business in Lancaster, Tory pursued his lifelong dream of becoming a firefighter. He worked his way up through his various first responder jobs for, before beginning his 20 year career in the fire department with his most recent assignment being fire station 81 in Agua Dulce. 
when not carrying out his duties, protecting the lives and property of our residents as a fire engineer, Tory loved spending his free time with his family and close friends. Among his favorite pastimes were coaching his daughter's softball teams and taking the family to the lake to water ski and wakeboard. He was also a lifelong Dodgers and Rams fan, but most importantly, he was a beloved father, husband, son, brother, uncle, and a friend to many and will be sorely missed by those who knew him. He survived by his wife, Heidi, and their daughters, Jocelyn, Bryn, and Bree. I also move that we adjourn. We have all members on that one, Catherine. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. I also move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Alvin Burdick, a lifelong resident of Arcadia, who passed away at the age of 94 on March 26. Alvin grew up actually in Los Angeles and attended Fremont High School, where he met his wife, Roberta, during their senior year. Following graduation, he served in World War II as a pilot in the Army Air Corps until the end of the war. He completed his World War II service as a military police officer and later joined the Air Force Reserves, which stationed him at Travis Air Force Base during the Korean War. Alvin and Roberta raised four sons in the city of Arcadia. In 1948, he became a sworn officer in the LAPD. For his, over two decades, he dedicated himself to his community and advanced through the ranks until retirement as a lieutenant and a watch commander. In 1972, his passion for learning and growth inspired him to attend the FBI National Academy, where he managed security in L.A. for the U.S. Postal Inspection Service until the 1980s. He then started his own private investigation service in Arcadia. Alvin most enjoyed spending time with his family. He cherished fishing, hunting, and boating, including many trips to Blythe and Lake Havasu. Alvin is survived by his four sons, Gary, Craig, Grant, and Kim, and their families. Also, that we move that we adjourn in memory of Alicia Rydell, a longtime resident of Santa Clarita. She was born in Chile and immigrated to the United States with her husband and five small children in 1964. She later proudly became a U.S. citizen. Alicia and her husband purchased their first home in Santa Clarita in 1966. She worked as a nurse for Holy Cross Hospital, Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital, Los Angeles County Public Health Services, and in private home health care. Alicia had a passion for reading, learning, and travel, and was very knowledgeable in fine art, architecture, and history. She was a woman full of love, prayer, and laughter. She survived by her five daughters, Marianne, Carmen, Heidi, Monica and Marcella, as well as 14 grandchildren and 13 great grandchildren. Also, Carrie Walsh of Glendora, who passed away on Sunday, May 30th, following a tragic car accident um, on Saturday night. Her vehicle was struck by a suspected drunk driver. She was 18 years old. Carrie played varsity soccer all four years of Glendora High School and was a member of the Legends soccer team. In her senior year, she was awarded Most Valuable Player and was recognized as a 2020 Scholar Athlete of the Year. She graduated as class salutatorian with a 4.6 grade point average. Terry had just completed her first year at Loyola Marymount University on a full ride academic scholarships. She passed on the potential opportunity to play soccer at LMU so she could pursue her dream of becoming a doctor and helping others. Carrie was known for her infectious smile, giving spirit, humbleness, and determination to reach her goals. She survived by her parents, Albert and Chiara, and her sister, Ariana. Those are my adjournments. very much, uh, Supervisor Barger. Uh, now I'll read in my adjournments for today. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Captain John Reddy. 
He passed away on May 22nd, 2021. Captain John Brady served as the Urban Search and Rescue Unit Commander and the liaison for the Los Angeles County Fire Department State and Federal Task Forces. He was one of LAFD's resident subject matter experts on all search and rescue related issues and operations. Captain Rudy helped manage some of the most advanced search and rescue personnel and resources in the country. When a neighboring fire agency requests assistance or the state of California or the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, requires specialized disaster response resources. It was Captain Rudy who answered the call. His quiet nature and soft-spoken demeanor were warm contrast to the scope of his immense responsibilities. Calmly and methodically, Captain Rudy scaled the logistical, technical apparatus, equipment, and personnel resources at any incident. Born and raised in Los Angeles County, he was in the Los Angeles City Fire Department for over 30 years. He is to be remembered for his selfless duty as a first responder and his dedication and love for his family. Captain Rudy is survived by his wife, Michelle, who is the daughter of my Arts Commissioner, Helen Hernandez and their two children, Paige and Derek. May he rest in peace. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Arturo Arroyo Campos. He passed away on May 27, 2021. Arturo Arroyo Campos was born in Ziquitaro, Michoacan, Mexico on May 15, 1929. He was one of 14 children in his family. From a young age, he became a shepherd at his grandfather's ranch and learned the value of hard work. He came to the United States in 1945 at the age of 16 with his grandmother and was taken under the wing of his grand aunt. He worked in the fields of Salinas, Visalia, Lindsay, Porterville, Bakersfield, and Fresno. He knew everything about picking fruits and vegetables and did his work with love. He moved to East Los Angeles and worked as a construction worker. Although he did not have a formal education, Mr. Arroyo taught himself history revolutionary movements and biographies of world leaders. He was an avid reader till the end of his life. He got involved in political movements in his native town and managed to bring roads, electricity, and water to his pueblo. Mr. Arroyo spent most of his life living in East Los Angeles and later on in the city of Almani, and most recently in the city of Bell. He's always encouraged by his four, he had always encouraged his four children to pursue higher education, to have faith, to be people of honor and to seek justice. He leaves behind a legacy of love and faith for his four children, four grandchildren. May he rest in peace. And lastly, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Jose Blas Sanchez Gonzalez. He was a respected, beloved small business owner and a trusted mechanic in Monterey Park. He was known as kind, committed, and always going out of his way to provide assistance and guidance to other immigrants, especially those from his home state of Jalisco, Mexico. He took great pride in teaching and mentoring new mechanics from his community and instilling uh, in them the importance of commitment, integrity, and he would always say, con ganas. He also provided students from the nearby continuation schools and community college opportunities to gain work experience at his gas stations to earn credit toward graduation or automotive degrees. For these reasons and more, the Jose Blas Sanchez Gonzalez Scholarship Memorial Fund was established in his honor. He is survived by his wife of 53 years, Maria, who attended East Los Angeles College. His three children and their spouses and seven grandchildren, six siblings, and many loving family members. May he also rest in peace. That concludes our adjournment. We'll take all the motions as seconded. And if there's no object objection to unanimous vote, that will be the action. At this time, Madam Executive Officer, please read us into closed session. Thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with Brown Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1 conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation, and item CS2 department head performance evaluation, and item CS3 conference with labor negotiator, Bezia Davenport, and designated staff as indicated on the posted agenda. Thank you.